hands on workshop as we say nowadays we are talking about few new terms and one term is experiential learning and as the word meaning experiential learning itself says when we learn by experience so in college also we promote uh, learning by experiment and this conducting of this kind of webinar is one uh, step which we are taking for that and in the simplest sense we can say that hands on workshop is learning by doing and last year also before last year also we have conducted these kind of workshops and this is the students pressure that they are saying ki ma'am this year as physics teachers were discussed with me that students are pressurizing ki ma'am for this session we are not planning any hands on workshop so we delighted that our students are interested in this kind of experiential learning so today we are starting this uh, hands on workshop on microwave techniques and as uh, my colleagues who have joined here we can recall we had a good session from deepak bhatnagar sir on the same topic that was a kind of lecture and now today uh, he is again with us to join in this inaugural session of this hands on workshop and as i have discussed with the department of physics that for both the days they have very uh, distinct uh, sessions so that the purpose of this hands on workshop may be achieved so i congratulate department of physics for organizing this kind of quality workshop and i know that they have uh, put their efforts to uh, uh, collect all the material and their main purpose was that the particular person who is experty of particular session may join this and their effort has been successfully implemented so we can see that uh, for uh, the all the session of both days we have very experts very much expert with uh, us and again i wish my all the best to all the participant all the students that these two days will be a good learning for them and they will remember this forever uh, again i want to congratulate department of physics for that and i welcome all the delegates all the experts and the, all the students who have joined uh, this virtual workshop thank you thank you ma'am for your inspiring words this today workshop will focus on the topic hands on training in microwave experiments it will include more issues to address the full aspect of topic so to brief you all about this i would request dr sharla sharma ma'am for the theme of the workshop thank you shivani i would like to extend a warm welcome to all the dignitaries faculty members and participants of hgme 2022 we live in the world surrounded by microwaves as we know that microwaves are electromagnetic waves with frequency with frequencies ranging from 300 microhertz to 300 gigahertz the wavelengths of microwaves are measured in centimeters the waves that heat our food in a microwave oven are longer microwaves ones that are closer to foot in length microwaves energy can penetrate haze light rain and snow clouds and smoke making them ideal for carry, uh, carrying information from one location to another microwaves are commonly used in uh, broadcasting telecommunications and a variety of other industries Microwaves are mostly produced by FM radio and TV broadcasting antennas, which produce frequencies spanning from 80 to 800 megahertz in broadcasting. Microwaves are produced by mobile phones, their base stations, and microwave links, as well as cordless phones, terrestrial trunk radios, Bluetooth devices, wireless local area networks, and a variety of other applications in communications. In distance sensing, shorter microwaves are employed. 
these microwaves are employed in radar systems such as doppler radar which is used in uh, used for weather forecasting radar uses microwave that are only a few inches long microwaves are used in sp uh, spacecraft communications and used to transfer much of the world's data television and phone communication over long distances between ground stations and communication satellites as we see that microwaves are widely used in households industries communications medical and military buildings and they contribute significantly to the advancements of human society however as it has grown in popularity more attention has been paid to its impact on human electromagnetic radiations can be absorbed by living things resulting in psychological and functional changes many complex activities such as learning and memory take place in the central nervous system making it sensitive to the em radiations furthermore with the widespread use of mobile phones they have become the primary sources of radiation exposure to the brain as a result the central nervous system is one of the most vulnerable organ to microwave damage because we know that the unrestricted uh, uses of anything is dangerous so we should use microwave in moderation and safely uh, with the plethora of uses and technological applications microwave is currently one of the technologies on which we depend tremendously this workshop is therefore dedicated to the researchers who have put in their efforts in bringing the uses of microwave to this length we wish to use this platform to ignite interest and to widen the understanding of graduate and post graduate students of physics we fervently hope that deliberations and discussions during the sessions of this workshop would make them aware about the career opportunities in this field and of offer them better understanding altogether thank you very much well thank you so much ma'am for sharing the information i would profoundly joy to introduce our chief guest of honor dr deepak bhatnagar sir from department of physics university of rajasthan besides he joined the university of rajasthan and served for 34 years till his retirement as professor during this period he worked as a head in the department of physics member syndicate and senate dean faculty of science director center for converging technologies principal maharaja college director research university of rajasthan jaipur he was also the coordinator of iqac nodal officer rusa program and coordinator dst purc program he was the group leader of microwave and communication group in the department of physics university of rajasthan his main area of research interest is design of planar antennas for mobile wireless and satellite communication systems till date 24 students have obtained their phd degrees under his supervision he has produced more than 200 research papers in international and national journals and proceedings of various national and international conferences he is author of six books for undergraduate students of rajasthan state he has successfully completed five major research projects sanctioned by isro bangalore ugc dst dit all from new delhi worth over rupees 2 crores he is senior member of ieee usa and fellow of iete india and distinguished member of several other societies so with due respect i request him to say his few words and why is this about the same thank you usha ji thank you to entire team of kanodia college first i will like to say my regards to dr pal sir because i joined when i joined my phd work from mnit now mnit at that time it was mrc and my guide was uh, professor rajkumar gupta ji and uh, due to mentorship of uh, pal sir uh, i joined the research project for my research activities and that project was sanctioned by isro 
and the only person who uh, made uh, this project available to MREC was uh, uh, Dr. Pal sir and I am really thank thankful to him and later whenever I found later I received a research project from ISRO and uh, he helped me a lot in doing entire activity of research work and he was my mentor he was my guide and he guided me on several occasions and whenever he visits Jaipur uh, he always have, I always have an opportunity to interact with him and meet him. So I'm really thankful, sir, for joining this uh, important workshop on microwaves because this workshop we have planned for the students of, particularly for uh, PG students. And uh, your guidance, your motivation will help those students in, uh, in making their career in the field of microwaves. So I from the core of my heart i extend a warm welcome to you sir on behalf of myself and all on behalf of the canodia college fraternity and about this uh, uh, workshop this theme of this workshop was selected as i told uh, because we want to we know that uh, regular classes are not taking place and students are uh, getting online education due to this uh, COVID pa pandemics and therefore they are very uh, keen to understand the basics of experiments that we are having in our labs. So I will deliver a lecture in the uh, next uh, second lecture of this uh, event because the inaugural lecture will be delivered by Dr. Pal sir. And after that, I will give a brief lecture on the basics of microwave components because we are using many microwave components in our lab, MSc lab, and we must understand what is the actual working uh, procedure of these equipments and uh, how, how how much we must be careful in using these experiments in these equipments. And I will try to give emphasis on that thing. And uh, you know that uh, uh, you are you will have two eminent speak two few uh, eminent speakers from ISRO two eminent speakers one is Dr. Parul will also join with you all, and uh, it is an opportunity to for all the participants to interact with these two eminent persons, Dr. Pal sir and Dr. Parul madam, and because uh, ISRO is the main agency which is. Uh, involved in uh, active microwave research. So all the students must interact with him and Parul Ma'am as much as possible and try to make all uh, uh, your inquiries clear about the microwave and other activities that are going on ISRO and how the faculty members can also have an interaction that how they can have some re research collaboration or some research project with the ISRO, with the help of ISRO, and certainly this workshop will be helpful for them. Then, and uh, Dr. Uh, one more uh, see, very senior person, Dr. Josh, Professor Dr. Joshi from retired from C. D. Pilani will also join tomorrow, and he will give uh, a glimpse about the activities going on in uh, in C. D. Pilani and will certainly motivate the participant for joining this active area of research activity, microwave electronics. Other speakers are from IIT Jodhpur and the University of Rajasthan. I would like to request Madam uh, Usha Bhatia, Madam, to organize more events because uh, uh, this is one of the important labs in our um, um, master's curriculum. And other important labs are nuclear physics, solid state physics, and uh, spectroscopy. And in the coming days, if they will organize more workshops on these uh, and the hand on uh, ex activities, experiments on these uh, areas, then students of your college, not only from your college, but other students who have joined this type of uh, workshop, will get benefited. I will not stand in between you and Dr. Pal, sir. I will request uh, organizers to uh, introduce him and uh, I'll request him to deliver his, uh, uh, his presidential address. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
thank you very much sir for your wise words and we look forward for the basic and the opportunities that you have talked about we look forward for the wonderful session ahead our chief guest dr surendra pal sir former additional director district scientist satellite center isro dr surendra pal a research and an academician of international repute having more than 50 years of experience in the field of antennas space communication and satellite navigation is the former vice chancellor of defense institute of advanced technology diat pune he was responsible for initiating antenna space communication microwaves and satellite nav navigation activities at isro satellite center from its inception in 1971 dr pal was the founder program director of indian satellite navigation program gagan and navik constellation is a unique constellation at geo orbit for regional navigation providing better position and timing stand alone for accuracies for navigation gagan is certified and handed over to airport authority of india for navik indian defense and security agencies will be the main user and defense forces will be the independent of gps and glonass uses it is a great development for the country Dr Pal has received more than 2 dozen national and international awards which includes Judith Presley award from IEEE he is the first person to get the award from east of france dr pal was an IEEE distinguished lecturer of for the aerospace electronic society he also visited under IEEE DLT program several universities in usa uk south africa australia Malaysia and Singapore he also received Wits Plani distinguished alumni award from Sri Kumar Mangalam Billa Dr Pal's expertise is satellite communication RF microwave digital mi communication radars antennas and global navigation satellite system now i request Dr Surendra Pal sir to share his valuable thoughts Now we request Dr. Surendra Pal sir to share his valuable sir, thoughts. Sir, your mic is muted. Please unmute the mic. Uh, good morning, and it's nice to see Professor Batnagar after a long time. Uh, and uh, let before I start, let me tell that uh, there was a time when uh, I think the most competent team to work in the field of uh, microwaves was existing in Rajasthan. Rajasthan means Jaipur and uh, Siri Pilani, and the team was led at Jaipur by uh, Professor R K Gupta. and his students like professor batnagar uh, professor arke sharma sakshena and uh, i think professor sancheti uh, then professor mm M. sharma i think it's a big team and uh, there there were i mean they had a beautiful laboratories also i could contribute little bit of it by uh, giving some projects from respon pilani had a definitely a big team working on microwave tubes microwave devices and the thing so jaipur had that uh, thing uh, you know basis for working in the field of microwaves now i i mean it's a really pleasure that uh, i have been invited i could see first uh, professor batnagar after a long time maybe some decade it could be or less than a decade because i think i met him in 2016 uh, or 17 when he was a, a principal of uh, maharaja college micro is an important field you know already it was uh, told so before i start let me f f formally thank uh, professor seema agrawal professor ratna sakshena professor usha bhatia uh, professor sumanti shekhawar professor sharla sharma uh, and other dignitaries i see some more than 125 participants on this one uh, i i would like to be excused i completely forgot that i have to give a talk till yesterday i received the call from 
Dr. Sumanti Shekhawat. So I was really at confusion what to talk about it. Uh, I so whatsoever was ready with me. I'm going. So I thought in place of talking on conventional things of antennas, uh, all those things. Uh, let me talk on uh, two aspects because he said I have to speak at least 40 minutes. So two aspects. One is about how this microwave etc. started, and uh, second is maybe I'll talk uh, talk on the latest topic of navigation because yesterday only I visited the navigation center, and uh, the director of the navigation center is a combined student of myself and Professor Bhatnagar. Uh, uh, Dr. Srinivasan, who is going to retire now on 28th, the, all the antenna, 32 meter, 14 meter, 11 meters, were all designed by us, and the feeds were made out of uh, dielectric sick. That was my PhD topic somewhere in uh, 78. So uh, the research could be used for that purpose. When we talk about microwaves, I always say microwaves or RF is like God. You know, God is present everywhere. So the microwave and RF is present everywhere. It has become more visible because of the TV, because of mobile. And we have got, uh, now we are in the era of 3G, 4G. We are entering into 5G and 6G. And when we come into those things, everything will be microwave and microwave only. So first, uh, uh, Are you able to see it? Yes, yes. Are you able to see it? Yes, sir. My slides are uh, visible? No, sir. Your slides are not no, sir. visible. Hmm. OK, one minute. Let me. So your slides are not visible. You have to present it. Yeah, I'm sharing. Third option from history. Is it seen now? No, sir. No. Oh, no, wait, sir. wait for me. I'll take my help up from somebody. One minute. No, sir. No problem. Is it, uh, is it visible? Hello. No, sir. No, sir. No. It is uh, not visible. Sir. Uh, Go, sir. 
सर इट इज इट मे बी विजिबल ऑन योर स्क्रीन सर अगर आप देखेंगे तो नीचे मीट में देर इज अक ऑप्शन कैमरा देन हैंड्रेस हैंड्रेस के राइट में जो है दैट इज प्रेजेंट नाउ सो आप प्रेजेंट नाउ पे क्लिक करेंगे यू कैन प्रेजेंट अ विंडो अ टैब तो सेलेक्ट अ विंडो एंड देन योर पीपीटी मे बी यस नाउ यू यू आर प्रेजेंटिंग Is it seen now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. After five minutes again, you come. Yeah. Uh, sorry. I mean, you know, uh, my uh, laptop yeah. is with my grandson. I can see this. So I had to share my uh, son's uh, laptop. Now I'm going to talk about uh, when we talk about microwaves. Uh, we have to talk about two persons: Ashara J C Bose and James Clark Maxwell. So I thought, let me introduce to the. Uh, young audience about this these two persons now when you talk about microwaves there is one thing comes so how did the microwave came you know how the rf came and if you start with we had rf communication hf communication vhf communication in 20s that uh, radar uh, i mean rf mi microwave communication started coming in 35 the radar came and of course then radio or sort of so many things came and then we started having uh, problems into that one so somewhere in 50s it was found by two astronomers that whichever direction they try to find out they get uh, some sort of noise and they had a big hog horn so they cleaned that ho hog horn and it had a lot of uh, you know uh, bulb droppings they cleaned it and they found whichever direction they get they get it, uh, some sort of a noise and that was called the background noise that background noise is very essential for microwave engineers and particularly for the physics persons to see so this is called the microwave window and that was say here if you see uh, you can get around 2.53 to 2.76 uh, kelvin this is called the cosmic background okay it remains here and when you go this side below 1 giga 1 gigahertz here the thermal noise becomes most important noise it becomes important the communications because what a noise figure you may be doing and uh, from there what it's a uh, it also comes from the thermodynamics you know and uh, if you you are all physics students if you have studied sahay and srivastava's book that used to be the book in my time so from there all those things are given there when you go uh, above say 20 gigahertz then a uh, lot, lot of uh, absorption bonds bond, uh, bands are there like water vapor oxygen carbon dioxide and so many uh, bands are there where maximum absorption takes place when you go into the optical limit then the quantum limit h nu by k plays an important part rather than the noise so you must know between the 1 gigahertz to Uh, say up to say around to 15 gigahertz the galactic noise background noise is of the order of 2.76 kelvin if you are operating below 1 gigahertz then the thermal noise plays an important part if you go up to say uh, in a terahertz band then besides uh, the other noise this absorption bands noise plays an important part and when you go into the optical domain the quantum uh, limit h nu by k plays an important part of it and nowadays there is a quantum communi uh, communication quantum switching computer quantum computation and of course uh, uh, you also talk about uh, uh, optical communications then in uh, those domains uh, these plays an important part so a microwave window what we call terrestrial window is important as far as the students are concerned electromagnetic in rf communication antennas rf and antenna omnipresent they are tightly connected with each other as far as today's world is concerned as i said na like god god is present everywhere so similarly rf is presented everywhere so today we are in a world of information technology communication navigation and communication and the new new emerging areas are in for you know internet of things and artificial intelligence whether you may be a physics student chemistry student or you may be mathematics student uh, you all use computers you all use communications 
So all these things which are there in this one, you know, all the five things are important. So I feel that uh, a general uh, course should be given to all the postgraduate students about all the things. They should be made aware of these things. All these need communication either by line or space, millimeter wave, terahertz, infrared, and optical communications are becoming part of the large communication control and information paradigm because first is that they provide a large bandwidth. You know, our data rates are going so high. So we need a, a bandwidth, large bandwidth, and bandwidth can be provided once you go to the higher frequencies. Now, today's era is of electrically small antennas. A new smart sensors, high gain phased arrays. Now, let me tell you that uh, whatsoever was taught uh, in the book, particularly the cross book, if you go by the theory that uh, uh, you can pass an exam with uh, flying colors, but you cannot design an antenna. You cannot design a communication system, even if you read Panther's book. You cannot uh, work in those things in the present era if you want to work. You can pass the exam. May may not be able to do in PhD also following those conventional books. The uh, thing is that today's era is you must think out of box. If you don't think out of box, you cannot do a research, good research. And uh, the biggest example is that when plasma was uh, not existing, we were still the uh, vehicles were re-entering. Uh, Professor R. K. Gupta and his students like Professor Bhatnagar, etc., started working in antennas in plasmas. And also, when the microstrip antennas were not popular, they were working on micro microstrip antennas. Okay. So that's the thing which you have to do it. You have to think out of box. And there's today's an era, a lot of simulation tools are available. You can simulate the things. At the same time, you must try to find out the physics of those things. So we have got wide band, ultra wide band, reconfigurable, smart, adaptive antenna systems, uh, frequency selective surfaces, meta materials, and embedded antennas, dielectric antennas, liquid antennas, dielectric resonator antennas, antennas as filters, and of course, above all, is active antennas. You see, so uh, you, uh, so many fields are there. An antenna is a, a start, but be, if you go into the uh, back end of that one, then that involves in the microwave, down conversion, low noise amplifier, down conversion, etc. And then if further you go, we are in era where directly we digitize it, RF to digital, and then we do into the digital domain, signal processing, artificial intelligence, which I talked about it. So should a uh, today's a, a communication engineer or RF engineer not understand digital, it's difficult. He cannot work, so he should be taught in the digital communication also. The frequency range is where we work nowadays is ELF, which are used in the sub, uh, submarine uh, communication, underwater communication. Very low frequency, high frequencies, VHF, UHF, microwaves, millimeter waves, terahertz, and of course, optical waves. And antennas for microwave photonics. That's another good area where one can work it. Antenna as a part of front end and new materials. That's a very good topic coming up. Can you make antenna as a part of the front end? Can you do the impedance matching there itself with wide band? Or you put an impedance matching circuit later on and have the wide band antenna or broadband antenna. Work. I mean, so that sort of research is being done. What happens is that most of the time you do take a, a HFSS or a CST or Micro Studio, etc., and uh, try to simulate, get a result. I got, I rejected one uh, IIT uh, Bombay thesis. Um, I should have not told the name, but uh, or some IIT and others also, where one uh, person worked on antenna and he says his antenna is a polarization less. So I said then uh, I'm not the competent person to examine the thesis, he needs a Nobel Prize because he can make his antenna which, is a, which does not have a polarization, it's a polarization less antenna. Why? Because electromagnetic waves is a vector and antennas are also based on vectors. So any propagation is a vector. So how can you have without, uh, I mean, vector and polarized, they are both interlinked. Now changing radar cross-section by new neural networks, use of singularity expansion method, 
stealth both for rf and acoustic and infrared now we are in an era where singularity solutions becomes very important you know and singularity exists both in um, uh, rf both in digital communications and also in computers so a concept the particularly the pg students should be told about the concept of singularity you know singularity was taught in mathematics particularly i if i remember it it was in complex variables but today you have to show the singularity about in communications about the electromagnetics antennas materials is everywhere now importance of mathematics and software electromagnetics and artificial intelligence you are in an era where easy problems have been dealt and life is complex and difficult and lots of resources at hand you make a micro strip antenna find out simulate it and you say i got a very good uh, bandwidth and finally so when you go into the real uh, uh, world that does not work so uh, one has to be aware of the simulation techniques we should also be aware of the physics behind it without physics you cannot do and you cannot think out of box see the need of the hour is to think out of box if uh, steve job would have not thought uh, out of box he would have gone by the cross book panther book and all conventional communication electromagnetic books we would have not had the mobile communication you open the mobile you find you cannot design the antennas like that using the book so you should really think out of box and then you got simulation tools simulate it do it you can uh, i mean you can really do wonders in the field of electromagnetic as far as research is concerned and there are many things which uh, in um, because government of india is supporting now the uh, unicorns or startups you can uh, do those things in your college also with the help of students early contributors for electronics the benjamin franklin alexander voltas andre ampere michael faraday sir jc bose james clerk maxwell g marconi tesla and many more jagdish chandra bose i'll talk about acharyas so he from 19 i mean november 1858 to november 1937 he was a polymath physicist biologist biophysicist botanist and archaeologist why i put this particular thing is to tell the engineers or to tell the physicists that after passing your msc physics or doing phd don't restrict yourself to the what i have done no this is my phd topic phd or a postgraduate degree has enabled you and make you capable of understanding or entering into the new era so even with your knowledge i feel a mathematician and physicist and an engineer can work in any field these three fields definitely they can work so he was an early british india he was also a science and science fiction writer pioneered the investigation of radio microwaves optics plant science and laid the foundation of experimental science in indian subcontinent invented pressograph a device for measuring the growth of plants on moon a crater is named in his honor at 1.3 mm multi beam receiver now in use at an nra o 12 meters telescope arizona us it incorporates his concept for his original paper of 1897 i'm trying to tell you that uh, in his era he could generate millimeter waves and he is considered the person or originator of the horns detectors and polarizers and of course we were all uh, you know uh, professor bose did not believe in publications so he did not get the recognition which was uh, due to him he could have got the nobel prize also had he published this system and presented it properly before no marconi marconi used uh, some of his systems even uh, graham bell used uh, his system for uh, some of his detectors for uh, his telephone this is a millimeter wave apparatus at jc bose museum in kolkata this is acharya jc bose with his rf uh, equipments and uh, of course each one of you must have seen it so i am not going to explain it in 1895 sir jc bose gave his first public demonstration of electromagnetic waves using them to ring a bell remotely and explode some gunpowder he sent an electromagnetic wave across 75 feet passing through the walls and body of the chairman lieutenant governor of bengal 
and that was the first transmission of electromagnetic waves across a film. Now, some uh, critics of that one, he says, say that uh, when it, his was a spark plug, you know, his spark by that he, he generated millimeter waves. So it could be that lot of uh, harmonics got generated and that it must have done it. But uh, if you do an analysis, harmonics die down very fast and they cannot propagate to this length. So definitely he generated uh, millimeter waves. Sir, J.C. Bose invented the mercury coherer together with the telephone may I, receiver. May I used intervene, by... sir? Uh, Pardon? Paul, may I intervene in between? Your slides are not changing. Oh, why? Uh, I'm sorry. You could have yeah, told me. Now, slide are, are you able to see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so, J.C. Bose invented the mercury coherer together with the telephone receiver used by Marconi to receive the radio signals okay. in his first transatlantic radio communication. <laughs> No, or a distance of 2000 miles so, so, output voltage between the phase ka aapne beta ke beech mein banaya hai na beta aur uske beech ka curve aur kya dikha raha hai to rc ka critical curve jo bhi uski heading wahan pe jo theory mein wo yahan laga raha hai likh do madam yahan pe likh de yahan likh do upar likh do we all the manjiri gupta ma'am please switch off your mic Sorry, man. Sorry, sorry. So, uh, Marconi, who was celebrated worldwide for this achievement, the fact is his receiver was invented by Sir J.C. Bose, mm -hmm. and he deserved the Nobel Prize for that one. But he, in 1896, he met Marconi. In 1899, Bose announced the development of iron mercury, iron coherer with telephone detector. It is believed that his work influenced the work done by Marconi, Popo, and other researchers working in, on radio communication. He was first to use semiconductor junction to detect radio waves. In 1897, he described his work on millimeter waves at Royal Institution of, in London. He used waveguides, horn antennas, dielectric lenses, various polarizers, and even semiconductor 60 guard. Can't be say, can't be with great pride. That he was the originator of horn and an horn antennas, dielectric antennas, dielectric lenses, polarizers, and other things. Sir so J.C. Bose holds the first patent worldwide to invent a solid state diode detector to detect electromagnetic waves. The detector was built using a galena crystal. J.C. Bose was a pioneer in the field of microwave devices. His contribution remains distinguished in the field and was acknowledged by the likes of Lord Kelvin, Lord Rayleigh, and both of them, Nobel laureates, you know, they recommended that uh, he should have got, got the Nobel Prize, but unfortunately he didn't get it. Acharya J.C. Bose also did studies on plants, metal, fatigues, cell response. He wrote a science fiction in uh, Bengali. And I typically named him as one of the fathers of radio science on 14th September 2012. And I typically recognized by his work in RF as a milestone in electrical and computer engineering. But they did not recognize that he was the originator of uh, microwaves, you know. So J.C. Bose was at least 60 years ahead of his time. And to get uh, his work recognized, a late Professor Tapan Sarkar worked uh, along with other friends. The Bank of England has decided to redesign the 50 pounds note with an eminent scientist, and J.C. Bose is in that one. The next person is James Clerk Maxwell, 1831 to 1879. I consider him a genius. I, in his time, li uh, I mean, his lifetime, he was never recognized. Okay, and uh, uh, by just by observation, okay, and by uh, I, uh, based on the experiment of others. He had some, um, he devised some equations. Uh, these are the Max, uh, original Maxwell's uh, EM equations, which were, if you see into that one details wise, they have got a combination of both uh, scalar as well as vector thing. And it becomes very complicated to look into that one. He first equation was by Gauss's law, second was equivalent to Gauss's law for magnetism. Then he 
of Faraday's law. You know, Faraday was a great experimenter, but he did not believe in theories. So Faraday's law with the Lorentz force and Poisson's law, he made another four equations. Then MPS and Maxwell's law, he made another three equations. Then Ohm's law, he used four. Then he used the electric elasticity that he himself uh, introduced it to solve the mathematical equations. And then the continuity of charge. So Oliver Heaviside in 1850, 1891, uh, in, uh, he was one English self-taught electrical engineer, mathematician, physicist, who applied complex numbers to the study of electrical circuits, invented mathematical techniques for the solution of differential equations, equivalent to Laplace transform, formulated Maxwell's uh, field equations uh, in terms of electric and magnetic forces and energy flux, and independently co-formulated vector analysis. And all the Maxwell's equation he converted into the you know present day available uh, uh, equations, that is the four equations. Uh, till 50s, they were called uh, uh, heavy side Maxwell's um, equations, electromagnetic equations. And somewhere in the 60s itself, the heavy side name was dropped and they became the Maxwell's equations. So Heaviside championed the Faraday-Maxwell's approach in electromagnetics, simplified Maxwell's original set of 20 equations to the four used today. Importantly, Heaviside rewrote Maxwell's equation in a form that involved only electric and magnetic fields and no scalar thing. Maxwell's original equations had included both fields and potentials. So Maxwell did a lot of other work. You know, that uh, why I put it here, because all of your physics students, so you should know the Maxwell's uh, did a lot of work. And uh, I mean, we uh, electromagnetic engineers know him for Maxwell's equation, but actually his more work is in the field of thermodynamics, also statistics, etc. So the four most common Maxwell relations are the equalities of the second derivatives of each of the four thermodynamic potentials with respect to their thermal natural variants like temperature T, entropy S, uh, and with their mechanical and natural variables and pressure P and volume. And you can find all these equations which you must have studied uh, in your uh, uh, BSc or MSc. Now, here the potentials as a function of their natural thermal and mechanical variables are the internal energy, enthalpy, which See, entropy and enthalpy, you know, they are used nowadays in literature also, okay? Uh, so loosely they use it, but the physics students should understand what does the enthalpy and what does the entropy mean. So Helmholtz free energy gives free energy. The thermodynamic square can be used as a mnemonic to recall and derive these relations. The usefulness of these relations lies in their quantifying entropy changes which are not directly measurable in terms of measurable quantities like temperature, volume, and pressure. And mind it, still, the concept of entropy is not very clear to most of the physicists. Maxwell's Boltzmann's distribution, that's another thing which in BSc you must have studied. In, uh, now, in, or in, uh, now it must have gone to schools also. In my time it used to be in BSc. So in physics, particularly in statistical mechanics, the Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution is a particular probability distribution named after James Clark Maxwell and Ludwig Boltzmann. And that gives the uh, best results. And whole of uh, your gaseous and thermodynamic physics is based on Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution. Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution, Maxwell's Boltzmann distribution in physics, in statistical mechanics, Boltzmann distribution is a particular of probability that is in the statistics and distribution named after James Clark Maxwell and Ludwig Boltzmann. So Maxwell's theorem, in probability theorem, Maxwell's theorem named in honor of James Clark Maxwell states that if the probability distribution of a vector value, random variable is the same as the distribution of gx of energy in orthogonal matrix G and the components are independent, then components X1, Xn are normally distributed with expected value 0. All have the same variance and all 
are independent why i am trying to tell you all these things because they will become important where in the present the you know present world is a, when we extrapolate the data when we are in the artificial intelligence and neural network etc and the data interpretation the data is um, what we have got is you know uh, going beyond our imaginations and of uh, this is, probability theory becomes very important as far as artificial intelligence is concerned so if the physics students wants to enter into those things they must know about this maxwell's theorems distributions uh, etc the theorem is main, main, one of the main characterization of the normal distribution since a multiplication by an orthogonal matrix is a rotation the theorem says that if the probability or distribution is a random vector is unchanged by rotation and if the components are independent then the components are identical distribution and normally distributed now i am quite sure it is becoming very complicated for the students because the statistics or probability thing although it's taught but that's the minimum I mean, they, most of the students don't uh, study i have come across as in uh, during my uh, small stint as an academician so i would request that uh, uh an extra audit paper should be given in these things then those physics students will be suitable for artificial intelligence working for artificial intelligence in the today's uh, world of uh, data interpretation and uh, in the world of data today maxwell also called a many material or oh, theoretically maxwell material is visco elastic material having the property both elasticity and viscosity it is named james clark maxwell who proposed the model in 1867 without doing and it is also next known as maxwell fluid and it's used in many uh, physical uh, application now generalized maxwell model generalized maxwell model also known as maxwell weak set model and is the most general form of linear model of viscoelasticity in the model so, uh, several maxwell elements are also assembled in parallel now if you are if you are trying to physics students if you are trying to really realize uh you know matter materials in physical form not by printing what we do electromagnetic engineers then this particular concept may be useful and one of you if you can make it may get a novel prize displacement current d you know which was not there in the uh, uh, earlier so maxwell to uh, see that all these electromagnetic equations becomes properly and uh, physically they can explain they he introduced the concept of displacement current so really you can't see a displacement current in physics but he introduced this one so in electromagnetic displacement current density is the quantity delta d by delta t appearing in maxwell's equation that is defined in terms of the rate of change of d the electric displacement field displacement field current density has the same unit as the electric current density mind it he did it in mathematically till today we don't do it physically and it is a source of the magnetic field just as the actual current is however it is not an electric current of moving charges but a time varying electric field in physical materials as opposed to vacuum there is also a distribution from the slight motion of charges bound in atoms called dielectric polarization so this is the dielectric polarization this is the physical uh, uh what you call significance of the displacement current now idea was conceived by james clark maxwell in his 1861 paper on physical lines of force part 3 in connection with the displacement of electric particles in a dielectric medium maxwell added displacement current to the electric current terms in ampere circuit law mind it only mathematically he was trying to balance it out he had no concept of physical significance or physics in his 1865 paper a dynamic theory of electromagnetic field maxwell used this uh, amended version of ampere circuit law to derive the electromagnetic wave equation and from there he tried to prove later on that uh, electromagnetic waves has got the same velocity and he calculated velocity as that of light wave and then he also proved that uh, electromagnetic waves are uh, light waves and light waves are electromagnetic waves now 
that idea was conceived by James Clerk in 1861 on paper physical lines of force part 3 I think we are done now Maxwell's coil Maxwell also made a coil his device of producing large volume of almost constant current gradient max, magnetic field it is named in honor of Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell a Maxwell coil is an improvement of a Helmholtz coil and in operation it is provided an even more uniform magnetic field man after almost uh, i think 5 to uh, or 5 years or a decade after maxwell's death hertz proved that yes electromagnetic waves by his uh, famous uh, electric plug uh, you know spark plug experiment he proved that yes electromagnetic waves do exist and they can propagate so maxwell also worked on light maxwell theoretically showed that electromagnetic waves are light waves and vice versa he also calculated the velocity which was almost matched with the measured uh, velocity today. Uh, Maxwell also calculates was based on observations, empirical formulations, which were later on proved. Hertz was the first to show the generation and propagation of electronic waves through a spark gap experiment. And, well, conclusively proved the existence of electromagnetic waves. Here is uh, Henry Hertz. And with, between the two spark bars, he showed it. And of course, uh, Sir J.C. Board showed much later on. So, what are the new uh, paradigm of R&D in the arena of RF, microwaves, and higher frequency bands, including terahertz? Generation of making hardware, antennas, metamaterials. I gave you an idea of how you can get a Nobel Prize. MEMS, phased arrays, cognitive antennas, antennas with artificial intelligence, and, and, and uh, neural network. Neural networks. Uh, I, if I recollect, uh, maybe Professor Bhatnagar also may recollect. Uh, Professor R.K. Gupta was trying to develop some uh, uh, neural antennas. No, I don't know what happened later on. Okay, and then uh, the front ends directly going to the digital domain and built in artificial intelligence, software defined cognitive radios, cognitive radars, navigational tools, radars with artificial intelligence with reconfigurable antennas, pa power uh, devices, adaption of systems to the environment, environment studies, weather studies, all and by See, there are a lot of satellites are available by which you can do the radio occultation studies. They all fall in the domain of physics. So, simulation and emulation of softwares with synthesizing capabilities. All the softwares available today are of simulation and emulation. Can we develop a software which synthesizes the things? So, I mean, I, I must say that uh, with today's era, uh, I mean, era where we have got very powerful electromagnetic uh, simulation tools, also available mathematical tools and the fast computers. The computers are cheaper. Uh, you don't have to go to the computer center. You can work on from your house or table. And uh, there is enough scope for physics persons to work for uh, in the field of microwaves. So what I'm trying to tell you is that well, in the, we have got a convergence and fusion of various technologies in the uh, present era. I always call it a confusion. Uh, you have said that uh, curl divergence is always zero. But I say, as far as the RF field is concerned, curl divergence is never a zero. You've got infinite, uh, I mean, what do you call it, opportunities to do for it. Uh, you see, uh, I, we, uh, we were working somewhere in the 70s and having a few channels, okay? And the size of the antenna used to be like this, then it went to like this, went to satellites, and today the size is smaller than this. I mean, and perhaps tomorrow you may get a, uh, you know, which can be implanted in you. Already RFIDs are there, so maybe there are RFIDs to be put into the uh, a person also. So now with this, I complete. Uh, uh, 
can you tell me you, you want me to give another talk i do have a prepared talk or shall we finish it here and thank you very much hello thank you so much sir for sharing your valuable thoughts with us on this topic and now we have opened the forum for discussion so you may put up your query are we there are are we wait uh, he is prepared with one more uh, talk so let's enjoy one more where is the problem agar uh, sir uh, I don't think you got tired. <laughs> no, I'm not tired. I, 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 you, all of you, you must be tired. No, no, not at all. We are enjoying. Everyone is enjoying. हम यहाँ बैठे इसीलिए हैं और इतना सारा मैं आपको बता दूँ एक चीज हमारे साथ 250 से ज़्यादा participants जुड़े हुए हैं all over the country and even विदेशों से भी जुड़े हुए हैं. तो इतने participants अभी शायद join नहीं कर पा रहे या वो live YouTube पे enjoy कर रहे होंगे यहाँ शायद join नहीं कर पाए तो हम वो तो सब चाहेंगे कि अब ये मौका हमको छोड़ना नहीं है किसी भी हालत में ओके लेट मी सी नाउ प्लीज Yeah, Professor Bhatnagar, can I go ahead? Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Okay. Now I'll be very fast in this one. Uh, I am going to talk something antennas. You know, importance of antennas. So you see, what is antenna? Antenna is an interface between the free space and RF uh, circuit device. Usually, it is the reciprocal in function. What was taught? in my time that antenna is a reciprocal device it's no longer exist antennas are no longer reciprocal devices with the smart antennas active antennas aerospace antennas differ in several aspects we have got radiation pattern which forms from omnidirectional to highly directional and can be uh, configurable we are also it should be designed to withstand the dynamic mechanical and thermal stresses the constant imposed by mounting structures system size and shape the frequency the important electrical physical characteristics you know uh, when you when a, uh, a student goes for a interview persons ask what are their characteristics of your antenna what are the specifications and they usually say my antenna has got this much gain and then they keep it my antenna has got beam but but first we should start from frequency of operation then radiation coverage requirements gain beam width polarization bandwidth with respect to gain with respect to return loss with respect to polarization so bandwidth alone is not sufficient to tell and then they say about uh, mine is broadband antenna ultra wide band antenna all those things so that definition is not existing it's better to tell my bandwidth is say uh, uh, 1 is to 2 or Or two to one, or like that, or maybe twenty percent, fifty percent, that sort of thing. Isotropicity is uh, another parameter which is not taught. Isotropicity is a parameter which you know, with respect to isotropic antenna, which is a uh, antenna, which is hypothetical antenna. What is uh, your isotropicity? You, your isotropicity has to be in a fraction because you are in a directional. then mounting clearance to and from sensors other these are the things which affect your antenna performance size mass materials degassing degradation due to uv becomes very important factor body effects of the platform temperature limits vibrations and uh, uh, ground schemes now polarization we are a physics students each of you must you know polarization is very important for the antenna i gave the example na that my antenna does not have polarization so if we can make an antenna which does not have polarization we cannot uh, do the simulation we cannot do the analyze it because it works on electromagnetic waves electromagnetic waves are vector waves so polarization the ability of wave to oscillate to more than one direction in a particular polarization of light responsible for the glare reducing effect of polarized gas sunglasses 
So this is I'm talking about physics point of view. In case of polarization of antenna, the state of polarization in which the electric vector rotates or fluctuates. Then there are directly polarizers, the ch charge separation, insulating materials, polarization density, volume, dielectric polarization, dipolar polarization, ionic polarization, Maxwell Wagner's uh, cellular polarizations, and polarization in electrochemistry. Even chemistry has got the polarization aspect. So polarization becomes very important. I gave a big lecture on usually on polarization. I'll try to sh short it down. Now the polarization is concentration polarization, spin polarization, pol polarizability. Spin polarization is important for the if you are studying the materials, you know. Uh, you see, when I asked a question in a PhD viva in some IIT who was working in the uh, you know uh, magnetic materials, I asked a question: Can you tell me that uh, which is the known magnetic material? Okay which does not have magnetism in any condition. He says, sir, steel. Next person, I mean, uh, sir, steel, no, no, it can't be. Sir, dielectric, uh, uh, dielectrics. Now, they forgot that magnetism comes because of the dipole moment of the atom. And atoms are in this everywhere existing. And because of their uh, di different, uh, how atoms are packed, it gives the property of materials or like that dense steel. So it could be dielectric, it could be conductor, etc. But so they forgot about this spin polarization, they forgot about dipole moment, etc. A physics student should understand it. Then, of course, we have got a photon polarization, vacuum polarization, polarization of an Albion variety, polarization of an uh, algebraic form, and polarization density. And in mathematics, polarization of an abelian variety is in the mathematics of components, manifolds, polarization of an algebraic form, polarization identity. And of course, nowadays we read a lot of newspapers and see the TV. There is a polarization, okay? Uh, what you call communal polarization. So that's another thing that also falls in the same polarization. I mean, I'm not <laughs> talking about that one, but Polarized, yes. It's a, uh, we are getting the society polarized. Now, polarization in economics, and ec there is a polarization existing in economic, polarization existing in uh, psychology, polarization is album. I mean, you know, you see a, a music album composed by Julian Prister. It's called polarization. Polarization in many disciplines is a tendency to be uh, uh, lo you know, located close to one of the opposite ends of the continuum, and this is what we call it a polar political polarization. So, orientation of electromagnetic wave in space that defines the polarization of electromagnetic wave, and it gets affected by the medium in which it travels. And if you suppose if uh, if it's raining, the polarization changes. Many times you don't get the, your K band DTS signal. It's because of two. One is the whole wave gets depolarized while your antenna is receiving signal polarization. Second is attenuation. Your rain waves, we, we think they are like this, but rain droplets are like this. And it affects both the polarization, vertical, horizontal. It also affects the circular polarization. And that's why many times we don't receive the signal by two things. One is depolarization. Another is by attenuation. So this is the polarization which each one of you must have studied in your BSc. So uh, uh, depolarization, the non-spherical raindrops has got effect, but I told you the uh, axial ratio goes on changing depending on the uh, wind velocity and also the size of the droplet. These are the, you know, this is unpolarized light. And uh, you see the random uh, electromagnetic wave, go, uh, ele electric vector goes in all directions. If it's uh, linearly polarized, it oscillates only in one direction. So you, this uh, experiment, you have uh, been, uh, must have read it in uh, your uh, 11th or 12th class. I'm skipping it. So this is a polarization Faraday's effect. And you must have also seen this one in your... Uh, Maybe 12th experiment or maybe BS experiment. You see, when you put a saturated sugar solution, light is passed through this one, you rotate it, 
you see different lights different colors so this is a this was the first uh, polarizer which was uh, seen uh, discussing the studying the optical thing and then the electromagnetic polarizer came by professor acharya jc bose so in order to select a specific polarization of light polarizers are used polarizers can be broadly divided into ref reflective dichroic uh, uh, by present uh, polarizers color of light wave changes when it passes through certain medium the 19th century french mathematician poincare showed that it is advantageous in certain problems in optics to associate polarization state of wave with polarization on the surface of a sphere called deschamp adopted the deschamp was a mathematician it was poincare adopted this sphere to show the radio wave polarization and this is what i want to emphasize more see it is an aid in understanding the polarization of light waves or electromagnetic waves and you see this is a polarization you know you see four pi stadium if you visualize like a football or anything now if you get a polarization here from its right hand circle polarization wave is coming you see that uh, e and s vector the amplitude is same they are 90 degree of wave but if you see opposite side then if here it's the right hand opposite will be left hand and if you go on the vector if you are on the equator polarization will be always of linear but here if it's linear here it will be horizontal if it's a linear vertical here it will be horizontal here if it's inclined this way it will be inclined other way and in between say uh, the pole to the equator it will be elliptical polarization so to uh, make the students understand about the point care sphere is very important and uh, whether it's a light wave or whether it's a electromagnetic wave to make them understand point care sphere is important and uh, how this point here how the polarization changes so that's why if you got one polarization you are looking into one direction you get one polarization if you look from the other direction you get another polarization so polarization they were you know it also depends on the direction you see the, here also you can see that these are elliptical polarization on the equator it's a linear polarization again elliptical polarization but the sense changes here it's a, suppose lhcp here the sense will change rcp so polarization of the wave now i am just uh, trying to skip so this is a you know linear polarization you can uh, divide into x and y uh, axis this is a circular polarization and you got uh, it rotates uh, perpendicular to the direction of propagation and uh, circular polarization can be divided can be considered as a polar two linear polarization with 90 degree phase difference this is a elliptical polarization which each one of you know it also has got but uh, uh, the different uh, the i mean uh, a uh, the semi major and semi minor axis that uh, electric vector changes in those directions uh, well there is a something is called polarization loss also is there and uh, the polarization loss is see when you have got a, a two pole uh, and antenna you know receiving the power its uh, power transfer takes place if their polarizations are matching if the two antennas have got exact polarization then only power 100 power trans transfer takes place okay otherwise the power transfer does not take place the wave produced by either a passive scatterer or by an active antenna that also changes the polarization so polarization becomes very important uh, uh i mean you know factor as far as uh, antennas are concerned like you got one polarization this way another polarization so polarization ellipse for left hand circular polarization right hand circular polarization showing the sense of polarization for right hand circular polarization the rotation is in the u1 and left hand is opposite and if you take a dipole antenna rotating dipole and see your antenna you get this sort of pattern okay you may not be having the polarizers properly from this you can find out the uh, tilt axis the sense sense of polarization you have to find out by using a uh, helix only otherwise you can find out the your uh, electricity etc all by this one experiment by a uh, simple experiment then in your laboratory and the polarization loss factor is cos square phi and uh, it could be maximum 1 you know if you got perpendicular to each other then uh, you will not get any signal 
So maximum it could be one. Otherwise, if both the signal both are matched together, then you get the uh, polarization uh, of a loss of zero. If you are receiving from circular polarization to linear polarization, the polarization loss is minus three dB. So this is one antenna which was you know uh, using the in decibel scale. If you have got a polarization pattern in a pol polar format, you have got one linear antenna, rotate it in perpendicular direction of propagation, you get this sort of radiation pattern. And from there, you can find out what is the electricity. This is a perfect dipole, but if you don't have a perfect dipole, uh, then you get like this sort of pattern. And from there, you can find out you, uh, what I showed earlier, uh, what sort of uh, electricity is there. Sense of polarization, you should have a helix. So the same thing is put into the different scale. There is another factor is a noise factor. So electric spark, voltage, breakdown, etc. They generate unwanted interference. Uh, RF is inter intra interference. Then uh, passive intermodulation products for antennas, intermodulation products, external, extraterrestrial. Digital modulation, spoofing, etc., acoustic modulation, solar state circuit devices, they generate the noise, and that noise becomes very important for the antenna. How antenna picks up the noise? Antenna radiation pattern. See, it's not a physical temperature of the antenna, which we, we noise we define in terms of temperature. So antenna temperature is a parameter that describes how much noise an antenna produces or picks up in a given environment. The temperature is not the physical temperature of the antenna. One question is usually asked, I've got an antenna in lay, and I want the same antenna in uh, just mere, what difference it may make? As far as antenna is concerned, no difference is made. But the back end, when you've got the LNA, lay temperature is in minus, so low noise figure will be less, while at uh, just mere, the temperatures are high. So the uh, noise figure, uh, noise temperature, due to the uh, can that is LNA will increase. That. Otherwise, as far as antenna is concerned, nothing happens. So antenna noise temperature is found out by this formula, where this is the radiation pattern. And radiation pattern is in each direction. You know, you, even the side lobes pick up, back lobe pickups uh, from the noise source. In Earth, is got noise source, which has got 300, 300 Kelvin is the temperature of Earth. So in Earth, if your side lobe is looking at the sun, it will pick up the noise. So what sort, sort of uh, angle it's subsetting, theta and phi, you have to completely integrate the radiation pattern and that see the noise source, uh, theta and phi, in that direction temperature. And then you can find out, you can integrate the total thing, and then only you can find out what is the overall noise temperature of the antenna. And it's the temperature which is picked up from the surroundings, from the noise sources. It's not the physical temperature. This, of course, I have talked about it. But when you calculate the, your system noise temperature, the absorptions, you know, like uh, uh, suppose you get a 30 dB absorption here, 60 dB absorption here. Those absorptions have to be taken into account, both link as well as calculating the temperature. See, any absorption has got two-way effect. It uh, attenuates your signal. At the same time, it acts like a resistor. And that sort of equivalent noise you have to add into your total noise temperature. So other sources of noise to be considered for antenna noise measurements are earth, 273. Atmosphere depends on weather and frequency of operation. Some moon temperature that's around 250 Kelvin depends on the phase and frequency. Sun temperature 10,000 to 30,000 kilo, kilo uh, uh, Kelvins. Copper losses, side lobe losses you have to consider. Antennas in the complex platform, you have to consider the quantity of interest includes the pattern distortion, how you are mounting, and what sort of the come what sort of coupling is there. If you got an omnidirectional antenna, in the mounting structure becomes a part of the antenna. So uh, I'm just uh, skipping. This is, I already talked about the polarization. So uh, isotropy parameter you have, can calculate it. Listen, it is always less than one. Because isotropic, it has even gain. It's uh, isotropicity is uh, not to be uh, confused with the uh, antenna. Can 
well i am just uh, thank this is one antenna which we made it yesterday only i visited it and uh, the uh, why i wanted to show it because one dr vivi srinivasan who is the director of strike now he is a combined student between me and professor batnagar and his phd is on this dichroic uh, antenna it is a 32 meter antenna dichroic fields are there and uh, you see there, there is a dichroic mirror another dichroic mirror now the fabs so now this this uh, dichroic mirror reflects only it uh, see so here it uh, uh, allows the s band to go it reflects all the things allow s band to come here and stops the s band only x band goes here and then the, this mirror only allows x band to uh, get reflected and comes here and it allows ka band to go there so this is a big thing here you see it's a uh, beam wave guide and this is the dichroic mirror made in india everything is made in india at that time 32 meter this we use it for a mars orbiter as well as chandrayaan etc a man can watch through this one. this is the geometry of the same thing this is the radiation pattern this uh, simulated radiation pattern nowadays we measure it using the satellites this is the 32 meter antenna dish we also have got the omnidirectional antenna here which is quadrifidal helix they are the directional shaped beam antennas we did not have uh, earlier when we made the inset when we wanted to we did not have much of radiation pattern so we uh, devised a method why i am trying to tell that if you don't have all the complicated equipments you can you can do even this be you know we found out every level we normalize with respect to the highest gain and then plotted in a rectangular plot these are the null regions and these are the gain regions this is a belt array micro strip belt array which was came and we put the satellite into orbit and brought it back this is a uh, we put uh, omnidirectional antennas transtal antenna on a satellite which was brought back and uh, it was on the balloon it was put into the bay of bengal this is the antenna which is made for the big big vehicles which are launched see this is the saral antenna so we got the own direction antenna the small antenna you can make antenna any sort of antenna it depends on your thing this is one uh, active phase there antenna which is we made it using the helix you know at x band somebody says you cannot use a helix as a tax band we have used the helix as a tax band and we generated dual beams in that one this has gone into all the satellites remote sensing satellite dual beams so you see the beam here and you can generate two beams of the same thing one for delhi another for hyderabad all these things have been done see here you see how the uh, uh, satellite comes and the satellite tracks the ground station rather than the ground station tracking the Uh, satellite this is the antenna which has gone into chandrayaan and mars orbiter we also made the shape we maintain us which is shape the uh, thing like india shape also we can do it mostly we have worked on quite a bit on direct and this is a uh, x ku band micro strip antenna configuration so we we had an array we could uh, uh, generate this is at uh, 14 gigahertz this is 11 gigahertz generate the beam uh, which was commensurate with the indian subcontinent Since all of you are working with micro strips, I thought I can show you off. These are the simple helices for the Gagan Satna satellite navigation. We have put it into orbit by dielectric. We have generated six, eight beams only dielectric antenna. You can use, uh, you know, in place of using Teflon, I suggest to use uh, polycarbonate rods are available. These are the antennas, deployable antennas.
this is a one a micro strip patch array the, and it can gen, uh, handle one uh, i think it can handle almost 1 gigawatt of power and uh, uh, this is a we did not uh, so this is 35 db side down side lobe you know modified tailor distribution we did it it was used for uh, some de de defense applications this is we worked on the dielectric spheres and you see this uh, monopulse comparator was made by you know vidyut tantra modi nagar so maybe we paid some 10000 rupees this dielectric uh, spheres and all these things were made in 10000 rupees the total feed which imported which would have been imported in somewhere in 90s would have costed 2 crores which costed 20000 rupees and the beautiful pattern is there so i suggest you guys can work in dielectrics also you can have teflon you can have polycarbonate they are all freely available and it can be machined in no time so you see beautiful radiation pattern is there now this is a yes we all isros and drdos and ecl antennas have got this feed so this is the measured secondary and uh, you know defense pattern beautiful pattern with this uh, uh, feed which has uh, 20000 now i think they may be charging a lakh or so so this we mounted on a 11 meter antenna on a sonar test range See, we have got a beautiful antenna measurement facilities. Uh, now, this is all how and satellites are assembled. Now, why I wanted to show you, I did not have anything. So, I started my carrier measuring like this. There's the absorbers. This is an Apple satellite was made, launched. This is a fiberglass mask, which was made by Dr. Kalam when he was a head of FRPD. It's a telescopic mask. This is a I bought this uh, ladder in 5,000 rupees, how this was done in the 80s. And uh, this is the absorbers are there, absorb his Yagi antenna, specular reflections were avoided by this. So if you don't have a beautiful facility, you can create your own facility. Let me also tell this has become very important for them. This is an Apple spacecraft, okay? Uh, we, have, we have to measure the uh, you know RF thing. It would have costed 150 crores if we are not sorry it would have costed some uh, 8 to 10 crores if you would have taken to europe and done the measurements and we put absorbers here uh, it's a nitrogen tent uh, it's a flight uh, antenna is there a flight model of apple and this we put on a non-metallic structure a bullock cord put all absorbers around it put a bull here and uh, this is a uh, what we have done there, uh, you know, in this, so, uh, 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 specular reflections, the ground reflections were cut off by the absorbers. This is a flight model, impedance measurements were done, and uh, this is a bull. So, uh, for, this bull was only put for photograph purposes. Uh, so, this, what would have costed some, uh, maybe 2 to 8 crores of rupees, costed us 150 rupees, that's all. So we, you can have innovative ways by like this also. Nitrogen, the nitrogen was pumped, always they pumped in this one. And this satellite worked in the space. So, and, the, and this uh, photograph was shared by me to some Europeans. And they say at that time, uh, it was satellite was launched in uh, 1987. That India has got a means of manufacturing the satellites, but no means of uh, transporting it. Then from there, we made a uh, anechoic chamber in open field. You know, backside, we put a, all absorbers here. IRS satellite was tested. Then we made our own anechoic chamber where inset 2 D satellite was tested. Now we got, we got a beautiful facilities in ISRO. So this is how I propagated, how, how I started, uh, you know, uh, this is a uh, Yagi antenna array in 80, 
1975 after was tracked by using this one. And what you see, we did not have in the country at the time uh, fiberglass. So to put the array in proper uh, shape, to put the array in proper shape, you see a black triangle. I, this black triangle is nothing but bamboo. No, we put the things in bamboo proper shape. And this satellite, this antenna was used by hand tracking. Are but we tracked it. Then from there, we have gone to the eleven meter antenna. The efficiency of 77%. Then we have gone to the 32 meter deep. So how we have progressed over years. So even if you don't have facilities, you can do wonders. So thank you very much. So I feel India is an uh, aspiring country. You can do wonders with simple things. Also, you can do it. And uh, Dr. Professor Bhatnagar also may recall that he also did not have much of a great facilities by putting absorbers. Uh, they were working in the MNIT. And also, I have seen his laboratory in Rajasthan University. Wonderful work can be done uh, in simple facilities also. So thank you very much. I think I don't know how much time I have taken it. Thank you. And uh, it was a great pleasure to see all of you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for a wonderful session you gave us. Now I request Dr. Sumita Shikhawat, ma'am, for vote of honor. Good morning to one and all present over here. Good morning one and all present over here. Feeling thankfulness and not expressing it is like a wrapping, wrapping a present and not giving it. Today I feel honored and privileged to thank all the honorable delegates who facilitated us with their constant guidance to shape this workshop. They will be blessing us with their presence during this workshop. I want to extend our generous thanks and deep regards to our chief guest for the day, Dr. Surendra Pal, former additional director, distinguished scientist, Satellite Center ISRO for taking his precious time out and consenting to be the chief guest. Sir, indeed, your words have inspired all of us and has given us a lot of encouragement. A hearty vote of thanks to our guest of honor, Professor Deepak Bhatnagar, former head, Department of Physics, University of Rajasthan, Jaipur, who graced this occasion by sharing his valuable words it needs, it needs mention here that without his guidance, it would have been impossible for us to organize this workshop. I extend our thanks to Director Dr. Rashmi Chaturvedi, Principal Dr. Seema Agrawal and Vice Principal Dr. Ratna Saxena, Dr. Sarla Sharma and Dr. Diptima Deep Shukla and Dean Infrastructure Dr. Ranjula Jain for their constant support. Lastly, I leave you by this inspiring quote by Nelson Mandela. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. During coming two days, let's use this powerful weapon and see how every one of us can use this to change the world. So all the very best to all of you. Once again, I thank you all for your kind presence in inaugural session and also keynote session. Sir has given a wonderful keynote session and explained the journey of communication starting from the, um, uh, from the origin to the present scenario. I thank you very much, sir, for such an interesting and such an informative keynote session. And now I hand over my mic to uh, anchors for the functioning of next session. Thank uh, you. Very one minute. Professor Badnagar, I am available in Jaipur from 16 to 25th. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. You spared your valuable time for us. Thank you so much. Good pleasure.
my pleasure thank you very much ma'am and thank you very much surendra pal sir aage badhne se pehle ek choti si housekeeping aap sabhi ke liye today's workshop will include four session and the first session was led by dr surendra pal sir it was the keynote session as you all have joined it and enjoyed and learned a lot about second moving forward the another session will be presented by dr deepak bhatnagar sir former head university of rajasthan next session next session will be led by dr parul patel ma'am group director isro lastly but not the least though the session will be led by dr manisha gupta ma'am assistant professor university of rajasthan as we all know this housekeeping and briefing has already been done when dr deepak bhatnagar sir briefed us about the program so without a further ado we have quite an interesting itinerary forward without the further ado we will turn the time over and i request our next speaker dr deepak bhatnagar sir to share his insights on the topic basics about microwave components i request dr deepak bhatnagar sir to present his presentation on basics about microwave components good morning to you all thanks a lot khanna sir for your presence today we are going to discuss something about basics of microwaves i feel that you are studying microwaves many of you must be studying microwaves in your masters course and certainly the because due to covid pandemic we are unable to spare enough time in our labs and understanding microwave components is very essential because without understanding the working and the basics of microwave components it is really difficult for us to use them properly so the aim of my presentation is to give you a glimpse about the basic microwave components i am going to you uh, discuss only those components which we are using in our master slab not those components which we are using for the research activities in research activities we are not we normally use highly sophisticated equipments and they require men enough precision they provide enough precision in the results but when you are we are using the microwave components in our lab the uh, equipments are simple and the precision is not as high as that we can have with the equipment that we are using for our research activities so i will start my presentation you know that microwaves are ranging from 300 megahertz to no it i am reading it only up to 30 megahertz so i am limiting it up to 30 gigahertz because beyond 30 gigahertz we have millimeter waves 
So in some of the books, you can find that their range is from 300 megahertz to 300 gigahertz. But if we actually consider the microwaves, then these are limited from 300 megahertz to 30 gigahertz. And beyond 30 gigahertz, millimeter waves comes into picture. Then these frequency range is divided in many bands. I'm considering here only four bands. These four bands are L band, S band, C band, and X band. These are the four bands that we are considering. Now, L band and S band are mainly used for mobile communication. Whatever handset you are having, your handset is working mainly in the range of, uh, because the old Nokia 800 handsets were having frequency 800 megahertz, and nowadays, it has reached up to 2 gigahertz, something little less than 2 gigahertz. But now we are approaching towards 2 gigahertz. So the frequency range, this L and S bands are we are normally using for mobile and wireless communication systems. Because the Wi-Fi that you are using, for example, a Bluetooth device that is operating at 2.45 gigahertz. Fixed, fixed frequency. Microwave ovens we are using at our places, home, are working at 2.45 gigahertz. These are the fixed frequency ranges. So, the L band we consider it from 1 to 2 gigahertz, then 2 to 4 gigahertz, then 4 to 8 gigahertz. <laughs> okay, so at X band is from 8 to 12 gigahertz. This is rough value. These are rough values, so 8 to 12 gigahertz. Now, whatever equipment we are having in our lab are operating in X band. In master's lab, we are having all the equipments in that are working in 8 to 12 gigahertz. Or if I calculate central frequency, calculate karu, 8 to 12 ki, so it is something around 10 gigahertz. Now, safely can say that our setup is about 10 gigahertz. And if I ask you, what is the corresponding frequency of 10 gigahertz? Frequency kitni hogi, uh, wavelength kitni hogi? So, what is the answer? 10 gigahertz ke corresponding wavelength kitni hogi? Because these are electromagnetic waves. Inki ki velocity light ki velocity hai. Agar main inki wavelength calculate karta hoon, to yeh something around 3 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz sa. Sorry, 3, 3 centimeters sa. So, wavelength of microwaves work operating at 10 gigahertz is 3 centimeters. So, agar koi bhi aap se poochta hai, ki, क्योंकि अभी आप मास्टर्स के अपने प्रैक्टिकल एग्जाम्स में भी अपीयर होंगे और वहां पर आपसे जो एक्सटर्नल एक, आएगा वो पूछ सकता है कि आप किस फ्रीक्वेंसी में या किस वेवलेंथ पे काम कर रहे हैं तो उस समय आप बिल्कुल इजीली कह सकते हैं कि इफ वी आर ऑपरेटिंग बिकॉज़ वी आर ऑपरेटिंग वी आर यूजिंग आवर इक्विपमेंट इन द एक्स बैंड एंड दैट इज एक्सटेंडेड फ्रॉम 8 गीगाहर्ट्ज टू 12 गीगाहर्ट्ज एंड इफ वी कंसीडर 10 गीगाहर्ट्ज एट द सेंट्रल फ्रीक्वेंसी देन द वेवलेंथ विल बी समथिंग अराउंड 3 सेंटी this is safe answer. So, here we have the frequency that we consider is 8 to 12 gigahertz consider in the lab and the wavelength is about a few centimeters, 10 gigahertz to 3 centimeters. Okay. Now, a small question. Only give me a pass point A2. Suppose. Suppose I am having a tube. Or a signal, going to such a signal. 
इस ट्यूब के अंदर नेटर करता था कुछ भी करना इस ट्यूब के अंदर नेटर कर रहा है और इस ट्यूब को मैंने इस सिरे से क्लोज कर बंद कर दिया वॉट वे कर दिस क्वेश्चन इज ओपन फॉर ऑल ऑडियंस कैन रिप्लाई If I am having a closed tube and a signal is entering from one end and tube is closed at other end, what will happen? मेरे ख्याल से आप एक बाकी सब में लगा रखा है मास्क तो आप मास्क नीचे करके बात कर सकते हैं ठीक है कि यहां से वेव इस शॉर्ट से रिफ्लेक्ट होगी और रिफ्लेक्ट होने के बाद में वो इंसिडेंट जो वेव है उसके ऊपर सुपर इम्पोज होगी और उसके कारण से क्या होगा यू विल हैव स्टैंडिंग वेव यू विल हैव स्टैंडिंग वेव सो ओके रिफ्लेक्टेड वेव और इंसिडेंट वेव आप उसे सुपर इम्पोज हो रही है एंड यू विल हैव स्टैंडिंग वेव नाउ वॉट अगर मैं मान लीजिए अब इस एंड को खोल दे सिग्नल इज स्टिल एंट्री और अब मेरा ये एंड ओपन है ओपन एंड में क्या होगा ठीक सही कि अब सिग्नल मेरा इस ट्यूब से बाहर निकल जाएगा ऑल यू एग्री सब एग्री करते हैं कोई ऐसा है जो एग्री नहीं करता है कोई भी ऐसा है जो एग्री नहीं करता है मैं एग्री नहीं करता मैं एग्री नहीं करता ओनली फाइव परसेंट सिग्नल टेन परसेंट सिग्नल एट परसेंट सिग्नल सेवन परसेंट सिग्नल बाहर जाएगा and entire signal will get reflected and again you will have standing waves ye kahan padha tha kahan padha tha ye jab main school mein padha tha open end organ pipe and closed end organ pipes wahan pe sound wave ke liye padha tha sound wave mein tuning fork se tuning fork ko hit karke aur uske paas mein ऑर्गन पाइप के पास में लाते हैं और उसके बाद में फिर उसकी अगर हम पानी की हाइट को एडजस्ट करते हैं तो हमको रेजोनेंसी कंडीशन मिलती है और उसमें से हमको नॉइज आवाज आता है एंड अब मेरे पास में यहां पर तो थ्योरी के अंदर हमने खूब पढ़ा था ओपन एंड और क्लोज एंड और वहां पे हमने ये पढ़ा था कि दोनों साइड में हमारे पास में दोनों ही कंडीशन के अंदर हमको स्टैंडिंग वेव मिलती है तब तो हमारी इस हिम्मत नहीं हुई कि हम अपने टीचर से पूछ सकें कि सर या मैडम इतने ये जो दोनों कंडीशन में सिग्नल बाहर क्यों निकल गया और ये हमको दोनों स्थिति के अंदर हमको स्टैंडिंग रेस क्यों मिल रही लेकिन आज तो पूछ सकते हो आज तो पूछ सकते हो आपकी क्यों ऐसी स्थिति हो रही है तो आंसर इज अब याद रखिए कोई आपसे पूछे तो आंसर इज Whenever there is any kind of discontinuity, signal will reflect back. जब भी किसी भी तरह की discontinuity होती है तो signal reflect हो कोई भी discontinuity हो सकती है अब यहां पर क्या discontinuity हो रही है यहां पर discontinuity होती है impedance की यहां पर इस पाइप के अंदर का जो medium है that medium is bound medium. और इस पाइप के बाहर का जो मीडियम है वो है ओपन ओपन मीडियम या फ्री स्पेस और सिग्नल मेरा एक एंटर करने के बाद एक मीडियम से दूसरे मीडियम में जाना जा रहा है और दोनों मीडियम का इंपिडेंस डिफरेंट है फ्री स्पेस का इंपिडेंस कितना होता है फ्री स्पेस का इंपिडेंस कितना होता है 125 
और बाउंड भी नहीं होता कुछ इंपीडेंस होता है देने वालों किस तरह की टीम बनी हुई है लेकिन इट विल बी समथिंग अराउंड 100 एंड देयर इज अ मिसमैच 125 का मतलब है 377 ओम एंड देयर इज मिसमैच एंड व्हेन एवर देयर इज मिसमैच को हम क्या कह रहे हैं मिसमैच को हम यहां वर्ड दे रहे हैं डिसकंटिन्यूटी सो व्हेन एवर देयर इज डिसकंटिन्यूटी सिंगल विल रिफ्लेक्ट और यहां पे किसका मिसमैच हो रहा है इंपीडेंस का एंड बिकॉज़ इंपीडेंस मिसमैच इज देयर देयरफॉर सिग्नल विल रिफ्लेक्ट बैक एंड यू विल हैव स्टेट और अगर ऐसा नहीं होता तो मुझे कभी भी बांसुरी के अंदर आवाज नहीं सुनाई देती सारी की सारी हवा बाहर निकल रही थी बांसुरी मेरी बज रही है उसमें छेद होते हैं वो उसके सुरों के लिए होते हैं लेकिन अगर आप सारे अगर आप उसके अंदर इस तरह से कर रहे हैं तो उस समय भी आपको सारे छेद बंद कर दे फिर भी हवा कहीं से लीक अगर आप खूब मार रहे हैं तो आपको नॉइज सुनाई देती आवाज सुनाई देती बिकॉज उस स्थिति में आपका सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट होता सो वेन एवर देयर इज एनी काइंड ऑफ डिसकंटिन्यूटी सिग्नल विल रिफ्लेक्ट एंड दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट आस्पेक्ट हम अगर माइक्रोवेव में काम कर रहे हैं तो ध्यान में रखिए पहली बात जो मैं आपसे कह रहा हूं कि अगर हम माइक्रोवेव में काम कर रहे हैं तो हमको यह ध्यान रखना है कि आप माइक्रोवेव के बेंच जब जोड़ते हैं तो कैसे जोड़ते हैं एक कंपोनेंट से दूसरे कंपोनेंट को जोड़ते हैं ये मेरे पास में कंपोनेंट है इस कंपोनेंट को मैं दूसरे कंपोनेंट से जोड़ रहा हूं और इन कंपोनेंट्स के अंदर यहां पे छेद बने हुए हैं रेक्टेंगुलर इन कंपोनेंट में यहां पे छेद बने हुए हैं अगर मैं इन कंपोनेंट्स को आपस में जोड़ रहा हूं और अगर ये जो रेक्टेंगुलर छेद आपस में एक दूसरे से नहीं मिल रहे हैं बिल्कुल सही तरीके से नहीं मिल रहे हैं देन यू विल हैव स्टेप नहीं इसको हम कहते हैं स्टेपिंग अगर नहीं भी मिल रहे हैं अगर हमारे यहां पर नहीं मिल रहे हैं छेद से छेद ये रेक्टेंगुलर जो हमारे होल्स हैं, अगर ये नहीं मिल रहे हैं आपस में तो उस स्थिति में ये तो कहते हैं स्टेपिंग और इस स्टेपिंग की व्हाट इज दिस स्टेपिंग दिस इज डिसकंटिन्यूटी और डिसकंटिन्यूटी होने के कारण से क्या है कि सिग्नल जो हमारा क्लाइस्ट्रॉन से जो हमारा सोर्स है वहां से जो आ रहा है वो हम चाहते हैं कि बिल्कुल एंड डिटेक्टर तक पहुंचे लेकिन वो डिटेक्टर तक नहीं पहुंच पाता है वो रिफ्लेक्ट होना शुरू हो जाता है डिस्कंटिन्यूटी रिफ्लेक्शन का सोर्स हो तो हम चाहते हैं सिग्नल हमारा फॉरवर्ड डायरेक्शन में जाए लेकिन डिस्कंटिन्यूटी के कारण से सिग्नल हमारा रिफ्लेक्ट होने लगता है और रिफ्लेक्ट होने के कारण से हमको जो हमारी एक्चुअल पावर वहां पहुंचनी चाहिए वो नहीं पहुंचती है और कई बार अगर ज्यादा सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट होकर के वापस क्लाइस्ट्रॉन तक पहुंच गया तो आपका सोर्स खराब तो पहला बात जो हमको किसी भी बेंच को जोड़ते समय जो ध्यान में रखनी है वो ये रखनी है कि आपको अपने सोर्स को आपको अपने कंपोनेंट्स को इस तरीके से जोड़ना है कि वो बिल्कुल प्रॉपर्टली जुड़े वहां किसी भी तरह की कोई डिस्कंटिन्यूटी नहीं होनी चाहिए और अगर किसी भी तरह की डिस्कंटिन्यूटी हो रही है तो उसको आपको ध्यान रखना उसको रिमूव करना पड़ेगा बेंच को प्रॉपरली जोड़ना पड़ेगा अब दूसरी बात ये वो कंपोनेंट है जिसको हम कह रहे हैं क्लाइस्ट्रॉन बाउंड ये क्लाइस्ट ये हमारी जो वेव गाइड है ये ट्यूब है ये क्लाइस्ट्रॉन बाउंड है जिसके ऊपर के क्लाइस्ट्रॉन लगा हुआ व्हाट इज द वर्किंग ऑफ क्लाइस्ट्रॉन ये आप कल समझे कल का जो हमारा पहला सेशन है उसके अंदर जो ट्यूब्स के ऊपर जो हमारा सेशन है उसमें आपको क्लाइस्ट्रॉन कैसे काम करता है वो सारी चीजें बताई जाती मैं क्लाइस्ट्रॉन कैसे काम कर रहा है ये भी 
लेकिन इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट ये है कुछ चीजें ध्यान में हमेशा रखनी चाहिए कि जब हम साइस्टोन अपने लैब में यूज कर रहे हैं तो साइस्टोन हमारा एक पर्टिकुलर टाइप ऑफ टाइप साइस्टोन और उस साइस्टोन के का जो नंबर है 2k25 x बैंड के सिग्नल जनरेट करने के लिए हम नॉर्मली जो क्लाइस्टोन यूज करते हैं ट्यूब यूज करते हैं उसका नंबर होता है 2k25 और इस इस में क्या है एक में ये बैंड है और उसके साथ में एक इस तरीके का ये पीछे अटैचमेंट हो ठीक है इस अटैचमेंट के साथ में इस वेब लाइट के अंदर और ये है स्क्रू टाइप ट्रेन ये जो है ट्रेन में जाते हैं ये स्क्रू टाइप ट्रेन में है यानी कि अगर मैं इसको रोटेट करूं तो ये प्लंजर आगे पीछे हो सकता ठीक है अब क्या है अब एक वायर इस ट्यूब के अंदर जा रहा है इस क्लाइस्ट्रॉन से एक वायर इस ट्यूब के अंदर जा रहा है ये वायर एक एंटीना की तरह से काम करता है एंटीना का काम क्या होता है सिग्नल को रेडिएट कर तो ये वायर एक एंटीना की तरीके से काम करता है यानी कि यहां से सिग्नल रेडिएट हो रहा है सिग्नल रेडिएट हो रहा है वो पीछे की साइड में भी रेडिएट हो रहा है आगे की साइड में भी रेडिएट हो रहा है हमारा पर्पस क्या है हम चाहते हैं कि सारा का सारा सिग्नल हमारा इस तरफ जाए लेकिन पार्ट ऑफ सिग्नल को मेरा बैक डायरेक्शन में भी जा रहा था पार्ट ऑफ सिग्नल मेरा बैक डायरेक्शन में भी जा रहा था तो इसका मतलब यह हुआ कि जो सिग्नल मेरा फॉरवर्ड डायरेक्शन में जाना चाहिए था वो प्रॉपर भी नहीं जा रहा है और जाकर के जो बैक डायरेक्शन में जो सिग्नल जा रहा है वो उस प्लंजर से उसको हिट करेंगे कटराएगा उससे और वहां से क्योंकि वो मीडियम है मेटल प्लेट है तो मेटल प्लेट से वो रिफ्लेक्ट होगा और रिफ्लेक्ट होकर के वो वापस फॉरवर्ड डायरेक्शन में जाएगा और फिर जो ऑलरेडी फॉरवर्ड में डायरेक्शन में जा रहा है उसके साथ सुपर इम्पोज होगा और सुपर इम्पोज होने के बाद में मिल पड़ता है मैक्सिमम मिनिमम हमको क्या काम है कि मेरा सिग्नल फॉरवर्ड डायरेक्शन में भी जा रहा है और बैकवर्ड डायरेक्शन में भी जा रहा है मैं ये चाहता हूं कि जो बैकवर्ड डायरेक्शन में जा रहा है वो सिग्नल इस प्लंजर से टकरा करके जब वो वापस लौट करके आए तो जो इस डायरेक्शन में सिग्नल जा रहा है उसके साथ में सेम फेज में एड सेम फेज में एड हो ये मैं चाहता हूं अगर आउट ऑफ फेज एड हुआ तो क्या होगा कोई सिग्नल मेरे को आ गया तो नहीं है तो मैं चाहता हूं कि जो सिग्नल ब्लैक डॉ करके वापस इधर आ रहा है वो इस डायरेक्शन में जो ऑलरेडी जा रहा है उसके साथ में सेम फेज में एड तो उसके लिए क्या करना चाहिए हमको उसके लिए जरूरी है कि हम पास डिफरेंस को सेट करें पास डिफरेंस को सेट करें अगर मैं चाहता हूं कि पास डिफरेंस इस तरीके का हो कि जो एक सिग्नल लॉट करके आ रहा है और जो इधर जा रहा है वो सेम फेज में या उनके बीच में फेज कितना होना चाहिए आई फाइव फेज होना चाहिए तो है सॉरी पार्ट डिफरेंस कह रहा हूं तो पार्ट डिफरेंस लैंडा होना चाहिए लैंडा या उसका मल्टीपल होना चाहिए फेज में बात लैंडा या उसका मल्टीपल होना चाहिए लैंडा या उसका मल्टीपल करने के लिए क्या चाहिए मेरे को चाहिए कि जो लॉट करके आए तो ये जो सिग्नल लॉट के आ रहा है ये लैंडा का डिस्टेंस ये ट्रेवल करके अगर आएगा और इस पर सुपर इम्पोज होगा तो दोनों सेम फेज में एड होंगे कि नहीं होंगे एग्री तो मेरे लिए जरूरी है कि इस 
कंजर की जो प्लेट है उसको ऐसे एडजस्ट करो कि ये जो सिग्नल राइट साइड में जा रहा है ये लैंडर डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल करके ही सुपर इम्पोज हो प्रॉपर्ट सिग्नल तो मेरे को इस वायर से इस प्लेट को कितनी दूरी पर रखना चाहिए वायर को इस प्लेट से कितनी दूरी पर रखना चाहिए लैंडा का मेरे को पांच डिफरेंस चाहिए है तो मुझे कितना कितनी दूरी पर रखना चाहिए बोलिए 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 मेरे को पांच डिफरेंस लैंडा चाहिए तो कितनी दूरी होनी चाहिए वायर और प्लेट के बीच की गलत होने में कोई बात नहीं है किसी के नंबर नहीं कट रहे टू लैंडा इन दोनों के बीच में टू लैंडा हो गया तो टू लैंडा ये जाएगी टू लैंडा लौट के आएगी तो फोर लैंडा हो गया लैंडा बाई टू एग्री ये कह रहे हैं लैंडा बाई टू इधर से कोई लैंडा बाई टू कह रहा है लैंडा तो लैंडा से तो वापस टू लैंडा हो जाएगा मेरे को तो लैंडा सफिशियंट है लैंडा बाई टू एग्री और मैं तो नहीं एग्री हूं क्या बात है मैं आपसे एग्री नहीं होता हूं हर चीज के अंदर मैं आपसे एग्री नहीं करता हूं इन दोनों के बीच का सेपरेशन लैंडा बाई टू नहीं होना चाहिए हम क्योंकि तो बाउंड मीडियम है इसलिए हम उसको एक्चुअली लैंडा नहीं कहते हैं उसके एक जगह पर हम वर्ड यूज करते हैं गाइड वेवलेट लैंडा जी ठीक है तो लैंडा जी बाई टू नहीं होना चाहिए अब तरह से याद करो आप सब कि आपने ऑप्टिक्स में कुछ पढ़ा था आपने ऑप्टिक्स में पढ़ा था कि जब रेडिएशन किसी डेंस मीडियम से रिफ्लेक्ट होती है तो लैंडा बाई टू का एक एडिशनल पास डिफरेंस एड हो जाता है याद आया जब डेंस मीडियम से रिफ्लेक्ट होती है इलेक्ट्रोमेटिव वेट या रेडिएशन तो लैमडा बाई टू का एक एडिशनल पास डिफरेंस एड हो जाता है तो यहां पर ये प्लेट क्या है जो प्लंजा रही हो क्या है दैट इज अ डेंस मीडियम मेटल प्लेट है और जब सिग्नल उससे रिफ्लेक्ट हो रहा है तो टकरा किस रहा है डेंस मीडियम से रिफ्लेक्ट हो रहा है तो डेंस मीडियम एक लैमडा बाई टू का पार्ट डिफरेंस और एडिशनल बुक खुद पैदा कर रही है तो अब दोनों के बीच का सेपरेशन कितना होना चाहिए लैमडा बाई फोर लैमडा बाई फोर प्लस लैमडा बाई टू प्लस लॉटे का लैमडा बाई फोर कितना हो जाएगा तो दूसरा जो आप अपने एक्सपेरिमेंट को करते समय ध्यान रखेंगे वो ये है कि इस वायर और इस प्लंजर के बीच का सेपरेशन लैमडा बाई लैमडा जी बाई फोर लैमडा तभी आपका फेज में एड होगा अगर आपने फेज में एड अगर इसको लैमडा जी बाई फोर के अलावा कोई भी वैल्यू सेपरेशन रखेंगे तो उस स्थिति में ये सेम फेज में एड नहीं तो दूसरा जो हमको सबसे बड़ा ध्यान रखना वो ये है कि हमको जो क्लाइस्ट्रॉन से वायर आ रहा है और उसके बाद जो प्लंज है उनके सेपरेशन को लैमडा जी बाई फोर सेट कर ओके अब इस को ट्यूब को जो हम कनेक्ट करते हैं वो कनेक्ट करते हैं एक क्लाइस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई क्लाइस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई ये सप्लाई पावर सप्लाई और इस पावर सप्लाई के लिए जो कंपनी सेट करती है उसमें आपको दो वोल्टेज सेट करने पड़ते हैं वन इज नोन एज बी वोल्टेज एंड अदर वन इज नोन एज ट्रिपल वोल्टेज बी वोल्टेज और रिपेल तो जब आप लैब में काम करने जा रहे हैं तो आपको जाते ही अपनी पावर सप्लाई को ऑन नहीं करना ध्यान रखना 
कि जब आप अपना एक्सपेरिमेंटल लेवल पे जा रहे हैं तो जाते ही अपनी पावर सप्लाई को ऑन नहीं करना सबसे पहले रिपेलर वोल्टेज के नॉक को पूरा लेफ्ट साइड में पूरा घुमा कंप्लीट रिपेलर सॉरी रिपेलर वोल्टेज के नॉक को पूरा राइट साइड में घुमा यानी उसे मैक्सिमाइज कर और बीम वोल्टेज को आपको लेफ्ट साइड में कंप्लीट घुमा देना है यानी कि बीम वोल्टेज को आपको मिनिमम कर देना और उसके बाद में आप पावर सप्लाई का स्विच को ऑन कीजिए उस पर इंतजार कीजिए उसके बाद में आप बीम वोल्टेज के नॉब को सेट कीजिए 300 हंड्रेड वोल्ट के बीम वोल्टेज आपको 300 हंड्रेड वोल्ट नॉब से आप सेट कर सकते हैं तो बीम वोल्टेज को आपको 300 हंड्रेड वोल्ट पे सेट कर अभी मैंने रिपेलर वोल्टेज को मैक्सिमम ही कर रखा है अब मैं उसके रिपेलर वोल्टेज के नॉब को कम करता हूं और कम करने पर एक पर्टिकुलर वोल्टेज ऐसा आता है जबकि इसके साथ में जुड़ा हुआ इंडिकेटिंग मीटर जो भी है वो उसके मेरे को मैक्सिमम मिल तो जहां पे मेरे को पहली बार मैक्सिमम मिल रहा है उसी रिपेलर वोल्टेज पे आपको सेट करना है वो 120 ट्वेंटी वोल्ट माइनस वन ट्वेंटी वोल्ट वन थर्टी वोल्ट या माइनस क्यों तो लगा हुआ है ये माइनस इसलिए लगा हुआ है कि जो आपके गन से जो आपके गन से इलेक्ट्रॉन आ रहे हैं मैं नहीं चाहता कि वो इस इलेक्ट्रॉन से जाके हिट करे मैं चाहता हूं कि ये कल आपको बताएंगे ये इसको हिट नहीं कराना चाहते बल्कि हम चाहते हैं कि जो इलेक्ट्रॉन आ रहे हैं वो इस पर हिट करने से पहले रिफ्लेक्ट हो और रिफ्लेक्ट होने के लिए जरूरी है कि हम इसको नेगेटिव वोल्टेज तो मैं इसको एक पर्टिकुलर नेगेटिव वोल्टेज देता हूँ इसको रिफ्लेक्टर वोल्टेज कहते हैं और वो रिफ्लेक्टर वोल्टेज हमारा करीब वन फोर्टी वन फिफ्टी वन फोर्टी फाइव वोल्ट के करीब होता है जब हम वो वोल्टेज अप्लाई करते हैं तो इतना आप परचेस करना है तो आपके इंडिकेटिंग मीटर में मैक्सिमम आपको रिफ्लेक्शन इस समय जिस आप जो आपका पहली बार जब आपको मैक्सिमम आपको रिफ्लेक्शन मीटर में मिल रहा है उस समय सिग्नल अपने साथ में मैक्सिमम एनर्जी कैरी कर माइक्रोवेव सिग्नल अपने साथ में मैक्सिमम एनर्जी को कैरी कर तो सबसे पहले आप उस रिपेलर वोल्टेज को बी वोल्टेज आप थ्री हंड्रेड पर फिक्स कर दीजिए और रिपेलर वोल्टेज को आप एडजस्ट कीजिए तब तक एडजस्ट कीजिए जब तक कि आपके इंडिकेटिंग मीटर के अंदर आपको मैक्सिमम रीडिंग ना मिलने लगे जहां पे आपको मैक्सिमम रीडिंग मिले वहीं उस पर रिपेलर वोल्टेज को रोक दीजिए और अब आपका सेटअप एक्सपेरिमेंट करने के लिए कर तो मेरा पहला जो कंपोनेंट है वो पहला कंपोनेंट है क्लाइस्ट्रॉन पॉवर सप्लाई विद क्लाइस्ट्रॉन माउंट इसको कहते हैं क्लाइस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई केपीएस विद क्लाइस्ट्रॉन माउंट क्लाइस्ट्रॉन माउंट जिसमें कि हम क्लाइस्ट्रॉन को माउंट करते हैं लगाते हैं तो ये हमारा पहला कंपोनेंट है ध्यान से पहला कंपोनेंट को समझ में आया या नहीं आया तो चलिए ये तो बढ़िया हमारा पहला इसके बाद में जो दूसरा कंपोनेंट हम बनाते हैं दैट इज एटीनेटेड एटीनेटेड का पर्पस होता है कि पावर लेवल को कंट्रोल करें एटीनेट करें पावर लेवल को कंट्रोल अगर जब हम उसको मैक्सिमम जब मैंने इसको क्लाइस्ट्रॉन का सब कुछ सेट कर दिया मैंने लेंडा बाई फोर डिस्टेंस भी सेट कर दिया मैंने अच्छा लेंडा बाई फोर डिस्टेंस कैसे सेट होता है जब मैंने एक बार क्लाइस्ट्रॉन का बी वोल्टेज और लेवल वोल्टेज सेट कर दिया तो आप इसके जो क्लाइस्ट्रॉन मोड के उस नॉक को एडजस्ट कीजिए एडजस्ट कीजिए इस नॉक को यह मूवेबल नॉक है घूम सकता है इसको अगर आप इसको स्क्रू को घुमा रहे हैं तो इसका मतलब यह कि प्लंजर आगे पीछे हो रहा है ठीक है अगर आप क्लॉक वाइज घुमा रहे हैं तो आगे जा रहा है एंटी क्लॉक वाइज घुमा रहे हैं तो पीछे जा रहा है तो आप इसको इस वाले को घुमा करके और जब ये सेट हो जाए तो उस समय पर इसके पीछे एक और स्क्रू लगा हुआ है उस स्क्रू को ले जा करके इसको यहां पर अब ये नहीं
तो ये आपको और जब ये कैसे पता चला मेरे को कि सेट हो गया है क्योंकि मेरे इंडिकेटिंग मीटर में मैक्सिमम रीडिंग है ठीक है चलिए अब उसके बाद में चला जाए है ये है आपका एटीमीटर ये एटीमीटर के अंदर ये वैसे अरेंजमेंट है जैसा कि स्क्रू रेस के अंदर होता है और इस बॉक्स के अंदर एक इस तरीके के अरेंजमेंट होते हैं ये एक फैन टाइप अरेंजमेंट होता है जिसके साथ में स्प्रिंग जुड़ी हुई है जब मैं इसको घुमाता हूं तो इससे ये फैन टाइप अरेंजमेंट है जो इसके साथ में स्प्रिंग लगी हुई है तो स्प्रिंग एक्शन के कारण से ये फैन के जो फैन है वो इस बॉक्स के अंदर इस बॉक्स के अंदर ऊपर नीचे होता है यानी कि इसका मूवमेंट और जब मैं इसको घुमाते घुमाते इसको बिल्कुल घुमाते घुमाते ये फैन इस वेब बेल्ट के अंदर तक चला जाता है घुमाते घुमाते इसके अंदर एक स्लॉट होता है और उस स्लॉट के थ्रू ये वेब बेल्ट के फैन जो है वो उस वेब बेल्ट के अंदर चला जाता है इस फैन के ऊपर कुछ माइक्रोवेव एब्जॉर्बिंग मेटीरियल लगा होता है माइक्रोवेव एब्जॉर्बिंग मेटीरियल क्या करता है कि जब सिग्नल जब मैंने इसको फैन इसको घुमाते घुमाते मैं बिल्कुल इसके अंदर की तरफ ले गया तो उस समय सबसे ज्यादा सिग्नल को एब्जॉर्ब हो तो जो यहां से सिग्नल आ रहा है एक साइड से सिग्नल आ रहा है वो एब्जॉर्ब हो रहा है तो इस निश्चित रूप से इस तरफ मेरे को रिड्यूस सिग्नल तो पावर लेवल को कंट्रोल करने के लिए हम जिस कंपोनेंट को यूज करते हैं वो है हमारा एटीमेटर एटीमेटर का तीन तरीके के एटीमेटर होते हैं पहला एटीमेटर कहलाता है हमारा फिक्स जिसमें कि ये जैसे पंखा है उसके अंदर फिक्स होता है उसमें आप उसकी पोजीशन को चेंज नहीं करते ये एक टाइप अरेंजमेंट होता है जिस पर कि माइक्रोवेव एब्जॉर्बिंग मटेरियल लगा होता है और ये आप इसकी पोजीशन को हिला नहीं सकते ये फिक्स होता है तो इस तरीके के एटीमेटर को हम कहते हैं फिक्स एटीमेटर और इसकी पोजिशन को आप लेकर चेंज कर सकते जो एक बार कंपनी ने बना करके दे दिया मान लीजिए कह दिया कि 15 डीसी 15 डीबी का आपका एटीमेटर है या 20 डीबी का एटीमेटर है जो उन्होंने कह दिया बस अगर मेरे को उतना ही एटीमेशन अप्लाई करना है तो मैं इसको दूसरा होता है जिसमें कि यहां पर अरेंजमेंट होता है स्क्रू टाइप अरेंजमेंट जिसमें कि आप इसको आगे या पीछे मूव करा सकते तो वहां पर मेरे पास एक चॉइस होती है कि मैं अपने हिसाब से एटीमेशन को एडजस्ट कर वहां मेरे पास एक चॉइस होता है और तीसरा जो अरेंजमेंट है जो कि मैंने यूज वाला जो अरेंजमेंट है इसके अंदर फैन टाइम सेटअप होता है और उस फैन टाइम सेटअप में वो फैन वेब बैंक के अंदर जाता है बाहर जाता है और जब वो वेब बैंक के अंदर पूरी तरह से अंदर होता है तो एब्जॉर्बन मैक्सिमम होता है यानी कि एटीमेशन मैक्सिमम होता है और जब ये बॉक्स के ऊपर जब हम इसको ऊपर करते हैं ऊपर करने से स्प्रिंग एक्शन के कारण से ये फैन वापस इस बॉक्स के अंदर आ जाता है बॉक्स के अंदर आने के कारण से अब आपका एटीमेशन रिड्यूस हो गया या सीरो तो मैं अपने हिसाब से एटीमेशन को कंट्रोल कर सकता हूं और इस इस जो कंपोनेंट जो हमारा माइक्रोवेव कंपोनेंट है इसको हम देखते हैं एटीमेशन ठीक है इसके बाद में अगला जो कंपोनेंट है दैट इज अ फ्रीक्वेंसी मीटर अगला कंपोनेंट जो हमारा है वो है फ्रीक्वेंसी मीटर फ्रीक्वेंसी मीटर का पर्पज यह है कि हम पता करना चाहते हैं कि जो क्लाइस्ट्रॉन से हमको सिग्नल मिल रहा है वो उसकी फ्रीक्वेंसी है और फ्रीक्वेंसी मीटर हमारे पास में दो तरीके के होते हैं पहला फ्रीक्वेंसी मीटर होता है और उसके ऊपर यहां पर एक तरीके का बॉक्स टाइप अरेंजमेंट होता है 
और उसके ऊपर यहां पर एक टाइप है और इस बॉक्स टाइप के अंदर एक प्लेजर डाला होता है और यहां पर एक छोटा सा होल यहां एक छोटा सा होल होता है अब क्या होता है कि जब सिग्नल मेरा इस तरफ से आ रहा है इसको इसको हम कहते हैं वेरिएबल फ्रिक्वेंसी जब हमारा सिग्नल आ रहा है और इन दोनों के बीच का जो सेपरेशन है वो हम एडजस्ट कर सकते हैं तो जब हम इसको 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 प्लंजर को हम मूव करते हैं ऊपर नीचे चलते हैं तो एक स्थिति ऐसी आती है पहले तो हमने क्या किया कि ट्राइसॉन को सेट किया ट्राइसॉन को सेट करने के बाद में कैटेगेटर से अपना पावर लेवल अपने हिसाब से एडजस्ट कर लिया जितना मुझे एडजस्ट करना उतना कर लिया अब मैं फ्रिक्वेंसी मीटर को सेट के प्लंजर को सेट सेट करता जब मैं फ्रिक्वेंसी मीटर के प्लंजर को सेट करता हूं तो घुमाते घुमाते एक स्थिति ऐसी आती है जबकि इंडिकेटिंग मीटर में मेरा सिग्नल अचानक सडनली रिड्यूस हो इंडिकेटिंग मीटर में मान लीजिए पहले मेरा 100 यूनिट यूनिट आ रहा था हंड्रेड कैलोमीटर मान लीजिए मैंने उसको माइक्रोमीटर लगाया है माइक्रोमीटर लगाने पर मेरा मान लीजिए सपोज जो सिग्नल आ रहा था उससे हंड्रेड यूनिट आ रहा अब मैं इस फ्रिक्वेंसी मीटर की रीडिंग को सेट करता हूं फ्रिक्वेंसी रीडिंग मीटर की रीडिंग को सेट करते करते अचानक एक पर्टिकुलर प्लंजर पोजिशन पर मेरे उस इंडिकेटिंग मीटर की रीडिंग सडन ले घट करके सौ से घट करके पंद्रह रहते एकदम कम हो जाता इसका मतलब यह हुआ कि जो सिग्नल इधर जाना चाहिए था आगे जाना चाहिए था वो अभी अब नहीं जा रहा है जो सिग्नल मान लीजिए यहां से हंड्रेड आ रहा था और यहां पर मान लीजिए फिफ्टीन यूनिट आ रहा था सपोज फिफ्टीन यूनिट आके तो बचा हुआ एटी फाइव कहा गया वो फिफ्टी एटी फाइव यूनिट सिग्नल यहां पर ट्रैक हो जाता वो 85 फाइव यूनिट सिग्नल एक दो दो प्लेट जो जो हमारा प्लंजर है वह उस होल के थ्रू उसके अंदर एंटर करता है और उस होल के थ्रू एंटर करने के कारण से उन दोनों प्लेट्स के बीच में सिग्नल एंटर करता है वहां से रिफ्लेक्ट होता है वापस आता है सुपर इम्पोज होता है रिफ्लेक्ट होता है और अगर मैं मान लेता हूं कि मेरा मीडियम उस जो जो मेरा कहिए इसको हम कहते हैं कैविटी और इस कैविटी के अंदर मान लीजिए मैंने मीडियम को मैं लॉसलेस मान लेता हूँ प्लंजर को मान लेता हूं कि मैं लॉसलेस मेटीरियल का बना हुआ हूं तो ये जो सिग्नल मेरा दोनों फेड्स के बीच में रिफ्लेक्ट हो रहा है ये इनफाइनाइट हो लेकिन रियलिटी में कोई भी मीडियम लॉसलेस नहीं है कोई भी मेटीरियल परफेक्टली लॉसलेस नहीं तो ऐसी स्थिति में थोड़ी देर के बाद मेरे सिग्नल मेरा डिस्ट्रॉय खत्म हुआ लेकिन अगर मेरा लॉसलेस आइडियल कंडीशन मान के चलू तो इनफाइनाइट टाइप का टैप तो इस कंडीशन को मैं यहां कहता हूं इस माइक्रोवेव मेजरमेंट के समय किस कंडीशन को हम कहते हैं कि नाउ दिस इज रेजोनेंस रेजोनेंस कंडीशन क्या है अंडर रेजोनेंस कंडीशन मैक्सिमम अमाउंट ऑफ सिग्नल विल बी ट्रैक्ट इन साइड द कैविटी एंड वेरी स्मॉल अमाउंट ऑफ सिग्नल विल मूव फ्रॉम द फॉरवर्ड तो यहां पर जो एटी फाइव मिनट जो सिग्नल ट्रैप हो गया है उसी को मैं कह रहा हूं कि नाउ दिस इज द रेजोनेंस ये कैविटी और उस कैविटी के अंदर सिग्नल मेरा ट्रैप है अब जब ये सिग्नल मेरा ट्रैप हो गया है तो मेरे पास में वेवलेंथ पता चल गई वेवलेंथ पता चल गई क्योंकि मेरे पास में प्लंजर और एंड के बीच की सेपरेशन मुझे पता है क्योंकि उसके ऊपर जो मेरा माइक्रोमीटर है वो तो मेरा स्क्रू बेस की तरीके से रीडिंग दे रहा है मेरे को स्क्रू बेस की रीडिंग जाती है मेरे स्केल प्लस जो हमारा स्क्रू बेस का जो सर्कुलर स्केल होता है मल्टी टाइम मैं लिस्ट हूँ मुझे पता चल जाता है दोनों बीच के बीच में कितनी दूरी तो इस स्थिति में तो तो ये दूरी पता चल गई कि इसका मतलब ये हुआ कि मेरे को लेमडा बाई टू पता चल गया जब मेरे को लेमडा बाई टू पता चल गया तो मैं फ्रिक्वेंसी निकाल सकता हूं एक डायरेक्ट मैथड है लेकिन दूसरे तरीके का जो फ्रिक्वेंसी मीटर होता है उसको हम कहते हैं डायरेक्ट रीडिंग फ्रिक्वेंसी दिस इज डायरेक्ट रीडिंग फ्रिक्वेंसी इस फ्रिक्वेंसी मीटर के अंदर आपके जो ये वाला जो पार्ट है ये मूवेबल होता है इसको आप रोटेट कर सकते हैं और इस गूगल बुक पार्ट के अंदर ये एक पता नहीं किसके अंदर 
आपको दिखाई दे रही है या नहीं दिखाई दे रही है लाल रंग की वर्टिकल लाइन दिखाई दे रही है लाल रंग की एक वर्टिकल लाइन है और एक इसी तरीके से हॉरिजॉन्टल लाइन है जो कि मेरे इसके अंदर जहां पर ये दिखाई दे रही है तो दो पट्टी सी आती है और उसके साथ में एक वर्टिकल लाइन है तो मैं इसको जब घुमाता हूं तो ये जो जो हॉरिजॉन्टल लाइन है देखिए ये ऊपर नीचे की तरफ जा रही है और ये हॉरिजॉन्टल लाइन और ये वर्टिकल लाइन एक दूसरे को आपस में कहां काट रही है वही फ्रीक्वेंसी मैं इसको एडजस्ट करता हूं इसके अंदर कैविटी है और कैविटी होने के कारण से जब सिग्नल इधर से एंटर कर रहा है और एक पर्टिकुलर इसके अंदर है सब कुछ वही बस अंतर यह है कि इसमें आपको मैन्युअली कैलकुलेट नहीं करना है फ्रीक्वेंसी को ये मीटर खुद ही आपको फ्रीक्वेंसी की वैल्यू देता है तो है कुछ सब कुछ वही तो प्लेट और जो कुछ सेपरेशन जो हो रहा है वो वेरी कर रहा है तो यहां पर आपका जब आपका वेरी कर रहा है तो कुछ स्थिति के अंदर आपका जब ये कैविटी का साइज चेंज हो रहा है और एक पर्टिकुलर जब ये रीडिंग हमको पता जब हमको इंडिकेटिंग मीडियम में जब सडनली हमको मीडियम में मिलता है उस समय हम हॉरिजॉन्टल और वर्टिकल लाइन की जो बीच की जो पोजीशन है जो वर्टिकल लाइन के नीचे ठीक नीचे जो वैल्यू है उसको रीड करते हैं एट दैट इज फ्रीक्वेंसी बात समझ में आई हॉरिजॉन्टल लाइन और वर्टिकल लाइन जहां पर एक दूसरे को काटती है उस वैल्यू को हम नोट करते हैं आपको कैलकुलेट करने की जरूरत नहीं है इसमें आपका डायरेक्टली आपको फ्रीक्वेंसी की वैल्यू पता चलता है इसके बीच में हम कई बार एक और कंपोनेंट लगाते हैं जिसको हम कहते हैं आइसोलेट आइसोलेटर ये कंपोनेंट है आइसोलेटर ये एक फेराइट आइसोलेटर इसमें फेराइट मेटीरियल लगा हुआ है और इस आइसोलेटर की खासियत यह होती है कि ये सिग्नल को सिर्फ एक ही डायरेक्शन में परमिट करता है जिसको कि कंपनी वाले एक एरो लगा करके बेचते हैं लगा लिया फिट किया है इसमें एक एरो लगा होता है जो कि ये बताता है कि सिग्नल एक ही डायरेक्शन में रहेगा अगर आप इसको सिग्नल को इस तरफ से अगर एरो इस तरफ लगा हुआ बना हुआ मान लीजिए तो सिग्नल आपका इसी साइड में रहेगा अगर आप इधर से भेजेंगे तो यहां पर आपको जीरो सिग्नल मिलेगा एरो की डायरेक्शन में तो इसका पर्पज क्या होता है कि हम ये चाहते हैं कि बहुत हमने सावधानी बढ़ दी और हमने सारे कंपोनेंट्स को सही तरीके से जोड़ा उनमें कहीं किसी तरह की स्टैटिंग नहीं होगी लेकिन फिर भी कहीं पे हो गई और कहीं पे हो गई उसके कारण से क्या कुछ सिग्नल मेरा रिफ्लेक्ट होकर रिफ्लेक्ट हो रहा है वो मेरा सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट होकर क्लाइस्ट्रॉन तक ना पहुंचे और क्लाइस्ट्रॉन ट्यूब को खराब ना करे तो इसके लिए जरूरी है कि आइसोलेटर आइसोलेटर क्या कहता है सिग्नल मान लीजिए इधर गया अगर मान लीजिए आप किसी भी तरह की डिसकंटिन्यूटी बन रही है सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट भी हो रहा है तो यहाँ पे आएगा लेकिन वो किधर नहीं जाएगा क्लाइस्ट्रॉम तक नहीं जाने देते तो अगर आप चाहते हैं कि आपका क्लाइस्ट्रॉम सेफ रहे तो बीच में एक आइसोलेटर पर एड कर देते हैं आइसोलेटर का मतलब ये होता है कि वो अपने सिग्नल को सिर्फ एक ही डायरेक्शन में परमिट करता है दूसरी डायरेक्शन रिवर्स डायरेक्शन में परमिट नहीं करता है इसमें एक फेराइट मेटीरियल लगा होता है और इसको भी आप आइसोलेटर को आप अपने थ्योरी के अंदर पढ़ते हैं मेरे ख्याल से तभी फिर आगे आगे दोबारा वर्कशॉप हमने इस तरह की मैडम तो वहां पे थोड़ा सा कंपोनेंट्स जब और उसके बारे में देखेंगे तब हो सकता है फेराइट वगैरह जब आप होगी क्योंकि हमारे दो दिन के प्रेजेंटेशन में फेराइट में हमारा कोई लेक्चर किसी का भी नहीं करता ठीक है अब उस फ्रीक्वेंसी मीटर के बाद में जो अगर मान लीजिए मैं चाहता हूं कि क्लाइस्ट्रॉन की कैरेक्टरिस्टिक को समझना तो कुछ स्थिति में डिटेक्टर यहां पर एक डिटेक्टर लगाते हैं और डिटेक्टर के साथ हम कनेक्ट करते हैं अपने जो हमारा इंडिकेटिंग मीटर होता है डिटेक्टर को डिटेक्टर हम यहां पर लगाते हैं डिटेक्टर के अंदर क्या होता है कि इस 
इसके अंदर के पॉइंट कॉन्टेक्ट आयो और जब हम एक्सप्लेन में काम कर रहे हैं तो उस समय ध्यान रखना है कि उसका नंबर वन एंड ट्वेंटी थ्री वन एंड ट्वेंटी फाइव इसी नंबर के डायोड हमारे इसके अंदर काम तो यहां पर हमारे पास में अब क्या है कि पॉइंट पॉइंट कॉन्टेक्ट डायोड होते हैं इस तरह की डिवाइस होती है जो कि इस डिटेक्टर के अंदर फिट है अब ये नाम से मुझे पता चल रहा है कि ये डायोड है अब मैंने सवाल पहला सवाल मेरा ये है कि मुझे यहां पे डायोड लगाने की जरूरत क्या पड़ी मुझको तो यहां डायोड लगाने की जरूरत क्या पड़ी मेरा जो इंडिकेटिंग मीटर है वो नॉर्मली एक डीसी मीटर एक डीसी मीटर है डीसी मीटर है नॉर्मली हम लैब के अंदर आप जब लैब में जाके देखेंगे तो वहां पर एक माइक्रोमीटर लगा हुआ तो वहां पर डीसी मीटर लगा हुआ तो अब सवाल यह है कि मेरे को यहां पर एक डायोड लगाने की जरूरत क्या पड़ी क्यों लगाया मैंने यहां पर डायोड कोई सोच के बताए माइक्रोवेव क्या है हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी एसी फ्री माइक्रोवेव है हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी एसी फ्री और जो मेरा डिटेक्टर है डिटेक्टिंग मीटर है वो क्या है डीसी डिटेक्टर है तो मेरे लिए क्या जरूरी है कि मैं उस एसी को डीसी में कन्वर्ट करूं और एसी को डीसी में कन्वर्ट कौन करता है तो इसलिए मैं यहां पर एक पॉइंट कॉन्टेक्ट आयो लेता हूं यह भी सेमी कंडक्टर सेमी कंडक्टर मेटल जंक्शन होता है एक मेटल के ऊपर सेमी कंडक्टर सेमी कंडक्टर जंक्शन होता है और इसका जो आईडी कर्म होता है वो कुछ इस तरीके का इस हिस्से के अंदर इस हिस्से के अंदर आई के तो भी नहीं बहुत स्लो नहीं लग रहा इस एक सर्टेन रीजन के अंदर हम ये देखते हैं कि आई इज प्रपोर्शनल टू बी पर हमारी रिचर्सन इक्वेशन है आई जीरो टू आई जीरो इन टू पावर टू बी अपॉन के टी माइनस वन उसके अंदर मैं बी की वैल्यू को बी को साइनस टोटल वैल्यू रखते हैं तो उसको सिंप्लीफाई करता हूं तो मेरे पास में एक जब मैं हायर ऑर्डर टर्म को नेग्लेक्ट कर देता हूं तो मेरे पास में जो जो एक्सप्रेशन आता है वाई आई इज प्रपोर्शन आई प्रपोर्शन टू बी स्क्वायर और चूंकि इसमें रिलेशन बहुत स्लो नहीं आ रहा है आई नॉट प्रपोर्शन टू बी आई प्रपोर्शन टू बी स्क्वायर इसलिए इस डायोड में एक नाम और देते हैं और इसको कहते हैं स्क्वायर नॉट डिटेक्टर इसलिए इसमें एक नाम और देते हैं इसको कहते हैं स्क्वायर नॉट डिटेक्टर एक नाम क्या था पॉइंट वन टेक्ट दूसरा नाम इसका क्या हुआ इसको कहते हैं क्योंकि इसके अंदर एक पर्टिकुलर वोल्टेज जब तक हम अप्लाई करते हैं तब तक और यही वो वोल्टेज होता है जो कि हमको रिक्वायर्ड होता है अगर मैं हायर ऑर्डर टर्म्स को नेग्लेक्ट नहीं करूं हायर ऑर्डर टर्म्स के अंदर मेरी साइनोसोटल वैल्यू आती है आप अगर इस एक्सप्रेशन को सिंप्लीफाई करके देखेंगे तो एक जब लोअर वोल्टेज वोल्टेज के अंदर लोअर वैल्यू को अप्लाई कर रहे हैं तो उस स्थिति के अंदर कोई साइनोसोटल वैल्यू नहीं आती यानी कि उसके अंदर सिंपली बी आता है बी साइनोमेटिटी या बी कॉन्सोमेटिटी नहीं आता मुझे वोल्टेज इतना ही अप्लाई करना है 
कि मेरे पास में डिटेक्टर पर सिर्फ डीसी सिग्नल मेरे आउटपुट मीटर के अंदर सिर्फ डीसी सिग्नल सिग्नल तो डीसी पहुंचेगा उसे डायोड रेक्टिफाई करेगा रेक्टिफाई करने के बाद आउटपुट जो देगा क्योंकि मेरे पास डीसी मीटर अगर मेरे पास में अगर मिक्सचर आएगा एसी और गुड डीसी का तो मैं नीडल इस तरीके से भागे भी आगे पीछे भागे मैं कुछ भी नहीं कर सकता तो मेरे लिए जरूरी क्योंकि मेरा मीटर डिटेक्टिंग मीटर जो है वो डीसी मीटर है इसलिए मेरे पास में सिग्नल को रेक्टिफाई करने के लिए जरूरी है कि मेरे पास में पावर लेवल बहुत ज्यादा नहीं हो ताकि आई दिस प्रपोर्शनल टू बी स्क्वायर वाली टर्म भी आए आगे की साइड से कर टर्म भी आए और इसलिए इस डायोड का दूसरा नाम जो हम कंसिडर करते हैं पहला नाम था हमारा पॉइंट पॉइंट डायोड और दूसरा नाम था हमारा स्क्वायर लॉ और इसीलिए हम अपने सेटअप के अंदर एटीनेटर का अप्लाई करते हैं एटीनेटर को अप्लाई करने का रीजन ये है कि हम पावर लेवल को बहुत ज्यादा अप्लाई नहीं करने देते क्योंकि तो हमारी रिक्वायरमेंट है कि बहुत ज्यादा सिग्नल हमारा डायोड पर ना पहुंचे ताकि वो रेक्टिफाई होने के बाद मेरे मीटर को ना खराब कर दे मेरे हायर ऑर्डर नॉलेज ना आ जाए तो इसलिए जरूरी है कि हम अपने सिग्नल को लिमिट के अंदर रखें और वोल्टेज को हम जो अप्लाई करते हैं हमारा सिग्नल चाहे पावर लेवल है वो हमारा बहुत हाई नहीं हो और इसीलिए हम अपने सेटअप के अंदर एक अप्लाई करते हैं हम एटीनेटर ठीक है तो मेरे पास में दूसरा इसका एक दूसरा नाम आया इसका स्क्वायर लॉट डिटेक्टर अब अब हमारा क्या काम है कि हमारे पास में जो सिग्नल आ रहा था यहां से एक पर्टिकुलर लेवल का सिग्नल आया उसको अपने हिसाब से मैंने सेट किया एटीनेटर ने इससे मैंने फ्रिक्वेंसी पता की पर इस सिग्नल इसको सिग्नल को रेक्टिफाई किया और रेक्टिफाई करने के बाद मैंने मीटर पे अपना आउटपुट दे ये मेरे आउटपुट ठीक है कोई दिक्कत कोई दिक्कत नहीं है चलिए बस छोटा सा टाइम बचा मेरे पास और छोटे से टाइम पेपर एक कंपोनेंट और मैं यहां पर कंसिडर करता हूं और वो है मेरा एक एक कंपोनेंट और कर लो अब हॉर्न एंटी ना मैं देखिए यहां पर ये तो वैसे ही है एक है। लेकिन यहां पर आने के बाद में इसको चौड़ा कर दिया गया इसको चौड़ा कर दिया गया है इसको कहते हैं हम इस तरीके से आगे से चौड़े करने का जो कहते हैं वो कहते हैं फ्लेयरिंग हमने इसको फ्लेयरिंग कर दिया फैला दिया ये फ्लेयरिंग हम अपनी मनमर्जी से नहीं करते इस फ्लेयरिंग को करने के लिए हमको पूरी मैथमेटिक्स पूरी फिक्सिजन पूरी एक्यूरेसी की जरूरत है कारण क्या है कि हमने आपको बताया था कि अगर मेरे पास में ये जो सिग्नल आ रहा है और ये वेबलाइट मेरी ओपन है सिग्नल मेरा आ रहा है वेबलाइट मेरी ओपन है तो सिग्नल मेरा रिफ्लेक्ट हो जाए सिग्नल मेरा रिफ्लेक्ट हो जाए और सिग्नल अगर मेरा सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट हो जाए और सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट हो जाएगा तो उस स्थिति में क्या होगा कि मेरा हॉट एंटीना का काम पर सर ने पाल साहब ने खूब सारे एंटीना के बारे में बताया और वो एंटीना तभी काम करेंगे जबकि सिग्नल मेरा फॉरवर्ड डायरेक्शन के अंदर जाता है लेकिन मैंने आपसे कहा कि जैसे मैं इसको ओपन करता हूं तो यह सिग्नल मेरा रिफ्लेक्ट हो जाएगा और स्टैंडिंग वेट सोरी तो ऐसी जो ध्यान का हो रहा था मैंने आपसे कहा था कि सपोज इसका बाउंड मीडियम का जो प्रिपेगल से वन ट्वेंटी फाइव है ताकि सिग्नल जैसे ही वो इस किनारे पर पहुंचे सिग्नल को जहां पे जहां पे वन ट्वेंटी फाइव हो जाए उसके आगे भी वन ट्वेंटी फाइव हो जाए आगे फ्री स्पेस है फ्री स्पेस का इंपीडेंस 125 होता है तो सिग्नल अगर यहां पे पहुंच रहा है तो जो फेस करेगा वो कितना इंपीडेंस फेस करे 125 और इस 125 करने के लिए हम इसको क्लियर ये फेयर क्यों की है क्योंकि हम चाहते हैं कि कोई भी सिग्नल जो कि वेव बैंड के अंदर एंटर किया है जिसको हम रेडिएट कराना चाहते हैं वो परफेक्टली रेडिएट हो और परफेक्टली रेडिएट होने के लिए जरूरी है कि परफेक्ट इंपीडेंस मैचिंग होनी चाहिए इंपीडेंस मैचिंग होनी चाहिए यानी वन ट्वेंटी फाइव अगर जहां पर इंपीडेंस है तो स्पेस फ्री स्पेस का इंपीडेंस भी मेरा वन ट्वेंटी फाइव है इसलिए अगर ये कंडीशन मेरी मीट करती है तो मेरा कोई भी सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट नहीं होगा सारा का सारा सिग्नल
और ये है मेरा इस तरीके के इससे सबको बनाने का बहुत प्रिसीजन है मेरे को प्रिसीजन इसलिए इतना ज्यादा करना पड़ता है क्योंकि तो इंपीडेंस अगर यहाँ पे एक सौ उन्नीस पाई भी हो गया तो भी मेरा सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट हो गया सौ पाई भी हो गया तो भी सिग्नल रिफ्लेक्ट हो मेरे को एक्यूरेटली वन ट्वेंटी पाई चाहिए ताकि मेरे प्री स्टेज की इंपीडेंस के साथ में एक इंपीडेंस मैचिंग हो सके और इंपीडेंस मैचिंग की कंडीशन में सिग्नल बिना किसी रिफ्लेक्शन के क्योंकि मैंने कहा दिस कंटिन्यूटी नहीं बने अगर एवरी डिसकंटिन्यूटी विल बिकम अ सोर्स ऑफ रिफ्लेक्शन तो अगर यहां पर कोई भी डिसकंटिन्यूटी बनी तो मेरा सिग्नल वापस रिफ्लेक्ट हो जो कि मैं नहीं चाहता तो इसलिए मेरे को एक बहुत प्रिसाइसली इसको डिजाइन करना पड़ता है और इस प्रिसाइस डिजाइन के बाद में हम एक इस तरीके का एंटीना बनाते हैं और इस एंटीना को कहते हैं ऑड एच ओ आर एन ऑड एन ठीक है तो आज आपके साथ में कुछ बेसिक कंपोनेंट के बारे में बात की कोई एडवांस कंपोनेंट आपसे बात नहीं करी है और फिर कभी मौका मिलेगा तो आपके साथ में कुछ अवश्य थैंक यू Thank you. 
Uh, thank you for the good nice morning, introduction. Good morning, Dr. Parul. This is Usha Bhatia. Very good. Welcome. Uh, very Welcome good morning, workshop. Professor. And thank you so much for sparing your valuable time. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Continue. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a very good afternoon to uh, Dr. Seema Agarwal, uh, Dr. Rusha Bhatia, uh, Dr. Sushmita, who has been interacting. Uh, uh, I saw that you had uh, uh, Dr. Deepak Bhatnagar with you. And Dr. Surendra Pal, right now I was just uh, listening that the way uh, details were explained to the participants, it was really heartening to see that, yes, on, you know, uh, typically with that uh, faculty touch, it is there. I have my, uh, today I'm able to connect to you only through online. So I'll just uh, share my uh, PPT here and we'll, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take you through this entire micro remote sensing you know, the uh, fundamental interactions which are happening. And uh, then how do we go about uh, applying these uh, microwave uh, remote sensing to various applications? So that I'll just uh, uh, take you. OK. Uh, is my screen visible to you? Can, can, uh, can you kindly confirm? Hello? Can somebody confirm Mommy, if my screen yes, is visible? You are audible. We can okay. hear you. And the screen is now seen? No, ma'am. The presenting screen is not visible yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, I did say uh, share your entire screen. Okay. Now, is it seen? Hello? Professor Bhatia? Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Now. visible. It's visible. Okay. Fine. Fine. So uh, it is in full uh, screen mode right now. Is uh, I can start, uh, Professor Bhatia. Hello. Yes, ma'am. I can start now. Yes. You yes, can see the screen, full screen. You can see. Yes, ma'am. It is clearly visible. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, we'll uh, take you to this. Uh, 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 describing as I said, I'll just uh, tell about the fundamentals and the applications of micro remote sensing. As you are aware, uh, this electromagnetic spectrum, in fact, from the uh, beginning, uh, from today, in the, from morning, you are uh, discussing about the micro components and this entire, uh, your workshop is on micro experiments. So uh, that's how this, uh, you know, the remote sensing is one part of uh, entire micro, uh, this electromagnetic uh, spectrum, uh, where you know you uh, have gamma rays, X rays, ultraviolet, then uh, you are visible uh, what we are able to see with the human eyes, and, and then you go to uh, infrared and then micro region. So uh, the typically the micro region, uh, the bands which are used in uh, micro remote sensing, you are having P band, L band. Uh, so P band is a longer wavelength, so 30 to 100 centimeter. Uh, wavelength is uh, there for p-band l-band you are having one to two gigahertz 15 to 30 centimeter range and then you have a c k, uh, x k u k and k band so these are the ones uh, which are utilized in uh, microwave uh, remote sensing uh, these are the different uh, bands and now so what is this micro remote sensing so you use this electromagnetic uh, spectrum in the micro portion and then you eliminate an object or uh, observe uh, the signature uh, signals which are emitting in this micro region and then you uh, uh, sense it you record it and then you infer about the target so that's the entire micro remote sensing we see so for understanding this uh, the concept of polarization i'm sure it's pretty clear to all of you because you're all uh, uh, coming to this, but still I'll just touch upon that various kinds of polarizations uh, which are there because this polarization is very important when we talk about 
uh, microwave remote sensing because the way uh, the object is illuminated with the, the polarization in which it is illuminated, uh, the signatures that you get back, the signal that is returned to you is uh, affected by the target property. So that's why polarization is very important. So you will have either horizontal polarization, vertical polarization, or you could have a linear 45 degree polarization. Okay. Or minus 45, you can have left circular, right circular, elliptical also, left or right. In, and not just 45 degree, it could be at any degree. So in fact, if you take elliptical uh, minus uh, plus 45, and if you, you know, ellipticity, you make zero, then and uh, your angle, uh, if it is 45, then it will come to a linear. And if you take, say, circular also, and if you make this uh, 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 zero uh, ellipticity, so then you will come to a linear uh, horizontal polarization. So your signal is, uh, you can see electromagnetic uh, spectrum. I have, I've just shown a signal, the electromagnetic wave. And when it is uh, transmitting, the way you will observe it from the uh, uh, opposite side, that will indicate the type of polarization it is. So here, typically, it is, it, as we can see, that it's an elliptical uh, polarized uh, signal which is uh, transmitted. So uh, uh, in this linear uh, remote sensing, when you go in polar polarimetry, what you have to have is you'll, you'll be transmitting one signal, uh, micro signal, and then you'll be receiving it back. So if you transmit in linear, say you transmit in H and V, okay, and you are receiving in H and V both. So you will get a four combinations. You'll get HH, HV, VV, and VH. So that will become a full polarimetric mode, or linear. And if you have a circular transmit, so if you transmit in right circular and uh, left circular both, and then you receive in right and left. So you'll have combination of right transmit, right receive, right transmit, left uh, uh, receive, left uh, transmit and right receive and left and left. So you'll have four combinations. So that will also give with its intensity and phase. You should have both the component so that uh, the how the phases are correlated between these four polarization combinations will make it fully polarimetric and you'll be able to get the information about the target very accurately from this because the entire scattering matrix will be available to you. Okay. Uh, um, now, if you see uh, this hybrid polarimetry, what we do is you transmit in linear, okay, either 45 degree and you receive in H and V. So you'll get a 45 degree transmit and for uh, a horizontal receive, 45 degree transmit and vertical receive. So that will also give a little bit uh, of information, so hybrid polarimetric, you can say, so you'll be able to uh, re retrieve certain information about the scattering matrix. Similarly, what we had for the first time in the entire world through this our RI Zetro is transmit and in circular polarization and receive in horizontal and vertical both. So you have circular transmit, H receive, circular transmit, V receive. So Stokes parameters, you'll be able to retrieve from this and to uh, like you'll be able to see the uh, kind of scattering uh, interaction that is happening so whether it is a volumetric scattering or, or it's a uh, your uh, double bounce or a, a single bounce uh, scattering uh, mechanism that is there that information you are able to extract from this hybrid polarimetric mode so that also gives a lot of information about the target so that we'll just uh, see so once this polarization is clear, now let's see why do we need this micro remote sensing. See, optical uh, remote sensing, a lot of images we see, right, with clouds and uh, with uh, all the, uh, in Google also, you know, nowadays you are able to see a lot of clear images. Then why do we go for micro remote sensing? One thing, like, as you are very uh, much aware, like for, say, cloud conditions, you op use your optical, you are able to see the clouds. Correct. But that also means that you do not, uh, if the satellite is above the clouds, you cannot see the earth be beneath. So for all weather capabilities, so whether it is a cloudy conditions, it is a rainy uh, situation, it is there or clouds are there, you are able to 
monitor your earth observ uh, earth so that's why this all weather capability is the major advantage of our micro remote sensing uh, uh, it, as it can penetrate through clouds okay and you are able to see the uh, target uninterrupted okay so uh, you don't need uh, day and night for active a uh, lot of uh, micro remote sensing falls under active uh, region say radar spectrometer will come to that uh, so uh, you don't require uh, the sunlight per se and the for passive also you are looking at you are trying to understand the uh, emitted uh, micro signal so you won't require uh, practically you know it should be illuminated by sun so it is whether it has to be done in day it's not important you can do it any time of the day uh, it has a very unique sensitivity to the dielectric constant because uh, the, uh, the target's dielectric uh, um, uh, the, uh, constant will determine the kind of scattering that will happen uh, with the, how uh, the microwaves are aligned with this uh, dipole moment. You know, there's a dipole moment that generates due to the uh, dielectric uh, presence in the earth material. So that determines how much energy is re-radiated. So you are able to get that information. It's a very unique uh, feature which you do not have with your optical remote sensing uh, uh, sensors. So, uh, so it is able to penetrate, uh, even in within soil also it is able to penetrate. So you can get profile soil moisture, you can get moisture uh, contained of the soil beneath the surface and uh, to vegetation also. So you are able to find information underneath the vegetation uh, canopy also. Uh, it has, uh, if the orientation is there, that orientation also you can pick up very well. So uh, that unique sensitivity is there. The structure of the target. So for all your settlement kind of or urban uh, features also, it is very, very useful. So the structure of the target and the surface roughness. So these are the one which you know uh, uh, we are able to exploit for extracting the information about the target once uh, we go into this arena of this micro remote sensing. So let's see. What is micro remote sensing? Uh, uh, the branches uh, in which the micro remote sensing are there. You have active micro re re remote sensing and passive. The active sensors could be non imaging, like scatterometers, altimeters, or you can have imaging, serial aperture or synthetic aperture radar. Um, and uh, passive micro remote sensing uh, sensors like radiometers. So let's have a look at uh, the factors which are affecting this overall the target as well as the sensor parameters both are important that which are the sensor parameters so what wavelength you are looking at the object that uh, the band you know the micro remote sensing band whether you are looking at p band l band or c band s band x band that will determine that how the backscatter or the re radiation will be observed from the target so and uh, the incidence angle at which you are observing. Suppose you are observing Nadir, you know, then you are able to get uh, the information underneath the vegetation. Suppose there is a typical agricultural terrain and you are looking Nadir, so you are able to go uh, and look at beneath the uh, agriculture, this thing. And if you have a very slant kind of uh, uh, incidence angle, say you are looking at, say, 45 degree or 50 degree, then most of your energy will be interacting with the, the micro signal, will be interacting with the crop which is there. And uh, it will give you information about the crop. Okay. Then polarization, I said, uh, if you have a vertical polarization, like most of the earth uh, targets, you can assume as uh, dipole, uh, you know. So if you have, say, for example, uh, a wheat uh, plant, you know, typically it's a, uh, um, a vertically oriented dipole, you can assume. And if you have a vertical polarization, maximum interaction will be there with this wheat plant and you'll be able to get the information. But if you have a horizontal polarization, probably you are not able to get much information about the crop. Uh, so that's where, or banana plantation, maybe if, uh, you know, with the leaf structure, which is there, which is horizontal. So uh, if you have a horizontal polarization, most of the energy will come and you will get a lot of information about the banana plantation. And you may not uh, get if you have a vertical polarization there. So the polarization also 
uh, tells you how uh, the polarization returns will tell you about the target which is observed whether like if you observe something which is bright in say your horizontal and uh, less bright or less uh, scattering uh, less signal is returned from vertical you can say that yes this target is probably horizontally oriented like that so that way the polarization is also very important similarly the target parameters so if you have something which is uh, the the there is a say soil uh, so soil moisture as you are aware uh, as the soil moisture increases uh, i have tried to show you here also if you soil increases then your dielectric constant increases okay the real part of the dielectric constant increases. I've just tried to show for different soil types. You can see that the, as the soil moisture is increasing, your uh, real and imaginary, both uh, uh, component of your dielectric is increasing. And this increase in dielectric increases the dipole moment of when it is coming in, when uh, it is illuminated with micro signal. There is a dipole moment which is generated, and so the higher the uh, the uh, dielectric, higher uh, higher the moisture, higher the dielectric, and higher will be the di dipole moment. So high, uh, uh, but uh, higher the signal uh, that will you will receive from the soil. So and if it is a dry, maybe it you will be able to uh, it will be just go through the soil and you will not you'll get very little return in your. Uh, return signal. Similarly, the surface roughness. Now, if you have a smooth surface, then when you my, uh, the signal is illuminated onto the I just uh, hello. I'll uh, call you later. Will that be fine? I'm in a uh, talk right now. Okay. Yeah. Can you please call me? Yeah. No problem. I'll call you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So, uh, the surface roughness, if it's a smooth surface, whatever signal that comes uh, to uh, the surface, it is going in the back, that uh, opposite direction. And uh, typically, your SAR uh, sensor, it's transmit and receive is at the same direction. Your satellite is moving, so it is in the same direction. So, what is happening is that no signal gets returned to the target so you uh, get this such smooth targets say typically water surfaces uh, smooth water surfaces you will not get any return back towards the surface so these these features will appear dark in your image whereas if you have certain roughness onto the, your surface then you will be able to get some diffuse component there will be a coherent component which will go but due to the diffuse uh, scattering that will happen some signal will come back to the uh, target. And if it is very rough, then you will have Lambertian kind of surface and you will get a lot of signal that will return in each direction. It will be, uh, you know, the signal will be uh, scattered and you will get a uh, good amount of signal back towards your antenna. So this up surface will appear brighter as compared to this surface. And this will, of course, not get any signal back towards your so, so surface roughness is very important. So if you get dark feature, probably the target is a smooth surface. Okay. And if you have a very rough uh, kind of uh, like brighter signal, you can assume that, yes, the target is a rough uh, target that you're observing. Fine. Uh, then vegetation canopy itself, uh, the geometry as well as the dielectric. See, if it's a dry uh, vegetation, there'll be less dielectric. So you'll not get much return. Uh, towards your uh, uh, surface, uh, towards your uh, sensor. But if it is a very uh, uh, like bright green, uh, healthy, uh, where the vegetation uh, motor, uh, vegetation moisture content is high, so the electric will be high of that target uh, of that vegetation. So you will get more return. Similarly, the frequency, you know, where you are, if it is X band, it will be able to penetrate only to the surface, uh, maybe just the leaf. If it is C band, it will be able to go to the twigs maybe. L band will be able to penetrate up to the trunk and it will be able to get you information about the trunk. And P band, uh, longer wavelength, much longer wavelength. Typically, if the thumb rule is the wavelength that you have, 
that's the penetration. See, I have shown you the wavelength, right? So if you see your L band, 15 to 30 centimeter kind of uh, penetration will be there. If you have X band, say 2.4 to 3.8 centimeters, so it will just be, uh, you know, interacting with your leaves. But C band, so typically five to six centimeter is used. So if you look at this uh, 3.8 to 7.5, so that will be able to go up to the twigs level. So that's how your P band is able to go deeper, much deeper, up to a meter kind of uh, uh, this thing. Uh, it will be able to uh, go even underneath uh, vegetation. So that's what is the sense. Uh, these are the factors. Now radiometer typically, you know, it uh, scans uh, along track and gets the information. So the parameters that uh, it is sensitive to is cloud liquid water, vegetation biomass, surface roughness, soil moisture. So if, if there is a frequency dependence, so if you have a multi-frequency uh, radiometer, then you are able to extract these information very accurately. And that's to be exploited in passive micro remote sensing. I'll just show you one example of your uh, satellite micro. We started as early as 79, 80 time frame with Vaskara 1 and 2, where we have this Samir, uh, our micro radiometer was there, where we had uh, horizontal and vertical, and the frequencies uh, which were used were from 19 to 22. And, and for uh, Vaskara 2 also, we had 31 also uh, was included. So uh, we could study hydrology, forestry, and geology, ocean surface study. And then we collected this data on meteorological data from this uh, remote. That was our initial platforms which were there. And some X-ray astronomy studies were also done. So uh, this is our MSMR over I, uh, Ocean Set 1, IRS V4. So you had four different frequencies, as I said, that different frequencies gives you different sensitivity to uh, targets, so target property. So for sea surface temperature, we had 6.6 .6 gigahertz. Wind speed, we had 10.65 gigahertz, precipitation, 18 uh, gigahertz, and cloud liquid water, 21 gigahertz. So this is uh, how uh, you know it was sensitive. I'll just show some data product, which is from our, uh, this uh, radiometers. So you can have sea surface temperatures, you can have wind speed, and uh, wind vector, in fact, uh, you can find out, and uh, water vapor uh, and cloud liquid water. So these are very important parameters for our meteorological studies. And so uh, with this geophysical uh, parameters that can be retrieved, uh, we'll be able to get uh, uh, very accurately. Now here, I'm just trying to show your uh, soil moisture, which is uh, retrieved. This is recent, uh, our SMAP uh, soil moisture, this had a radiometer as well as it was planned to have a, a, a active as well as passive, you know, uh, soil moisture active as well as passive uh, mission was planned. But however, only the radiometer uh, function for it is an albend. So you can see the soil moisture that one can uh, retrieve. Uh, I, I've just shown, uh, I, when I have tried to show that, okay, uh, as uh, you go towards July month, you can see that moisture is increasing due to the rains uh, all across uh, the country. So you are able, this is able to pick up this information very accurately when it it is going uh, from uh, you know dry uh, season to your wet season. So this, but it's a coarser uh, resolution you have to go. Uh, so in fact, you can almost see that uh, the moisture variation as the monsoon progresses. Okay, so this is the information. Uh, this uh, was there. So at a nine kilometer by nine kilometer. Uh, one can get this information uh, from uh, this one uh, pixel is uh, 9 kilometer by 9 kilometer. And these data is available on our Vedas website, which is uh, developed uh, at a specific specification center. So if you type VEDAS, uh, SAC uh, Vedas, then you'll be able to get these uh, data products uh, for your study. Sea uh, surface salinity is also uh, you are able to observe using passive uh, radiometer. So uh, uh, passive uh, micro remote sensing using your radiometers. So that is also a very important parameter for your uh, ocean studies. Now scatterometers is something where you know you you have your uh, signals at two angles. You are trying to observe in your uh, with uh, 
polarization over the ocean surface. So it is a circular uh, observ observation is there. So you are able to see uh, the air sea interaction, which is there, the cyclones. In fact, uh, the winds uh, are very accurately measured using. Just show you how it is able to measure this. In fact, it is used for icebergs uh, for global change and vegetation and soil moisture studies also. People are trying to understand uh, the scatterometer uh, data, which is there. So I'll just show you. See, if you have a uh, th this four scenario, I have tried to show you that if you have a calm ocean or little rough or more rough due to wind, and if there is a very rough uh, condition. So if you have a signal which goes, uh, as I mentioned, had shown you, if it is a smooth uh, surface or, of water, it will just go in the opposite direction. So the signal doesn't come. But if you have little rough, you will have some signal which is returning towards your, when it is a circular, uh, your observations are there, you are able to get some signal. And if you have a little more rough, you will get a lot of signal which is returning to your antenna. And if you have a very rough surface, you will get a very, very uh, high return towards your antenna. So you are able to, in fact, measure your surface roughness. Uh, the, you know, the smooth criteria, rough criteria, and intermediate roughness. This is also, again, uh, the angle, uh, depression angle uh, dependency is there. So you will be able to get that, yes, if you have uh, your, uh, uh, if it is a, a one centimeter kind of roughness, which is there, then you will have a smooth or if it is intermediate and if it is something like 5.68 centimeter kind of, uh, if it is more than 5.68, then it will be considered as rough. In fact, I've tried to list down here for you. Uh, that for carbon, something, as I was mentioning, uh, uh, the roughness itself is dependent on the pol uh, uh, band which you are using. So for something which is rough for K band, carbon, it will not be rough for P band. Say for carbon, if something as uh, uh, little more than 0 0.05 centimeter will go into it in the intermediate. And it's rough will be more than three centimeter, you'll get carbon. But for P band, as high as 14.7 centimeter only will uh, count for rough. So typically, if you want to study your uh, wind surfaces and the roughness which is there, then you go for ka, 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 ka band. So you'll be able to get little roughness if it is there on the oceans. You are able to pick up that better. And uh, for soil, uh, if you want to go, if you have a smooth soil, then you know if, if you consider P band, then uh, typically the agricultural terrain, which is uh, sm uh, in roughness is in disorder, it will be uh, considered as smooth, as if you observe it. And P for P band, it will appear as a smooth. So more inter uh, underneath the soil, you will be able to go, and able uh, you will be able to study the profile soil moisture. But if you go look at for C band, then typically you will be able to see only up to say five centimeter kind of thing. Anything beyond this you know, uh, will be uh, rough. So uh, like um, you'll, uh, little rough uh, surface is there, then you'll not be able to get the information beneath the soil. So as I mentioned, as uh, in this uh, wind speed and incidence angle, different incidence angle, when you try to see, uh, there's a relation of wind speed uh, with the backscatter signal that you return, uh, that you receive at uh, say zero degree, 10 degree, 20 degree. And using this, you are able to, estimate the wind speed. You can see the wind uh, direction that and wind speed, and you can see the uh, eye which is seen for the cyclone. So using this you know, wind direction and wind strength, uh, wind speed, you are able to uh, find out the cyclone related studies can be done. In fact, it is also utilized for uh, understanding the decadal change, which is there in the melting index uh, for uh, this. Uh, between 1990 uh, okay so scatterometer as i mentioned you can do cyclone studies in fact with our own sketchset 2016 uh, uh, sketchset 1 which was launched in 2016 your wind speed range uh, we could uh, improve for, uh, it was earlier 4 uh, meters per second to 24 meters per second uh, you uh, uh, that was for oscap now from there, now you are able to do from three meter to thirty meter. So your improvement is much more, much better, and the vector cell 
itself, the, you know, the resolution you can see, wind vector cell from forty kilometer to you have you are able to identify up to twenty five kilometer by twenty five kilometer thing. So this improves your overall accuracies uh, with this. Now let's see um, after having looked at the your uh, scattermeter. This is also active. So altimeter is also another active uh, sensor that you have. In altimeter, you send a signal and whatever, uh, say in your nadir direction, and from there, the whatever is a return, that return you are able to, the time that it takes, you are uh, from the satellite, uh, when, uh, when once you uh, transmit and uh, once you receive, what is the time? So it takes two-way time to receive the signal. And from that time, and you know the speed of light, so you are able to fi uh, find out the speed of electromagnetic wave is known. So from the time you are able to get the information about the, the uh, range, uh, the kilometers uh, that it has uh, traveled. So you can do range de determination, orbit determination, and you have to correct for your troposphere and ionosphere because that will also uh, uh, you, you know, limit your speed. So from that, you are able to get the information about the height sea surface height, your significant wave height you are able to find. And you can see if using buoy and your actual observation, you can see the correlation which is there, the RMSA which is there is very, very high. So you are able to get very accurate information using the altimeter about the... Let's say. Now under uh, your active... Uh, uh, this is Doppler radar. So that is used for weather surveillance. In fact, uh, you used various uh, this thing for different applications if you are under, uh, if you want to understand wind profile uh, profilers or uh, clean air returns or turbulence then you use in vhf so 32 300 kind of thing if you want to understand the tropical cyclone and uh, then you go for s band or severe weather phenomenon you want to understand the uh, precipitation then you you'll be going to from s band to you go, go to c band and thunderstorm and this if you want to understand you study at x band then uh, for cloud microphysics, K-band is useful. Uh, uh, tornado detection and you know uh, precipitation estimation and all that. And for cellometer and tornado detection, uh, multimeter in fact is also millimeter is also uh, used. So I just shown one example here where you know you are able to see that the reflectivity which is there, the maximum reflectivity that you get. Uh, this is uh, from uh, you can see that there is a severe local storm which is coming so uh, that is immediately detected using your this uh, ground uh, surveillance uh, radars which are there okay fine so uh, then you also have ground penetrating radar so ground penetrating radar is actually able to tell you the information beneath the ground so it's a basically it is for expedition of ocean surface or you are able to get the uh, I see uh, sheet uh, thickness itself from this. So you'll, uh, you'll get wherever you get a dip and then you get a signal, you'll come to know that, yes, uh, there is a, a feature here, which is, uh, you know, uh, giving you this uh, signal uh, when you are taking this across the, this. In fact, these are also ground penetrating radars are also used uh, by our surveys of road and uh, this thing. If you have any dielectric uh, parameters underneath uh, the uh, your road also suppose there is a uh, pipeline which is going on immediately you will get that signal so this it is also used for such purpose and even it has its own strategic uses also for any buried objects you can uh, detect using this okay so we started in this synthetic aperture in fact side looking uh, airborne radar what the initial start uh, uh, when, which we had uh, at isro so ISRO SLAR we had, and in, that was as early as 1980, we had started with this. And uh, in fact, Lonar Crater uh, near Aurangabad was also, uh, we, were, we had studied using this uh, airborne uh, the thing. We also have ground with scatterometer. So using scatterometer, you can, you know, do ground experiments uh, that, uh, yes, you are able to study various, suppose for agricultural terrain, I have just tried to see here that, okay, what kind of sensitivity soil moisture is having when you change the incidence angle, uh, how uh, the backscatter is uh, behaving, that yes, at lower incidence angle, you are able to get higher return. And 
then similarly soil moisture if it is increasing so these are all for ground control studies you know that how the roughness is affecting your backscatter or soil moisture how backscatter it is related to backscatter so these are the kind of studies so then you have gone to now space one uh, radars so it's a synthetic aperture radar so uh, you are synthetically increasing your sensitivity uh, uh, by synthesizing you know your different uh, your radar is uh, moving uh, and with your footprint you are trying to get a finer footprint using this synthetic uh, because uh, you are uh, for whatever uh, uh, yeah time frame that you are able to view the uh, point so it is once you have you know the range from where the signal is coming so using this range in the image processing one signal processing once the data comes back you are able to synthetically synthetically increase the resolution so that's how this uh, from radar uh, we go to synthetic uh, aperture radar okay so this uh, from isro slar then we moved on to c band airborne sar first where you know uh, it was also in uh, five uh, uh, c band we had so the and with hhn we polarization so we could see that okay what kind of signals do we get so uh, early in 2004 or not we were doing this experiments and we were trying to study the uh, like how it is useful for and various features how do we uh, able to discern in you know if you have two polarization uh, with us okay only uh, difficulty with airborne sar is that that incidence angle range you know very quickly uh, it, it it changes in a very uh, small swath because the height is altitude is less so within small swath your incidence angle range is very very high and that's how we have to you know uh, only very high incidence angle you have to go so that you will be able to take little more larger swath if you take it uh, lower incidence angle uh, the incidence angle changes very rapidly so it it limits its usefulness that way but uh, for disaster management where you where you have to find out say for example if there is a, uh, a flood flooded condition that's where your dmsr or we have a disaster management uh, sar which is uh, operationally disaster monitoring sar which is operationally available so you are able to delineate the if there is a uh, the areas which are under uh, inundated and under water or if there is any uh, you know uh, breaches there uh, so that you are able to detect very accurately as i said that water will give a very smooth kind of surface uh, so you are able to so similarly we have dmsr in fact individual tree you can find out the shadows also you can see okay so major sar missions you have uh, right now you have sentinel 1 right so uh, so you have lot of uh, saying in fact in our uh, planetary missions also we had chandrayaan 1 uh, and 2 now and then arisat 1 it was our first as i mentioned was the first space one sar that we had okay so arisat 1 uh, i'll not go into the details of the operation modes but we had a quad pole and a circular polarimetric uh, mode that was there it was operating in c band okay let us see uh, okay now um, future we will be having nasa isro sar that is uh, planned in 2023 where l band is being developed by nasa and s band by isro so that integration is right now going on so uh, using this sar in fact using our own ri set uh, we have uh, developed uh, Uh, you know we are able to see the wind speed very fine resolution wind vector can be detected and as you can see that with scattermeter the kind of resolution that you have and with sar the kind of resolutions that you have you, that is much more finer as i mentioned some 25 by 25 km kind of thing you can get but with sar you know you have 5 cm uh, 10 cm kind of retrieval can be there uh, your, for your footprint so very accurate you can measure here i have just try to show the ri hello hello okay uh, somebody's mic is on probably hello yeah uh, so uh, you can see the changes in uh, the snow and ice of uh, this himalayan uh, glacier area uh, you can find you you when i study all this using this um, our sar data in fact uh, see uh, oil slicks is one of the major 
problem as you know that if there is a wind which is there heavier oils will be moved uh, uh, by the wind and then you are able to see uh, you know transition here and, the, and this lighter oil is more so you are able to detect uh, that oil sleeks very accurately in fact internal waves that tells about the bathymetry itself so that also you are able to study very accurately Where ship detection is another uh, major application uh, in fact uh, for surveillance also and for movement of the ship which is there now let us see that how different polarization here i have just tried to see uh, show you that comparison of c band l band p band these three and if you look at the for ease of uh, this thing i have put one optical data in optical typically the red is the vegetation and you can see within this this is kevla dev national park uh, near bharatpur so it's in your uh, state right so uh, here you can see that if you have a uh, optical data this is how the signal is seen but if you have microwave in different uh, polarization then c band is showing you about the vegetation which is there whereas uh, l band is penetrating and telling you even about the uh, you know within the uh, this lake part the aquatic vegetation which is there and l band uh, p band is in fact penetrating all the more and giving you much more information here and even the settlements you can see that for p band it is almost uh, all these uh, uh, farmers uh, fields which are there are transparent whereas c band is picking up about the vegetation which is there l band is telling you about the moisture okay and p band is telling you about the deeper layer moisture so this is what is the benefit that we have incidence angle as i had mentioned 16 degree 23 degree and 47 degree if you look at different incidence angle this is um, a canal and the water which is taken uh, fatehpur sikri uh, in fact uh, area it is there so the water here you can see it is a uh, Agra, this is Agra uh, uh, city, which is here. So here you can see that from this canal, the water which is going in the surrounding farms is very clearly seen when you look at Nadir, almost Nadir, 16 degree. But if the same area, if you look at 47 degree, you do not see that. And in fact, if you look at the optical data, the entire area is covered from crop. So within the cropped area also when the surface is covered with crops so you cannot see what is the moisture condition but microwave if you look at lower incidence angle uh, you are able to very accurately pick up pick up 23 degree yes you are able to pick up uh, to a certain extent and but if you go to 47 it is almost equivalent to your uh, optical data that's what i was mentioning that you'll be able to see only majorly the crop not the what is beneath the crop because your interaction will be mostly with the crop uh, terrain this I have tried to show here that, see, if you look at uh, your higher incidence angle, you are uh, uh, traveling in the crop uh, uh, only. Your signal is traveling within the crop uh, uh, canopy. So your information is from the crop. But if you look at low incidence angle, you will be seeing between the crop. So you are able to get the information from below this uh, single, uh, crop. Okay. So this is the vegetation dependent uh, dependence. I have just tried to see that okay what kind of vegetation at different incidence angle you have if you have zero degree incidence angle then your sensitivity to the vegetation uh, and the moisture uh, uh, like penetration uh, will be much more but if you have your uh, higher uh, you know uh, frequencies that you have or your higher incidence angle if you if you go from zero degree to 50 degree your penetration will be very little uh, beneath the soil okay so i'll just try to show you here that yes uh, you can do large area soil moisture uh, using this c band which will tell you about the surface soil moisture so uh, all these you can see that in the month of january march and april you can see that the ent entire area is dry and you are able to get mostly a dry condition but this is the creek you know the backwaters are there so in the backwaters you will have from the ocean you will be getting so this this will be moist soil which will be there so in this although the entire area is dry as you can see when there is a backwater and the soil marshy soil is there or moist soil is there that is more than 25 degree soil moisture you are able to pick up within these areas so it is the sensitivity of you know soil moisture uh, your sar to soil moisture is typically seen here in the two the extreme condition 
and these areas are relatively moist not as dry as this so somewhere at 5 to 10 degree uh, 10 uh, gra percentage of uh, gram per centimeter cube you are also able to pick up in this green shade which is there so and i have tried to show that this is you can see that there, there is a flow of water from sea to this areas uh, whenever this a uh, it's a typical sabka island you know uh, kutch so you get uh, water uh, from there and then it gets trapped and then you have high moisture conditions beneath these creek okay so penetration uh, uh, with the depth of penetration will also as i have mentioned that as the moisture content increases your penetration depth will uh, decrease you but uh, if uh, if you have a dry condition your penetration of uh, signal will be much more uh, it will be able to go uh, up to say 100 of uh, centimeter but if you have wet condition then the penetration will be much less okay up to one meter you can uh, go uh, if, if it is a dry 100 centimeter kind of situation you will go. okay this i have just tried to show typically this is uh, the month of april so it is very dry condition entire region is very dry so if you see x band c band or l band then entire region is very very uh, dry but only thing is there is a river channel which is going here i've tried to highlight that portion as you can see in x band or c band you just don't see any signal there but when it comes to l band deep down this channel which is there is picked up so moist deeper layer you could pick up with the l band uh, which is there but you cannot pick up uh, in C band and X band at all. It is, there is absolutely no signal that is like faint signal, which is so it just gets lost in your surroundings. Similarly, crop, as I have mentioned, okay, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this, this is, I have taken an example of uh, paddy, uh, you know, a grown area in West Bengal. So, uh, in uh, optical image, you can see there is a late rise and early rise. So this situation is there. So at low incidence angle, when you are trying to see, you are able to kind of you know differentiate between the two. But if you look at the high incidence angle, then it is uh, see rice is a very highly uh, moist uh, crop, right? So if you look at it, 43 degree, it's almost uh, there is no difference between the two. But if you look at 13 degree, then the water, see uh, rice, uh, we have uh, a layer of water, uh, right? Uh, and on that paddy is grown. So that water, uh, when a signal is in track, uh, like hitting, and then there is a vertical uh, rice crop which is there. So there's a double bounce. So you get the signal back towards your antenna. So that's how for where you have very high uh, water content below this, that low incidence angle, you are able to pick up that late rice, uh, uh, component i'll just try to show this water phenomena that happens with rice here that if you have a crop then your uh, signal you know uh, will just uh, hit the crop uh, terrain and go back like that but uh, if there is a water so there are four kind of scenario which is happening so signal is coming back from the top of the canopy okay then also it hits the water there is a rice which is hitting uh, 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 from where it is the signal is hitting and then it is coming back towards your antenna so again it comes back towards the antenna and this is the third condition where the signal is hitting the crop it hits the water and then it comes back and otherwise directly from the water also so most of the signal is returning back towards your antenna uh, in case of rice so if you have an early uh, a low a low vegetation your signal will be less but as the vegetation increases your return also increases so you are able to map, uh, identify these paddy areas very accurately. In fact, as early as in the month of August, you can find out very accurately the entire uh, paddy grown areas, uh, which is there. So I have taken uh, July, August, and September one example. So you are able to uh, pick up all the, uh, the things. In fact, it will be harvested somewhere in September, but, but much before it is harvested, you are able to map uh, this entire area and you are able to estimate. Uh, the how much paddy will be grown okay now here you can see it for i've just shown one example of uh, forest uh, signatures at c band and l band uh, this uh, area you can just uh, concentrate here a and b i have tried to put and uh, you can see that in uh, c band 
the signal is different as compared to L when since it is able to penetrate more. And here also this difference is there. I'll just try to show the exact uh, numbers uh, which are observed. You can see that uh, if you look at C band and L band, if you and if you see the plants uh, per you know 100 uh, plant density basically, if you try to see within that your backscattering coefficient uh, at C band and uh, is not that sensitive as compared to L band because L band is able to penetrate much below the soil and you are able to get so this is a cross polarization and typically cross polarization is more sensitive as compared to horizontal or vertical because in the vegetation what happens is when the vegetation is there when the signal is there uh, is hit to that and then there is a multiple you know scattering within the vegetation so the signal gets depolarized so most of the energy you are able to get back in your cross polarization as you can see that here and the cross polarization I have kept it in green here. So signal is very accurately picked up from for this vegetation. So it is sensitive. Uh, vertical polarization horizontally is sensitive, but you can see the difference in sensitivity. Uh, vertical polarization you have 0.78. This is prosophis julifera. So typically, you know, it's a, a horizontally uh, kind of uh, canopy which is there on the crop top. So. You can see that vertical it is only 0.78, whereas if you look at uh, horizontal, slightly uh, that uh, sensitivity is more. But if you look at cross polarization, it is going to 0.94. So this shows the uh, your polarization and your frequency dependence uh, or uh, the sensitivity of polarization frequency to vegetation terrain. And uh, yeah, flood I have already explained uh, how it happens, right? Uh, in the flooded condition, if you have vegetation uh, totally submerged, you will have a different signal. But if vegetation is uh, there above uh, this, so you are able to uh, pick up uh, the water. Uh, this is uh, there for you. So here, uh, the same paddy area, if you get uh, the, there is a flood. So in that flood, you can identify, you know, typically in the uh, for uh, paddy grown areas, uh, there are a lot of uh, hue and cry that yes, our total loss of water is lost. So, uh, so a crop is lost. But actually speaking, if you see, uh, there are a lot of area which are fully submerged, but there are a lot of areas which is not, because even if the underneath water level is little more or less, will not affect your paddy crop at all. So that lot of area is normal, you can say, although there is a water, but still it is, uh, 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 yield wise, it will be normal. Of, and there are few which are partially submerged, but areas very little area you can see this uh, sky blue color that is fully submerged so that's only the loss it's not the entire area which is lost fine and uh, as i was mentioning for the roughness you know i have explained that okay you, if you have a smooth surface you get a signal here and it gets in the opposite direction you don't get any signal back but if you have say a uh, uh, some structure which is uh, obstructing here so if you uh, transmit, it's a smooth surface, it goes back here uh, in the opposite direction, but then there is uh, something to obstruct, like as I said, paddy crop is there or some uh, vertical wall is there, then the signal will return back to your uh, sensor. So this is typical case of our human settlement. You know, you have wall structure, so it will hit the ground, then it will go to, go to the wall and then you get back. So this is uh, the kind of interaction that uh, human settlement has. So I've just, uh, and water. So if you have a water surface, it goes, signal goes opposite direction. So you have very low backscatter, minus 15, 20 kind of range. But if there is a village, then your backscatter will go as high as 5 uh, dB. So that's the kind of, and then I've tried to say that, okay, again, C band, L band, and P band, what kind of uh, signals you'll get from this. Okay. And this in an image form, if you want to see, see, these are the three uh, uh, optical images. Here, the settlements, you are not able to practically see because it's all surrounded with the crop which is there. So you don't get, or if it is even if it, if it is not cropped areas, it gets, uh, you know, uh, the signature, signature is very much similar to the open area. So you don't uh, distinguish between that. You can't delineate. Whereas in SAR here, you can see these bright spots. These are all villages. Bas because of this phenomena, as I mentioned, that signal that is hit to the ground and the wall and then comes back lost most of the backscatter comes back to the antenna 
and that's why all of these uh, 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 villages can be picked up very very accurately okay and then lent deformation of course interferometric uh, you are all now aware we can find the fringes and if there is any deformation some uh, uh, earthquake is there a precursor is can you uh, you can find in fact at c band and l band in fact, again it is dependent on the frequency if you have a c band your fringes will be finer so your movement you'll be able to accurately measure uh, much uh, with higher accuracy and at l band your uh, more uh, if the uh, uh, different uh, your uh, subsidence is uh, higher you will be able to find now uh, this surface water as i mentioned if we, if you have a smooth surface yes you can you know very accurately measure using sar itself but as our ocean surfaces we were saying if there is a wind then your signal you know uh, is uh, getting diffused you get a diffuse scattering so you don't get uh, signal back say this typical th this you can see it's just one day apart okay 16th march and 13th march so it's two day apart you can see here the water is not seen at all whereas here the entire water body is seen very accurately but why this is happening is because there is a wind condition windy uh, condition here similarly this 14th and 15th april partially it is seen here some of the portions are not seen here also because of local wind which are there so this is the major problem when you have using SAR. But in SAR comes handy here, uh, interferometric SAR. So where you are trying to see that whether when you send, you have two signals, the phases, from the phases you try to see whether they are correlated or not. So from that, if you try to make use of this, this windy condition leads to incoherence in fact they will not be in co uh, correlated with each other whereas the surrounding areas will be correlated with each other so correlation will be very high in these areas and poor in these areas because the signature itself has changed the signal has changed the phases are uh, are not stable here so in such conditions using insar where they are not correlated that water can uh, that will be identified as water and very accurate water measurement is done in fact for our disaster this is one of the major uh, like uh, uh, technique which can help in you know identifying because typically your flood everything will be associated with windy conditions here you can see here also even in fact it appears that the river has lost the water but that's not the case the river is very much having very accurate water uh, like uh, very much water is there, but it is not seen in the signal due to the local windy condition which is there. So here also you can see this patch and this patch. So, but with INSAR coherence, you are able to very accurately see. Now let's look at, uh, after interferometry, let us have a look at the polarometry. Now what is polarometry? That, uh, as I mentioned, you are able, see when you get the signal back from the radar return, you are not aware uh, about the target which is there and the target is also a mixed target you have a soil moisture you have surface roughness on that you will have some vegetation it will have some volume it will have some biomass it will have some moisture orientation everything will be there everything comes to you as a radar signal okay but using SAR polarimetric technique that is if you have fully polarimetric or hybrid polarimetry you are trying to find out soil moisture vegetation moisture you can you know separate these out vegetation biomass vegetation volume surface roughness these parameters you are able to separate uh, from uh, the mixed signal that you have received from radar return so i have just tried to show you fully polarimetric you can you know do the scattering mechanism you can find different scattering mechanism that whether you had a single bounce single uh, or a volume or a double reflection or there was a mix, uh, if it is a totally pure uh, double bounce or volume or uh, single bounce which was there, or it was a mixed signal or a very distributed kind of signal. So using this, you will be able to extract the scattering mechanism, that whether it was a, 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 the scattering properties from that. So I, I've just tried to show the scattering mechanism. This is actually uh, done over an entire year time frame. Uh, of the, this is again this Bharatpur uh, sanctuary, which is you can see in the center of it. So uh, you can see the Kela Dev, uh, that uh, uh, wetland which is there in the center. 
is shown as a single uh, reflection okay which is there and in on that you have uh, the typically you have the grass uh, which is the, uh, which will be there on that your aquatic vegetations which will be there so depending upon the time of the year the kind of features you can see here uh, this uh, is having typically the volume content uh, because the paddy is grown here in july uh, and from august and when paddy is harvested after that it, that signal is lost so you are able to see the scattering mechanism and you can uh, from these scattering mechanisms you can find out the soil moisture which is there uh, for whether under underneath wheat or underneath mustard crop which if with fully mock polarimetry how you are able to see if you just have hybrid polarimetry as i was mentioning circular transmit linear receive still you are able to get lot of information lot of correlation is there with your signal and but if you just have sigma naught as you can see for bare soils though there is a signal uh, which is there uh, uh, correlation is there but if you have uh, vegetated cover under the wheat crop or mustard crop your signal in fact mustard you are totally lost under wheat still you are able to get some signal the mustard is a very open kind of canopy so a lot of canopy interactions are there in your signal so hybrid polarimetry i'm just showing the soil moisture that you can detect uh, uh, from these hybrid polarimetric uh, signal so you can see in month of march this red is low soil moisture so almost entire area is having dry condition here but in october when the crop starts sowing you know from october uh, you start sowing uh, wheat and mustard in this uh, area so from october your uh, mustard will be sown and by november most of the mustard area will be there december you will start sowing your crop uh, wheat also so your lot of uh, fields will start getting moisture there january and february almost all you can see it is in 5 to 10 kind of centimeter kind of soil moisture range and once it is crop is harvested everything is dry again so you can see everything comes back to your red so you are able to accur very accurately measure your soil moisture uh, using uh, this uh, okay I, this i have already covered okay now let us see little bit of planetary i am coming to end of my talk now okay so many sir we had over chandrayaan 1 in fact chandrayaan 2 we had our own uh, this uh, df sir dual frequency ln s band sir and with that some signal uh, i i'm just uh, trying to show that you can find out you know uh, your uh, single bounds uh, using your odd bounds even bounds and uh, volumetric uh, component from this and from these features you are able to accurately measure the roughness which is there on uh, this signal uh, which is there and all the roughness uh, you are able to accurately measure using uh, this and the shadow areas you can see here with this and uh, you are able to see planetary ice uh, detection itself is uh, also one of the field of research because of the dielectric constant and the surface roughness you are able to you know measure the ice which is there so you have as i mentioned that polarimetry i have mentioned interferometry i have mentioned polarimetric interferometry also to certain extent with some airborne uh, data it is done but uh, uh, and then synthetic aperture radiometer itself like you have in your smos and these and then polarimetric radiometer that is also uh, just upcoming and by static radar now with you know multiple uh, constellation which are planned you will start getting by static uh, signals on ground people are trying this um, experimental basis so i'll just show you one glimpse of this fall in sat and then uh, we'll end our talk here so you have this c band l band and p band uh, and then if you get for th these are the back scatter that you have but if you have a pol polarimetric interferometric signature extracted from this so the face center is what you are able to get so within this you can see that these areas are all uh, here typically prosophis jellifera was there and then you have jamun kadam areas here so tall trees are here compared to uh, as compared to long uh, low uh, this but if you see here you are able to see the just the surface of that or at, at the most up to the trunk and all but this you can see in your pollen sar signal image these areas your jamun kadam tall trees are very very distinct uh, from the prosophis jellifera kind of uh, crops which are there and uh, 
uh, within this uh, uh, lake, uh, your uh, this lake area also, which is there in between, you can see a lot of features uh, using this pollen chart telling that yes, if there is aquatic vegetation or there is a moisture underneath or there is a water which is there beneath that, how depth, uh, what is the depth at from where the signal is coming. So uh, with polarometric interferometrics are, of course, we don't have now these days uh, with any sensors, very accurate uh, baselines of for your polarometric uh, signatures are to be are required for that. And but uh, with that, uh, you can find very accurate, as I've just mentioned, that you have your prosophis or kadam or jamun kind of uh, this thing in your pollens are in your backscatter, you are not able to distinguish uh, this kind much. But your polarometric interferometrics are you are very, very, very uh, accurately able to measure. So, thank you so much. So, we are through uh, microwave underneath the cloud cover or all weather condition we are able to see uh, the signal. So thank you so much. And I'll end my talk here. I'm sorry I have taken a few minutes. Uh, uh, not, extra. Not, at yeah. all. No, not at all, Farid. Man. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, over to anchors, Adohi, Shivani. Electromagnetic radiations with varying frequency, such as ultraviolet, microwaves, X-rays, visible rays, etc., are everywhere in nature and it was very inform informative to know the effect of these frequencies on various parameters on our surrounding environment and how these frequencies are useful into the major agriculture aspects also including major weather crop density plant density moisture content importance of polarimetry thank you so much ma'am for your valuable insights and sharing your knowledge with us thank you shivani now for the next Very session, we have Dr. Manisha Gupta, ma'am. Dr. Manisha Gupta, ma'am, okay, is a senior member of IEEE. She is currently an associate you. professor in Department of Physics, University of Rajasthan. She has written and edited several books, published over 60 journals and conference papers of international repute. She has organized IEEE MIT's conferences and chaired many of these conferences. She has served on the program committee of international conferences and workshops. She supervised PhDs and directed MPhil and MTech dissertations also. Her current research focus is on antenna designing for mobile and satellite communications. She received her PhD degree in computer-aided design of patch and array structures of microstrip antennas from University of Rajasthan in 2002. She is honored with Outstanding Branch Counselor Award from IEEE US for her distinguished services in the field. She is also awarded with Rajasthan Energy Conservation Award from Honorable Chief Minister Sri Ashok Gehlot Sahib. Her research has been awarded with Certificate of Merit from Institution of Engineers, Kolkata. So to begin the fourth session, last but not the least, for today, I would request Dr. Manisha Gupta, ma'am, to present the topic measurement of dielectric constant and waveguide components with beautiful quote quoted by Sir Richard P. Feynman. It does not matter how beautiful your theory is. It does not matter how smart you are. If it does not agree with the experiments, it is wrong. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, Manisha. Welcome. Ma'am, your mic is muted. Please unmute your mic. Okay, sorry. Good afternoon, ma'am. And good afternoon, all the gathering, all the students, my dear students. How are you all? Uh, I'm trying to present my PPT, but this is not sharing actually. Just let me share this first. Is it visible to all? My yes, yes ma'am. PPT. Okay, fine. Uh, 
am i audible also yes yes, yes ma'am your voice is very clear okay so as we all know uh, today we are here to know some experiments as i was told from uh, dr sumita ki i have to be focus only on the experiments only so i have chosen some of the lab experiments for you all students of msc <clears throat> here although there are very uh, long list of experiments but out of those i have chosen some of your uh, syllabus like uh, first one i will be dealing with measurements of dielectric constant and dielectric loss of a dielectric solid material and second i would be dealing with a uh, measurement of isolation and coupling coefficient of magic t i i suppose you have studied this in your theory classes magic t and all hello am i audible yes ma'am okay audible okay. so uh, this would be interactive session if any point of time if you want to ask anything you can interrupt me or you can be ask any question Please. right avail this opportunity participants make it more interactive yes ma'am any point of time any anything you want to ask you may interrupt me okay and third uh, experiment i would be dealing is time permits me to measure isolation and insertion loss of three port circulator and the last but not the least to measure that insertion loss coupling coefficient and directivity of directional coupler so these i i suppose ki i can uh, cover all these four to, in today's session so first of all i'm taking measurement of dielectric constant and dielectric loss of a dielectric solid material using microwaves okay so before starting with this let me ask anybody of you know about dielectric डायलैक्ट्रिक्स के बारे में कुछ जानते हैं आप लोग आप लोगों ने कुछ पढ़ा है कुछ सुना है एनी थिंग यू वॉन्ट टू शेयर विद मी अबाउट डायलैक्ट्रिक और डायलैक्ट्रिक कॉन्स्टेंट और डायलैक्ट्रिक लॉस एनी थिंग नो नो आइडिया ओके सो बेसिकली वेन बी टॉक अबाउट इलेक्ट्रोबैरेटिक प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ अ मटीरियल बेसिकली नॉन मैग्नेटिक मटीरियल और अ मीडियम in which our wave is propagating then we can specify this medium by its permeability conductivity and dielectric constant permeability if you remember its symbol we use that is mu mu is what permeability is a medium uh, uh permeability is a measure of efficiency of transfer of magnetic force in a medium theek hai aur conductivity kya hai conductivity is a efficiency of transfer of electric charge ab baat aati hai dielectric constant ki then dielectric constant is isko hum symbol lete hain epsilon and the measure of efficiency of transfer of electric force so whenever we have to measure how much electric force is being transferred how much efficiency is there there we do require dielectric constant right ab har ek medium mein kuch jo hum isko ek one word mein bhi aap isko represent kar sakte hain iska ek naam aur bhi hai dielectric ke liye hum permittivity ka bhi istemal karte hain we can also call it permittivity right aur agar hum simple लैंग्वेज में इसको समझना चाहें कि व्हाट इज डायलेक्ट्रिक्स बेसिकली तो इन सिंपलेस्ट लैंग्वेज यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड दैट डायलेक्ट्रिक्स आर नथिंग बट इंसुलेटर्स वॉट अ पॉइंट सो डायलैक्ट्रिक्स के बारे में मैं आप लोगों को पहले एक्सप्लेन करना चाह रही थी कि डायलैक्ट्रिक्स क्या है आप डायलैक्ट्रिक को परमिटिविटी से समझ सकते हैं डायलैक्ट्रिक को इंसुलेटर से समझ सकते हैं और डायलैक्ट्रिक को आप मेजर ऑफ एफिशिएंसी ऑफ ट्रांसफर्स ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिक चार्ज के फॉर्म में भी इलेक्ट्रिक सॉरी इलेक्ट्रिक फोर्स के फॉर्म में भी समझ सकते हैं 
ठीक है तो हम अब डायरेक्टरी कॉन्स्टेंट को मेजर क्यों करना चाह रहे हैं वॉट इज द यूज ऑफ दैट क्यों क्यों जरूरत पड़ती है हमको डायलेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट डायलेक्ट्रिक लॉस के बारे में मेजर करने की तो इसका सीधा सा रीजन ये है कि हर एक मटेरियल में कुछ पावर स्टोर करने की कैपेसिटी होती है और जो रेशो और कुछ पावर उससे डिसिपेट होती है तो दैट रेशो ऑफ डिसिपेटेड पावर टू द पावर स्टोर इन अ साइकिल क्योंकि वेव इज मूविंग इन अ साइकिल सो पर साइकिल कितनी पावर डिसिपेट हो रही है उसका पावर स्टोर के साथ जो रेशो है दैट इज नोन एज लॉस टेंजेंट ठीक है और उसको हम उससे हम पता लगा सकते हैं कि हमारा जो मीडियम है वो लॉसी है मींस वो पावर को लॉस करेगा एफिशिएंसी हमारी खराब करेगा और कितनी खराब करेगा कॉट अ पॉइंट तो इसलिए हमें जरूरत पड़ती है कि वी शुड नो कि वॉट इज डायलेक्ट्रिक कॉन्स्टेंट वॉट आर डायलेक्ट्रिक लॉसेज ताकि हम अपने सिस्टम को एफिशिएंट बना सके और वेव को प्रॉपरली आगे प्रोपोगेट करा सके विद अ मिनिमम लॉस राइट तो अब हम अपने फर्स्ट स्लाइड पे आ रहे हैं तो इस मेजरमेंट के लिए हमें जो जो ऑपरेटर्स रिक्वायर्ड होंगे वो लिस्ट एक हमारे पास क्लेस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई रिक्वायर्ड है क्लेस्ट्रॉन ट्यूब जिसपे क्लेस्ट्रॉन माउंट है आज सुबह आपके टागर सर के सेशन में आप लोगों ने इन सब के बारे में पढ़ा है आइसोलेटर रिक्वायर्ड है मैं भी एक एक करके सबको आपको दिखाऊंगी भी वेरिएबल अटेन्यूएटर रिक्वायर्ड है एंड एन स्लॉटेड सेक्शन विद ट्यूनेबल प्रॉप एंड क्रिस्टल डिटेक्टर विद डिटेक्टर माउंट एंड सम डायलेक्ट्रिक सैंपल्स ऑफ डिफरेंट साइज दैट मे बी डायलेक्ट्रिक मे बी टेफलॉन और रबर और सम अदर ऑल्सो लाइक पॉलिथीन इज ऑल्सो ए डायलेक्ट्रिक एंड टू मेजर वी आर यूजिंग हेयर अ माइक्रोमीटर सो दीज आर दस वी डू रिक्वायर इन आर एक्सपेरिमेंट टू मेजर डायलेक्ट्रिक कॉन्स्टेंट सो हेयर आई हैव टेकन अ वीडियो फ्रॉम द लैब ताकि आपको ऑपरेटर्स लाइवली समझ में आ जाए फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल दिस इज वॉट क्लिस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई सॉरी आगे चले गए मैं इसको पॉज करना चाह रही थी यस दिस इज द फर्स्ट डिवाइस वी हैव दैट इज क्लेस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई कैन यू सी दिस हियर यस मैम यस मैम इट्स विजिबल ऑन दिस साइड आई एम हैविंग दिस इज कैरियर वेव दिस इज एम्पलीट्यूड मॉड्यूलेशन दिस इज फ्रीक्वेंसी मॉड्यूलेशन एंड दिस इज एक्सटेंशन वर्जन ऑफ दिस and here on this side you can see this is beam voltage this is beam current and this is reflector voltage to jab bhi hame klestron power supply use karni hai to ye teeno nodes hame kaam mein leni hai isme hame generally beam voltage hum fix rakhte hain that is from 275 to 300 right aur repeller voltage ya reflector voltage ko you can vary अकॉर्डिंग यू टू योर रिक्वायरमेंट जो भी है आपको आउटपुट कितना चाहिए उसके अकॉर्डिंगली शुरू में सॉरी ये बात बार आगे चला जाता है हाँ जी शुरू में हम बीम करंट को अराउंड थर्टी मिली एमपीयर तक सेट कर लेते हैं और यहां पर इसको हम कैरियर वेव पर ही रखेंगे राइट एनी अदर क्वेरी यू है आगे चले सेकेंड yeah. अब इसके सेकेंड आगे इसको वीडियो को देखें ये क्लिस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई आगे कनेक्ट ये देखो बीम करंट बीम वोल्टेज मैंने 300 हंड्रेड अराउंड रखा हुआ है बीम करंट अराउंड 29 है और अकॉर्डिंगली रिफ्लेक्टर वोल्टेज जो भी आ रही है वो इसका मैक्सिमम रखते हैं ये है फैन कूलिंग फैन दिस इज कूलिंग फैन हेयर और थोड़ा सा पीछे ले लेते हैं हा दिस इज आवर रिफ्लेक्स क्लिस्ट्रॉन माउंट ठीक है जिसपे रिफ्लेक्स क्लिस्ट्रॉन हमने लगाया हुआ है और इसको हमेशा एक कूलिंग फैन की रिक्वायरमेंट होती है क्योंकि हीट बहुत डिसिपेट होती है इसमें और जिससे सिस्टम की एफिशिएंसी हमारी खराब हो जाती है तो उसको कूल cool करने के लिए हम एक कूलिंग फैन हमेशा ऑन रखते हैं 
फिर इसके आगे चले दिस इज आइसोलेटर आइसोलेटर बेसिकली दिस इज अ टू पोर्ट डिवाइस एक इसमें यहां से इनपुट होगा और यहां से आपको आउटपुट मिलेगा सो आइसोलेटर का मेजर फंक्शन क्या है टू मेक द लॉसेस मिनिमम रिफ्लेक्शन लॉसेस जनरली होते हैं जब भी आप मल्टीपल पोर्ट कनेक्ट करते हैं तो उसका सबसे मेजर ड्रॉबैक क्या रहता है कि उसमें रिफ्लेक्शन लॉसेस होने के चांसेस बहुत ज्यादा होते हैं तो इसके लिए इसको अवॉइड करने के लिए हम यहाँ पर आइसोलेटर इस्तेमाल कर रहे हैं आइसोलेटर विल अलाउ ओनली वन वे दिस इज लाइक अ वॉचमैन ये सिर्फ इस डायरेक्शन से जाने देगा इसमें और अगर कोई वेव यहां से वापस आना चाहेगी तो वो उसको जीरो कर देगा न्यूट्रलाइज कर देगा तो आपके पास जो रिफ्लेक्शन लॉसेस है वो मिनिमाइज हो जाएंगे और आपको मैक्सिमम एफिशिएंसी आउटपुट में मिलेगी राइट फिर आगे चले एक मिनट ये वीडियो में थोड़ा सा प्रॉब्लम आएगा शायद मैं इसको आगे ले लेते हूँ यस यस yes. हम यहां तक पहुंच गए थे इससे नेक्स्ट डिवाइस है अटेन्यूएटर अटेन्यूएटर इज जस्ट टू लिमिट द पावर आपकी पावर ऑफ आउट ऑफ रेंज आ रहा है आउटपुट में तो आप उसको अटेन्यूएटर से पावर को कट कर सकते हैं और अपनी डिजायर्ड रेंज में इसको ला सकते हैं तो इसको एक तरह से ये आपने ये स्क्रू होता है यहाँ पे इसको मूव करवा के आप पावर को इनिशियली हम इसको पूरा ऑन रखते हैं ताकि और ये यहां से आप देख रहे हैं स्केल से आप मेजर कर सकते हैं कि कितना आपका आउटपुट मिलने वाला है अकॉर्डिंगली फिर इसके बाद नेक्स्ट डिवाइस कनेक्ट हो रही है हमारी वो है सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट डिवाइस स्लॉटेड सेक्शन दिस इज कॉल्ड स्लॉटेड सेक्शन स्लॉटेड सेक्शन में आप देखेंगे देर इज अंटीमीटर स्केल ऑन दिस एंड वन स्मॉल स्केल इज ऑल्सो अटैच विद दिस दैट इज Having, like, just like a calipers, आप लोगों ने देखा होगा जो लीज काउंट जैसे मेजर करते हैं ऐसी तरह से इसमें मेजर करते हैं एंड वी कैन मूव दिस स्क्रू इन लेफ्ट एंड राइट वो डायरेक्शन और यहाँ पे देखो इससे कनेक्टेड है एक ट्यूनिंग प्रोब जो ट्यून कर देता है आउटपुट को दिस ट्यूनिंग प्रोब इज फर्दर कनेक्टेड विद द आउटपुट और ये देखिए लेफ्ट डायरेक्शन में मूव करवा रही हूं मैं इसको और इसको इसी तरह से आप राइट right में भी मूव करा सकते हैं लेफ्ट में करवा रहे हैं तब तो ये टूवर्ड्स जनरेटर होगा और राइट right में करवा रहे हैं तो टूवर्ड्स लोड होगा और देखिए आउटपुट इससे कनेक्टेड है जैसे जैसे आप इसको मूव करवा रहे हैं आपको आउटपुट माइक्रोमीटर में मिलता है और फिर इसके बाद में लास्ट में हमने इसको एक वेब से टर्मिनेट कर दिया दीज आर आवर डायलैक्ट्रिक्स जो हम एंड पॉइंट पे लगाएंगे यहाँ पर इनिशियल तो हमने कुछ भी नहीं लगाया हुआ ये हमारा वेब गाइड है जिसको हमने टर्मिनेट किया हुआ है और इसमें हम इसको टर्मिनेटेड पॉइंट को खोलकर हम इसमें फिल करेंगे जो आपको डायलेक्ट्रिक मेजरमेंट जिसका करना है तो ये डायलेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट जिसका भी आप मेजर करना चाहते हैं वो आप इस एंड पॉइंट पे जहां पर हमने टर्मिनेट किया हुआ है उसको खोल रही हूं मैं और खोल कर, उसको इसमें आप फिल करेंगे देखिए ये हमने इसके स्लॉट्स के कट्स के हिसाब से ही कट किए हुए हैं सारे पार्ट सारे जो भी हमारा है ये देखिए इसमें आपको एक स्लॉट दिखाई देगा इन दिस स्लॉट यू कैन फिल दिस डायलेक्ट्रिक ओके तो ये डायलेक्ट्रिक मटेरियल मैंने लिया और इसको इसमें इसकी डायरेक्शन के अकॉर्डिंग ही इसको फिल किया कंप्लीटली कितना फिल किया ये हम मेजरमेंट पहले से रखेंगे राइट ये इसका साइज और इसको फिर से हम शॉर्ट कर देंगे सो दिस वॉज बेसिकली एक्सपेरिमेंटल सेटअप ऑफ दिस ओके तो आउटपुट देख रहे हैं आप आई आई सपोज यू गॉट दिस एक्सपेरिमेंटल सेटअप यस मैम ओके okay, इसका मैंने ब्लॉक डायग्राम भी बनाया है सबसे पहले हमारे पास पावर सप्लाई था पावर सप्लाई से हमने कनेक्ट किया था क्लेस्ट्रॉन माउंट को और इसके साथ में हमने कूलिंग फैन भी इसमें लगाया हुआ है जो उसको कूल रखेगा और क्लेस्ट्रॉन माउंट इज फर्दर कनेक्टेड विद आइसोलेटर 
isolator is further connected with variable attenuator uh, that is connected with slotted section that can be moved in left and right both direction if i am moving this in this direction means that is left direction that is towards generator if i am moving this in this direction that is towards load got the point in both excuse me ma'am yes excuse me ma'am yes ye wave guide galat lagi hui hai end wali usko yes, theek yes. se kare यस वो मैं आपको बताना चाह रही थी कि आप हमेशा इसका क्रॉस सेक्शन हॉरिजॉन्टल रखेंगे जानबूझकर मैंने इसको डिस्प्ले किया है ताकि ठीक है देन इट्स ओके ओके एंड फर्दर इफ यू आर मूविंग दिस इन दिस डायरेक्शन दैट इज टुवर्ड्स लोड और इसके कनेक्टेड होती है ट्यूनेबल प्रॉप और ये आउटपुट आपका जो देगा माइक्रोमीटर राइट तो ये इसका ब्लॉक डायग्राम हो गया अब हम Uh, ये मैंने कुछ सैंपल ऑब्जर्वेशन आप लोगों के लिए रखी हैं। सबसे पहले जब आपने कोई भी डायलेक्ट्रिक उसमें नहीं इंसर्ट किया है मैंने आपको बताया था शुरू में हम कोई डायलेक्ट्रिक इंसर्ट नहीं करेंगे तो हम पोजीशन ऑफ मिनिमा नोट कर रहे हैं पोजीशन ऑफ मिनिमा मान लीजिए आपको जब इस वेब गाइड में स्टैंडिंग वेव मिल रही है यू आर मूविंग यूर स्लॉटेड सेक्शन और आप सपोज आपको फर्स्ट मिनिमा इस पोजीशन पे मिल रहा है वो आप स्लॉटेड सेक्शन पे नोट कर लेंगे इसी तरह से फर्दर आप मूव करवाएंगे तो वो आप सेकंड स्लॉटेड सेक्शन पे आप सेकंड uh, पोजीशन नोट कर लेंगे और इस तरह से आपको फोर डिफरेंट मिनिमास की पोजीशन उस स्लॉटेड सेक्शन पे मिल जाएगी राइट right? फिर आप फर्स्ट टू का डिफरेंस आप जब देखते हैं दैट इज नथिंग बट आपकी जो लेमडा जी है गाइड वेव That is nothing but this value, ठीक है यानी इसका डबल दो कंजिक्यूटिव मिनिमास का जो बीच का डिफरेंस आएगा दैट इज हाफ ऑफ लेमडा जी और इसका डबल करेंगे तो यू विल गेट लेमडा जी ओवर दे गाइड वेव लेंथ तो इसी तरह से नेक्स्ट टू कॉन्जिक्यूटिव आप जब देखेंगे तो उनका डिफरेंस और उनका डबल गाइड वेव लेंथ इसी तरह से नेक्स्ट टू कॉन्जिक्यूटिव इनका डिफरेंस और उनका डबल तो इन इस तरह से बस तीन डिफरेंट लेमडा जीज एक सेटअप पे मिल गए और उनका हम एवरेज वैल्यू जब देखते हैं तो दिस इज सपोज दैट वैल्यू दिस दीज आर सैंपल रीडिंग्स ओनली नॉट स्टैंडर्ड वैल्यूज राइट फिर हम एयर के बाद में अपना जो तो टेफलॉन जैसे मैंने लगाया था उसकी डायमेंशन सपोज मैंने ली हुई है लेंथ है उसकी वन सेंटीमीटर तो जो पहले एयर मीडियम के साथ रीडिंग थी These minimas will get shift. This is also called it shift of the minima. जब हमने टेफलॉन लगाया तो टेफलॉन लगाने से जो हमें फर्स्ट मिनिमा मिला सपोज उसकी पोजिशन ये वाली है दैट वी कैन नोट डाउन ऑन द स्लॉटेड सेक्शन राइट और सेकेंड मिनिमा हमें मिला सपोज इस वाले पॉइंट पे और ऐसे ही थर्ड और फोर्थ तो अब ये शिफ्टिंग की पोजिशन हमने नोट कर ली कि फर्स्ट मिनिमा कितना शिफ्ट हुआ सेकंड मिनिमा कितना शिफ्ट हुआ थर्ड मिनिमा कितना शिफ्ट हुआ इस तरह से और उनका सबका हमने एवरेज वैल्यू नोट कर लिया इसी तरह से आप सैंपल चेंज कर सकते हैं अलग अलग तीन चार सैंपल लेके या मटेरियल भी चेंज कर सकते हैं यू कैन यूज रबर ऑल्सो तो रबर का भी तो इस तरह से फाइव सिक्स अलग अलग सैंपल्स लेके डायमेंशन वाइज मटीरियल वाइज यू कैन टेक डिफरेंट रीडिंग्स अप टू दिस पॉइंट एनी डाउट इज देर Yes, any doubt? Or should I proceed? आगे चले? Any doubt? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Clear to all? समझ में आ रहा है सबको? Yes. Okay. So अब हम जो formula use करेंगे to measure dielectric constant. सबसे पहले we will calculate cutoff wavelength. Cutoff wavelength के लिए हमारा जो waveguide की dimension है a that is नोन टू अस वो हम मेजर कर सकते हैं डायरेक्ट उसको लेकर हम सबसे पहले कट ऑफ वेवलेंथ मेजर कर लेंगे क्योंकि हमारा जो सिस्टम है दैट इज फॉर डोमिनेंट मोड ट्रांसफर्स इलेक्ट्रिक वन जीरो मोड तो उस केस में कट ऑफ वेवलेंथ इज टू ए तो दैट वी कैन डायरेक्टली कैलकुलेट फ्रॉम द वेव गाइड फिर हम लेमडा नॉट की वैल्यू मेजर करेंगे यूजिंग दिस फॉर्मूला तो यहाँ पे लेमडा सी हमने लिया हुआ है लेमडा जी हमारी पिछली टेबल से आ गई है वैल्यू This is lambda g, हमारे पास है राइट तो दिस इज लैमडा जी है 
sorry. Yes. So lambda g from the table, lambda c from this value, we can simply calculate lambda naught. Now we will find out the value of lambda d. For lambda d, we have a formula when we are minimum shift towards load. Then we will use the formula of this formula. And if we are doing the shift towards generator, which I have told you in the experiment, if we are doing the shift towards generator, then we will use the formula of this formula. And when we are doing the लोड की तरफ शिफ्ट करवा रहे हैं तो अब इस वाले फॉर्मूले को इस्तेमाल करें यहाँ पर सारी वैल्यूज नोन है लेम्डा जी आपको टेबल से मिल गया एक्स यहाँ पर आपका कितना शिफ्ट हुआ है मिनिमम में वो टेबल टेबल से आपको वैल्यू पता है शिफ्ट ऑफ मिनिमा ड्यू टू डायलेक्टिक मटेरियल जब आपने इंसर्ट कराया तो शिफ्टिंग कितनी हुई और एल उस डायलेक्ट्रिक की जो आई मीन जैसे वन सेंटीमीटर मैंने लिया था तो दैट यू कैन पुट हेयर एंड सिंपली कैलकुलेट लेमडा डी वैल्यू राइट अब आगे चले yes, आगे एप्सालन यानी डायरेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट डायरेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट में लेमडा नॉट हम कैलकुलेट कर चुके हैं लेमडा सी हम कैलकुलेट कर चुके हैं और लेमडा डी भी हम कैलकुलेट कर चुके हैं तो ये हम फॉर्मूले से डायरेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट की वैल्यू कैलकुलेट कर सकते हैं सिमिलरली वी कैन ऑल्सो कैलकुलेट डायरेक्ट्रिक लॉसेस उसमें हमें अटेन्यूशन कॉफिशियंट की वैल्यू भी मेजर करनी पड़ेगी ये जो लेमडा एल्फा डी है एल्फा डी के लिए जो मैंने आपको फॉर्मूला दिया हुआ है इसमें हमें जो आउटपुट पावर हम जो ले रहे हैं माइक्रोमीटर में उन वैल्यूज को भी मेजर करना पड़ेगा और यहाँ पे जो एक्स वन है एक्स वन इज वॉट जब हमारा हमने कोई भी डायलेक्टिक मीडियम नहीं रखा हुआ है तब हमारे पास मैक्सिमम रिफ्लेक्शन उस माइक्रोमीटर में क्या आ रहा है That we can note it down from the experiment. Or those X2 is what? जब हमने dielectric medium insert कर दिया, तब उस केस में हमारे पास क्या output power आ रही है maximum? वो हम note कर सकते हैं. और by putting these all values, और उसमें हमने dielectric medium की length क्या रखी है, वो हम रख सकते हैं. और यहाँ से हम attenuation coefficient calculate करके dielectric losses की value भी find out कर सकते हैं. तो I suppose you got this समझ में आ गया सबको इसमें attenuation coefficient हमने calculate किया है अगर हमारे पास attenuation coefficient नहीं होता तो हमारे पास एक और alternative method भी होता है that was given by Roberts and von Hippel method ठीक है इससे भी आप dielectric constant measure कर सकते हैं ये Roberts और von Hippel ने ये formula दिया था lambda g आपके वो guide wavelength हम calculate कर चुके हैं from the table L हमारे पास इलेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट का डायमेंशन है ही और X हमारे पास शिफ्ट ऑफ द मिनिमा है शिफ्ट ऑफ द मिनिमा यहाँ से आप कैलकुलेट करके सिंपली ये सीधा ग्राफ आपको मिल जाएगा 10x अपॉन x की फॉर्म में और यहाँ पे 10x अपॉन x से आप इस वैल्यू को फाइंड आउट कर सकते हो 10 टू पाई v अपॉन v से आप x की वैल्यू फाइंड आउट जब आपके पास x आ जाएगा तो उसके कॉरेस्पॉन्डिंग v नंबर भी आपको मिल जाएगा और v वैल्यू यू कैन पुट इन दिस एंड सिंपली थ्रू द ग्राफ यू कैन फाइंड आउट दिस डायलेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट डायरेक्टली राइट दिस इज अनदर मेथड अल्टरनेटिव मेथड तो देयर आर टू वेज बाय व्हिच वी कैन मेजर डायलेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट सो आई सपोज फ्रॉम दिस एक्सपेरिमेंट नाउ यू आर एबल टू नो कि व्हाट इज डायलेक्ट्रिक कांस्टेंट why should we measure this? What is the use of this? And how to measure dielectric constant or dielectric losses or attenuation coefficient? Any doubt in this experiment? Any doubt in this experiment? Or should I proceed? Aage chale? Yes, ma'am. Clear to all? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, अब experiment setup करना भी आ गया आपको कि किन values पे आपको रखना है, क्या output आएगा, किस तरह से करना है setup? You got this? इसमें precaution जो रखने वाली बात है, जिसके लिए अभी हम बात भी कर रहे थे, सबसे major precaution ये रखना है कि आप जब भी कोई waveguide connect करते हैं, तो आपके सारे waveguide के जो slots हैं, वो horizontal होना चाहिए 
ठीक है आपने अगर मान लीजिए एक एक का आउटपुट हॉरिजेंटल है और दूसरे इनपुट के टाइम पे आपने वर्टिकल लगा दिया उस दूसरे कंपोनेंट को तो आपको आउटपुट वहां पे नहीं मिलेगा अगर मिलेगा भी बाई चांस किसी एरर की वजह से रिफ्लेक्शन लॉसेस की वजह से तो आपको वो सही आउटपुट नहीं मिलेगा तो ये मेजर जो बच्चे जनरली गलती करते हैं इसीलिए मैंने स्पेसिफिकली इसमें यहाँ पर हाईलाइट किया था कि वो वर्टिकल लगाया था जबकि आपके पास जितना भी आपको आउटपुट है इनिशियली आप देखेंगे सारे स्लॉट्स हॉरिजॉन्टली वहां से कट होने वाले लगने चाहिए वर्टिकली और हॉरिजॉन्टली ऐसे नहीं लगाना चाहिए राइट यस मैम ओके नेक्स्ट अब हम नेक्स्ट एक्सपेरिमेंट पर आ रहे हैं टू मेजर आइसोलेशन एंड कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट ऑफ ए मैजिक टी अब मैजिक टी क्या है सबसे पहले हम मैजिक टी के बारे में बात करेंगे Uh, इसमें सेटअप ऑलमोस्ट वही है जो हमने पुराना वाला uh, बताया था अभी आपको क्लेस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई क्लेस्ट्रॉन ट्यूब आइसोलेटर वेरिएबल अटेन्यूएटर मैजिक टी जिसको हमें मेजर करना है और उससे हम कनेक्ट करेंगे डिटेक्टर माउंट और माइक्रोमीटर तो ये इसका मैंने ब्लॉक डायग्राम बना दिया है तो ब्लॉक डायग्राम भी आपको वही सेम है ज्यादा कोई डिफरेंस नहीं है यहाँ तक तो कॉमन फीचर चलेंगे सारे क्लेस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई क्लेस्ट्रॉन ट्यूब विद क्लेस्ट्रॉन माउंट फर्दर आइसोलेटर देन वेरिएबल अटेन्यूएटर यहां तक आपका वही है प्रीवियस एक्सपेरिमेंट के थ्रू राइट फिर आपको जो स्टडी करना है मैजिक टी वो हमने लगा दिया मैजिक टी इज बेसिकली फोर पोर्ट डिवाइस उसके फोर पोर्ट होते हैं वन टू थ्री एंड फोर राइट सो इसमें से एक इनपुट हो सकता है एक आउटपुट हो सकता है जिस पे आप जहां पे आप आउटपुट ले रहे हैं वहां पर आप डिटेक्टर माउंट कनेक्ट करेंगे और दैट विल बी ऑब्जर्व थ्रू माइक्रोमीटर यू कैन ऑल्सो प्लेस एयर सी आर ओ टू टू सी दउटपुट और माइक्रोमीटर ऑल्सो यू कैन यूज राइट सो दिस इज अबाउट अ फोर फोर डिवाइस एज आई टोल्ड यू एंड दिस इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज हाइब्रिड टी बिकॉज इसमें ई और एच टी मिक्स हो जाते हैं तो दिस इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड हाइब्रिड टी and we are also calling it calling it magic tea why we are calling it magic tea anybody aap logo ne padha hua hoga theory mein koi batayega ki isko magic tea kyun keh rahe hain aap logo ne nahi padha ye padha hai magic tea ke bare mein jante hain ya nahi yes or no no ma'am अच्छा नहीं पढ़ा अभी तक आप सब लोग कौन सी क्लास में है एमएससी में है ना सेम वन अच्छा अभी फर्स्ट सेमेस्टर में ही हैं आप कोई बात नहीं आपको ये पढ़ने को मिलेगा मैजिक टी बेसिकली अ फोर पोर्ट डिवाइस इसको मैजिक इसलिए कहते हैं कि अगर हम इसमें दो पोर्ट्स को अगर हम टोटली totally, अब आप पोर्ट्स के बारे में भी पहले आ, नहीं जानते होंगे शायद तो अगर हम बेसिकली हम इम्पिडेंस जब मैच कराते जब भी हम कोई कंपोनेंट यूज करते हैं तो उसमें सबसे प्रायर हमारी रिक्वायरमेंट होती है कि जहां पे भी दो पोर्ट कनेक्ट होते हैं देयर इम्पिडेंस शुड बी परफेक्टली मैच्ड राइट ये तो ये तो आइडिया होगा आपको अब जब भी आप दो कंपोनेंट आप कहीं भी केबल कनेक्ट करते हैं तो हम सबसे पहले तो कहते हैं ना मैच कर रही है क्या पहले देख लो इम्पिडेंस मैच कर रहा है कि नहीं फिफ्टी होम इम्पिडेंस मैच कर रहा है कि नहीं कर रहा आप कनेक्शन करते हो कनेक्शन के, केबल लगाते हो तो आप क्या कहते हो इम्पिडेंस मैच नहीं कर रहा इसलिए नॉइज आ रहा है या आउटपुट पे एरर आ रही है आउटपुट नहीं आ रहा प्रॉपर क्योंकि मैचिंग नहीं हो रही है ये तो सुना होगा आप लोगों ने यस yes, मैम यस yes, yes. तो यहाँ पर वही है अगर हमारे दो पोर्ट्स पोर्ट थ्री एंड पोर्ट फोर इफ सपोज दीज आर परफेक्टली मैच अगर हमने को मैच कर दिया तो जितना ज्यादा मैच होगा उतने ही लॉसेस कम होंगे आपके आउटपुट तो जब हमने दो पोर्ट को मैच किया तो इसका मैजिक यही है कि रिमेनिंग टू पोर्ट्स विल बी ऑटोमेटिकली मैच्ड। दिस इज इट्स मैजिक इसका पूरा मैथमेटिकल डेरिवेशन है वो कभी फिर कभी टाइम मिलेगा तो हम डिस्कस करेंगे तो जब हमने दो पोर्ट्स को मैच uh, कराया पोर्ट थ्री एंड पोर्ट फोर को तो पोर्ट वन एंड पोर्ट टू विल ऑल्सो भी मैच ये इसका मैजिक दैट इज वाई वी आर कॉलिंग इट मैजिक टी राइट इसको हम तो मैजिक टी में मैंने आपको बताया कि फोर पोर्ट्स हैं तो 
यहाँ पे जो पोर्ट फोर है मान लीजिए आपने इस पे कुछ इनपुट दिया तो कुछ आउटपुट यहाँ पे जाएगा कुछ आउटपुट यहाँ जाएगा एंड दीज टू आर बेसिकली नॉट इन फेज दीज आर आउट ऑफ द फेज एक इसकी फेज इस डायरेक्शन में इसकी फेज इस डायरेक्शन में ऐसे ही आपने इस पर इनपुट दिया तो जो आउटपुट मिलेगा दैट विल बी सम ऑफ दैट क्योंकि अपोजिट फेजेस जो है तो आपको आउटपुट एड होके मिलेगा अब यहां पे अगर ये दोनों सेम फेज में होते तो आपका आउटपुट यहां पे कैंसिल हो जाता और आपको कोई आउटपुट वहां पर नहीं मिलता ठीक है क्योंकि ये पोर्ट फोर इज बेसिकली वर्टिकल आर्म दैट इज ऑल्सो कॉल्ड एज ई प्लेन और जो हॉरिजेंटल आर्म होगी दैट इज कॉल्ड एज एच प्लेन तो बेसिकली जो मैजिक टी है इज अ कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ ई प्लेन टी एंड एच प्लेन टी और दिस एक्ट एज अ फोर पोर्ट हाइब्रिड सर्किट the waveguide dimensions are such that only tue 10 mode is supported then arm 3 which is parallel to the lines of magnetic field in combination with arm 1 and arm 2 forms h plane t and this arm 3 is also called called as h arm theek hai jo jo horizontal plane mein hai that is called h arm aur jo vertical hai that is called e arm right so These one arm and two arm, these are collinear, right? Or in me, आपस में जो third or fourth है, these are completely isolated. उनमें आपस में कोई transmission नहीं होता. और सबसे important चीज़ें कुछ इसमें मैंने दी हैं कि जो characteristics हैं series और shunties, वो इस तरह से होती हैं कि जब signals of equal amplitude and phase enters in arm three and arm four, तो उनका आपस में फील्ड कैंसिल हो जाता है वन साइड आर्म में और दूसरे साइड आर्म में ऐड हो जाता है राइट और सिग्नल अगर हमने थर्ड आर्म में फीड किया तो ये पोर्ट वन और पोर्ट टू में इक्वली डिवाइड हो जाएगा और यहाँ पर पोर्ट फोर अनकपल्ड है कुछ उस पर फर्क नहीं पड़ेगा ऐसे इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड अगर हमने वन एंड टू आर्म फेज में है तो उस केस में हमें मिलेगा आर्म थ्री अनकपल्ड रहेगी और जब हम सिग्नल आर्म फोर पे फीड करेंगे तो वो पोर्ट वन और पोर्ट टू पे इक्वली डिवाइड हो जाएगा राइट और जबकि इलेक्ट्रिक फील्ड में क्या होगा आर्म वन और आर्म टू में दोनों फेजेस अपोजिट रहेंगे राइट तो ये आ, ये सारी चीजें जब भी आपको समझ में आ सकती है जब ये पूरा डिटेल में आपको बताऊं इसलिए आई सपोज आई शुड स्किप दिस फॉर द नेक्स्ट टाइम अभी मैं आपको इसका एस मैट्रिक्स का बता देती हूँ वेन दीज आर परफेक्टली मैच तो क्या होता है ऑल फोर आर्म्स आर परफेक्टली मैच तो उस केस में आपके पास कोई रिफ्लेक्शन लॉसेस नहीं होंगे तो वहां पर आपको जीरो वैल्यू uh, मिलेगी ये आपका आउटपुट है ये आपका इनपुट के लिए एस uh, मैट्रिक्स है और ये आप कुछ इनपुट प्रोवाइड करा रहे हैं तो दिस इज आउटपुट फॉर दिस जैसे कि मैं आपको एक एग्जाम्पल लेके यहाँ बता देती हूँ कि मान लीजिए मैंने पोर्ट थ्री पे सिग्नल फीड किया और ऑल थ्री आर परफेक्टली मैच्ड मैच्ड है यानी कि ए वन ए टू एंड ए फोर आर जीरो मीन नो लॉसेज आर देयर और ए थ्री पे हमने सिग्नल दिया तो आउटपुट जो होगा दैट कैन बी कैलकुलेटेड फ्रॉम दिस एस मैट्रिक्स ठीक है ये जो एस मैट्रिक्स है यहां से आप कैलकुलेशन कर सकते हैं एस मैट्रिक्स सॉल्व करना तो आता ही होगा रो कॉलम यस मैम तो इस एस मैट्रिक्स से यू कैन ऑप्टेन आउटपुट बी B1 will be from this S matrix A by root two and B2 will be like जो भी आपने input दिया है by root two and here B3 and B4 these are uncoupled so these output will be zero so power also from this you can calculate that will be A square by four and power at two mm -hmm. second port that will be A square by four and P3 and P4 will be zero so इससे क्या आपको समझ आया कि सिग्नल फीड फ्रॉम पोर्ट थ्री विल बी स्प्लिट इक्वली एट पोर्ट वन एंड पोर्ट टू एंड नो सिग्नल कम आउट फ्रॉम पोर्ट थ्री एंड पोर्ट फोर राइट ऐसे ही पोर्ट फोर के लिए है कि आपने पावर को पोर्ट फोर पे इंसिडेंट कराया और बाकी सारे रिमेनिंग मैच्ड हैं तो वो पोर्ट वन और टू पे इक्वली डिवाइड हो जाएगी स्प्लिट अप हो जाएगा बट 
that will be 180 degree out of phase and no power will go out to port 4, 3 and 4, right? And similarly here also, if equal and in, in phase signal are fed in port 3 and port 4, so usi tarah se aap sara S matrix jo mein aapko dikhaya, from that you can calculate A1, A2 are 0 and A3 or A4 ko aapne common feed diya, same feed diya dono side. So aapka output B1, sirf B1 pe aapko output milega aur B3, B2 or B4 are now 0. Thik hai? Yani ki power sirf port 1 pe jayegi aur port 2 pe koi power aapko nahi milegi. ठीक है ऐसे ही मान लीजिए इफ आई एम पुटिंग फेड मींस पावर वी आर पुटिंग एट पोर्ट 1 तो और a2 और a3 एंड 4 आर मैच्ड तो इस केस में आपको आउटपुट सिर्फ b3 और b4 पे मिलेगा दैट इज आल्सो सेम और b1 और b2 पे आपको कोई आउटपुट वहां पर नहीं मिलेगा ऐसे ही आपने a1 और a2 पे आपने इनपुट दिया यानी पोर्ट 1 एंड पोर्ट 2 पे आपने इनपुट दिया और पोर्ट 3 या पोर्ट 4 पे नहीं कोई इनपुट दिया तो आउटपुट सिर्फ आपको थर्ड पोर्ट पे मिलेगा और फर्स्ट सेकंड और फोर्थ पोर्ट विल बी जीरो तो इन दिस वे यू कैन मेजर दिस इसके लिए भी मैंने वीडियो बनाया है यू कैन सी दिस ये तो आपको मैं बता ही चुकी हूं क्लिस्टरन पावर सप्लाई और ये आपका रिफ्लेक्स के स्ट्रॉन ये आइसोलेटर और ये आइसोलेटर है और इसके आगे हमने अटेन्यूटर लगाया है और ये है आपका मैजिक टी सी दिस मैजिक टी यहां पे मैंने लाइक एक पोर्ट पे इनपुट दिया है पोर्ट वन और पोर्ट टू पोर्ट थ्री और एक पीछे की तरफ आएगा जो दिखाई नहीं दे रहा यहां से उस पर आपको आउटपुट आप डिफरेंट डिफरेंट ले सकते हैं जैसे ये ये मेरा डिटेक्टर माउंट है आई एम प्लेसिंग दिस एट डिफरेंट पोर्ट सी दिस दिस इज डिटेक्टर माउंट ये माइक्रोमीटर है तो माइक्रोमीटर से आप ये देखिए मैं अगर आउटपुट इस वाले पोर्ट पे ले रही हूं तो आई कैन मेजर दिस आउटपुट इसमें थोड़ा सा अभी मैंने स्क्रूज नहीं लगाए हैं आपको और ये इस वाले पोर्ट पे आउटपुट और सिमिलरली फ्रॉम द बैक डायरेक्शन ऑफ दिस आउटपुट आई कैन टेक एनी आउटपुट फ्रॉम एनी पोर्ट राइट तो ये था आपका इसकी कैलकुलेशंस के लिए मैं बता दूं आपको एक मिनट यस एक सैंपल कैलकुलेशन मैंने ली है यहां पे कि जब मैंने पोर्ट 1 पे इनपुट दिया है मैं पावर को पोर्ट 1 पे फीड कर रही हूं तो इफ आई वांट टू कैलकुलेट आइसोलेशन तो आइसोलेशंस इज नथिंग बट रेशियो ऑफ पावर एट पोर्ट 1 एंड पोर्ट 2 that I am uh, converting into log uh, 10 log this. So that will be uh, in dB. Power will be in dB in that case. So suppose at input, I am having 82. That is the reading of micro ampere. Or output mujhe P2 pe 0 mil raha hai. In that case, simply you can see isolation will be nothing but infinity. Yani ki port 1 and port 2 are simply isolated right getting a point or not yes ma'am similarly for port 1 and 3 also input are port 1 pe de rahe hai, and you are taking output at port 3 and this is suppose some value i am getting in this micrometer so this is the value from this you can see how much isolation is there in p3 and p4 so, you input in three cases in one and you are taking output in different ports. So, you will get different outputs from here. You can also input in this way. You can also give input in port 2. If you have input in port 2 and you have input in port 1, you have output in port 2 and P2 upon P1. And you can also take port 2 and P3 upon P3. 
और P2 टू अपॉन पी फोर अकॉर्डिंगली यू कैन सी जब हम पोर्ट टू पे इनपुट दे रहे हैं तो क्या आइसोलेशन है और सिमिलरली यू कैन कैलकुलेट कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट फ्रॉम दैट यहाँ से आई जे आई जे इज वॉट वन एंड टू और टू और वन वॉट एवर इनपुट यू आर प्रोवाइडिंग दैट इज इनपुट एंड दिस इज फॉर द आउटपुट पोर्ट तो ये वैल्यूज आपको आइसोलेशन से मिल जाएंगी और यहां से आप कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट भी उस पर्टिकुलर पोर्ट के लिए कैलकुलेट कर सकते हैं तो आप अलग अलग पोर्ट चेंज कर सकते हैं जरूरी नहीं है हमेशा आपको वन पोर्ट पे या इनपुट देना है या टू पे ही देना है या थ्री पे ही देना है एट एनी पोर्ट यू कैन प्रोवाइड इनपुट एंड यू कैन टेक आउटपुट फ्रॉम एनी अदर थ्री पोर्ट राइट यस मैम अब हम आगे चलते हैं नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट है हमारा आइसोलेशन एंड इंसर्शन लॉस ऑफ अ थ्री पोर्ट सर्कुलेटर सर्कुलेटर क्या होता है बेसिकली दिस इज अनदर मल्टीपोर्ट डिवाइस और इसमें एक सबसे खास बात होती है सर्कुलेटर की कि इसमें जैसे मैंने आपको बताया पोर्ट वन पोर्ट टू पोर्ट थ्री तो इसमें दो कॉन्जिक्यूटिव पोर्ट्स ही सिर्फ कनेक्टेड होते हैं राइट right? जैसे पोर्ट वन से नेक्स्ट कॉन्जिक्यूटिव होगा पोर्ट टू अब पोर्ट थ्री का और पोर्ट वन का आपस में कोई रिलेशन नहीं होगा तो एक कई बार इसको हम आइसोलेटर की तरह से भी काम में लेते हैं ठीक है तो इसमें भी आपका वही है पूरा सेटअप आइसोलेटर और वेरिएबल एडोनेटर तो आपका वही सेटअप चलेगा और यहाँ पे हमने थ्री पोर्ट दैट में बी आर फोर पोर्ट सर्कुलेटर ऑल्सो हेयर इन दिस वी आर यूजिंग थ्री पोर्ट एंड a detector mount and micrometer so this is block diagram jo bhi aapko setup dikhaya tha maine pura electron power supply ye sara kuch to wahi common yahan tak chal raha hai yahan iske aage humne lagaya circulator port 1 port 2 port 3 similarly we can change port aap yahan pe port 2 pe input de sakte ho aur port 3 pe output le sakte ho to ye aap koi bhi port input se और कोई भी पावर आउटपुट से कनेक्ट कर सकते हो क्योंकि आपने मैंने आपको दिखाया डिटेक्टर माउंट इज वेरिएबल तो आप इसको किसी भी पोर्ट पे लगा सकते हो एक एग्जांपल मैंने थ्योरी इसका लिया है कैलकुलेशन का कि मान लीजिए मैंने पोर्ट वन पे पावर इनपुट दिया है सो इन दैट केस आइसोलेशन विल बी इन पोर्ट वन एंड थ्री मैंने आपको बताया कि इसमें पोर्ट वन और अगर है तो दैट इज कनेक्टेड ऑनली विद द पोर्ट टू पोर्ट थ्री से उसका कोई कनेक्शन नहीं होगा तो यहाँ पे आप देख रहे हैं पोर्ट थ्री पे यू विल नॉट गेट एनी आउटपुट यहाँ पे आपको आउटपुट क्या मिल रहा है जीरो तो आइसोलेशन इज इनफाइनाइट राइट तो इंसर्शन लॉस इज दिस हेयर दैट इज क्वाइट पॉइंट वन पॉइंट नाइन फोर दैट दीज आर द सैंपल कैलकुलेशन आई है You can uh, take any port like P1 or uh, input आपने यहाँ दिया P2 टू भी दे सकते हैं पी थ्री भी दे सकते हैं और अकॉर्डिंगली यू कैन आउट टेक आउटपुट एट पी वन पी टू पी थ्री और इज इट क्लियर टू ऑल ओके सो लास्ट एक्सपेरिमेंट टू मेजर इंसर्शन लॉस कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट एंड डायरेक्टिविटी ऑफ अ डायरेक्शनल कपलर डायरेक्शनल कपलर इज अगेन मल्टीपोर्ट डिवाइस फोर पोर्ट डिवाइस बेसिकली और इसमें भी आप देख रहे हैं जो एपरेटस हमें रिक्वायर्ड है दैट इज सेम क्लिस्ट्रॉन पावर सप्लाई क्लिस्ट्रॉन ट्यूब आइसोलेटर वेरिएबल एटेन्यूएटर डायरेक्शन कपलर डिटेक्टर माउंट एंड माइक्रोमीटर दीज आर सेम सो अगेन दीज आर ऑल्सो अप टू दिस ऑल आर सेम हेयर डायरेक्शन कपलर As I told you, this is basically a four-port device. लेकिन इसमें हम एक पोर्ट को परमानेंटली मैच करके रखते हैं उसको ब्लॉक करके रखते हैं तो ऑल दो थ्री पोर्ट आर ऑनली ओपन टू बी कनेक्टेड इन द सर्किट ठीक है तो P1, P2 टू एंड पी थ्री हम सर्किट पर कनेक्ट कर सकते हैं और uh, एक पोर्ट एक पोर्ट को हमने परमानेंटली इसको बंद किया हुआ है और इसको कनेक्ट कर सकते हैं हम डिटेक्टर माउंट से अन, और फिर आउटपुट हम ले सकते हैं इसमें माइक्रोमीटर के थ्रू सो दिस एज आई टोल्ड यू दिस इज बैच टर्मिनेशन दिस आर बेसिकली इन दिस वी हैव टू वेब गाइड्स दिस इज मेन एंड दिस इज ऑक्सिलरी वेब गाइड राइट सो वन टू थ्री फोर देर फोर पोर्ट बट दिस इज मैच टर्मिनेटेड 
इसको हमने परमानेंटली बंद किया हुआ है आप इनपुट मान लीजिए यहाँ से दे रहे हैं यू कैन टेक आउटपुट फ्रॉम दिस ऑल्सो दिस ऑल्सो सो दीज आर आउटपुट सिंबल्स सो दिस इज द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ अ डायरेक्शनल कपलर इन दिस बेसिकली वी हैव कंबाइंड दीज टू वेब गाइड्स so here as i told you there is a primary wave guide and this is secondary or also called as auxiliary wave guide and these are basically coupled and this is called coupling device here in between this okay this is port 1 you can take output from port 2 and port 4 also there will not be anything on port 3 because these are not connected with this okay similarly this also you can provide some input और यू कैन टेक आउटपुट फ्रॉम दिस ऐसा नहीं है कि आपको पोर्ट वन पे ही देना है पोर्ट टू से कोई आउटपुट नहीं आएगा पोर्ट टू पे भी आप इनपुट दे सकते हैं पोर्ट वन से आप आउटपुट दे सकते हैं राइट तो ये सारी चीजें जो मैंने अभी आपको डिस्क्राइब की यही यहाँ पे मैंने फिर से यहाँ पे लिखा हुआ है आई डोंट थिंक कि इसको दोबारा से मैं रिपीट करूं अब हम इसके कुछ पैरामीटर्स जो हम मेजर करते हैं एक्सपेरिमेंट में सबसे पहला है हमारा कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट इज वॉट बेसिकली दिस इज अ रेशो एक्सप्रेस इन डेसिबल जब हम इसको क्योंकि हमारी जो पावर वाई वाई डू वी कन्वर्ट दिस इन डेसिबल डीबी में हम क्यों कन्वर्ट करते हैं बिकॉज दिस पावर इज वेरी लेस इन दैट तो टू मेजर दिस वी जनरली कन्वर्ट दिस इन टू लॉक वैल्यू एंड दैट विल बी कन्वर्टेड इन टू डेसिबल ठीक है तो पावर इंसिडेंट दैट इज पी वन कितनी पावर कपल हो रही है विद द ऑक्सिलरी आर्म पी फोर पे तो ये इन दोनों का जो रेशो होगा दैट विल बी कॉल्ड एज कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट राइट आपने इनपुट पे कुछ पावर दिया और पोर्ट फोर पे आपने कुछ आउटपुट लिया जो जो रेशो होगा दैट इज कपलिंग कॉफिशियंट राइट यहाँ पे कंडीशन है कि हम बाकी सारे पोर्ट्स को टर्मिनेटेड मैच टर्मिनेटेड मान रहे हैं मीन्स वहां पे हम मान के चल रहे हैं देर इज नो लॉस एट ऑल राइट अब सेकंड इसका है पैरामीटर दैट इज डायरेक्टिविटी डायरेक्टिविटी इज अगेन रेशो ऑफ पावर एट पोर्ट फोर टू द पोर्ट थ्री यानी आपकी पोर्ट फोर पे जो भी पावर कपल्ड हुई है वो पोर्ट थ्री से हमने आपको बताया कि पोर्ट थ्री को हमने टर्मिनेट किया हुआ है तो अगर ये पोर्ट थ्री कंटेमिनेटेड है तो दैट विल बी जीरो हेयर सो इन दैट केस डायरेक्टिविटी विल बी इनफाइनाइट राइट तो ये जनरली आइडियल कपलर के लिए है कि आपके पास आउट सारा का सारा पावर आउटपुट में मिल जाए कोई भी पावर बैक नहीं जाए कोई लॉसेस नहीं हो बेसिकली तो दैट इज नोन एज हाईली डायरेक्टिव कपलर सो नेक्स्ट इज इंसर्शन लॉस बेसिकली इंसर्शन लॉस इज वॉट This is a ratio of जो भी power loss आपका हो रहा है और uh, while power is moving from port वन to टू directly तो उन दोनों का जो ratio होगा that will be this insertion loss that loss may be due to some reflection that may be uh, loss due to attenuation also so there are various ways by which we can measure these attenuation losses we can reduce or uh, reflectometer say hum directly reflection losses kitne ho rahe that also we can measure and by this you can simply measure insertion loss aur agar hamara insertion loss hum keh rahe hain ki ye jitna aapne input diya wo 100% aapko output mein mil gaya in that case l ki value kya ho jayegi us case mein bataiye If I am putting some input and the hundred percent I am getting as output, so what will be the L value in that case? Zero. Zero. So it means my jo coupler hai, wo ideal coupler hai. Usme koi bhi loss nahi ho raha, right? Up next, uh, another parameter hai that is isolation. Isolation means. जो मेरा इनपुट P1 पे हमने प्रोवाइड कराया और P3 पे आपस में कितना हमने कहा दीज आर डी कपल्ड दीज आर आइसोलेटेड तो कितना आइसोलेशन है वो हम मान के चलते हैं कि P3 पे हमारा क्योंकि वो हमने टर्मिनेट किया हुआ है उस पर कोई हमने आउटपुट नहीं ले रहे हैं तो दैट इज जीरो इफ दिस इज कम्प्लीटली जीरो इन दैट केस आवर कपलर इज आइसो आइडियल कपलर 
और उस केस में जो आइसोलेशन होगा दैट विल बी इनफाइनाइट यानी वन और थ्री में परफेक्टली कोई कनेक्शन कोई कपलिंग कोई कुछ नहीं होगा आपस में कोई कनेक्टिविटी नहीं होगी वन पे जो भी आप दे रहे हैं वो थ्री पे वहां पर उसका कोई इफेक्ट नहीं आएगा दैट इज जीरो सो दिस इज आइसोलेशन so these are some reference book uh, i have used uh, to make these ppt i i suppose uh, i could make you understand ki whatever is requirement yes. thank you ma'am yes any queries any questions you want to ask The forum is Anything open for discussion. If anyone has any kind of queries, please let us know. I hope now you understand about the microwave bench. Now you can arrange this with your own in the lab. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And how you can connect different components in the circuit. how can you can take outputs these all things are clear thank you very much ma'am for such an interactive session filled with so much of knowledge both practical and theoretical and we are very glad that we got to know so many sample observations according to the experiments we could see the live experiments also the equipments and including the precautions and alternate methods to solve it and also you uh, told us about the magic key which many many of us were unaware of so i thank you a lot for that now with this we have come to an end of our today's workshop i would like to thank everyone who made this meeting possible and thank our eminent guests and speakers for donating a small yet valuable part of their vast knowledge physics is life physics is perspective and with this thought we take leave from you but with a comma with a hope to see you tomorrow sharp at 11 am aur is vishwas ke sath ki hamare participants kal fir ek naye utsah ke sath ek nayi energy lekar इस वर्कशॉप का हिस्सा बन थैंक यू वेरी मच टू एवरी वन हु ज्वाइन दस टूडे थैंक्स मनीषा थैंक्स फॉर योर वंडरफुल प्रेजेंटेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर प्रोवाइडिंग मी सच अ अपॉर्चुनिटी टू इंटरेक्ट विद यू ऑल डिपार्टमेंट में बुलवाएंगे बिल्कुल बहुत अच्छा प्रेजेंटेशन थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू मैं खन्ना सर को देख पा रही हूं नमस्कार सर खन्ना सर इज देयर नमस्ते सर सर सुन नहीं पा रहे शायद मुझे हाँ जुड़े तो हाँ जुड़े तो हुए थे हाँ है नमस्कार नमस्कार सर कैसे हैं सर आप चलो ठीक है मनीषा थैंक यू वेरी मच तुमने बहुत बहुत अच्छे से सारे थैंक यू सर एक्चुअली मुझे लगा पता नहीं बच्चों को समझ में आ पाएगा या नहीं और इसलिए नहीं बहुत अच्छा डेमो था बहुत अच्छा वेरी क्लियर डेमोस्ट्रेटेड थैंक यू मनीषा थैंक यू सर ओके शुड आई लीव नाउ थैंक यू थैंक यू we thank all the participants who joined us today who took their times out and gave their valuable presence here we end this workshop today here itself thank you again for joining us
एक बंदे में क्या हुआ कि Thank you.